Hey everybody, it's Nate from Explorers.life. I teach people how to build DIY campers, and this video is episode number one in a brand new series of videos where I will be showing you step by step from the ground up how we're upfitting our brand new Ford Transit. Now, it's been about five years since we documented our Sprinter camper build, and during that time, this channel has matured a bit and found its happy place. We're still adventuring, but we aren't really making adventure vlogs. We're still making money remotely, but we're not teaching people how to do that. This channel is now 100% about teaching all of you how to build DIY campers, and this new transit is our blank canvas for the next year of videos for this channel. But enough about me. This video is about you, and this video is me reaching out to you for help. I need to know what you want to learn about. The main purpose of us getting this van is to make tutorials. Now I'm going to be doing tutorials over every step of this project, and now is the time for you to give your input on the direction of these projects. So, what should we do for flooring? I'm thinking coin grip flooring with L-Track down the length of the van so that it's rugged, but it's still nice enough to walk on. You know, something where I could still put a snowmobile or something in there if the adventure calls for it. Um, but ultimately, how do you want to see me split the difference between functionality and looks? Now, how about walls? I'm kind of leaning towards a adventure wagon kit or something similar to that. Or would you rather see me just scribe everything out manually? Both are DIY projects, but scribing will be way more labor intensive. So what seems more helpful for you all to see me do? Now, I think we should do in-floor heating in this, but I haven't really even started looking into the nitty-gritty of it just yet. So, if you have any insight, I'd love to hear what you'd like to see me do here. Now, we're definitely going to be doing air conditioning of some kind in this build. We have all kinds of options here. You know, Nomadic and Dometic, they have both 12-volt uh, DC, 24-volt DC, and 120-volt AC roof mount air conditioners, but then again, Cruise and Comfort, they also have like a super cool undermount air conditioner so we can maybe fit more solar on the roof. So, which would you rather see there? Now what about cabinets? I'm leaning more towards 8020 Quick Tube for lightweight cabinets, but if you've got a different idea, I'm all ears, so let me know in the comments. Now how about suspension? I want to show you how to DIY a suspension lift. Van Compass seems like the most popular and most available, but if anybody has any alternatives, I'm all ears. Now electrical, I've already got some pretty good ideas of what I'm going to do there, but if there's a fun feature or something like that that you'd like to see a tutorial over, now is the time to get it on my radar. What about roof racks and bumpers and ladders and awnings and all the other exterior stuff? Let me know which ones, what kinds or brands or anything else that you want to see used and installed. And honestly, there's nothing off limits when it comes to making your suggestions. If it sounds like it'd be a fun project, then I'm going to probably do it. And if not, then I probably won't do it. But I know you all have some really fun ideas and I'd love to bring them to life. So I've put together a little template together in the first comment down in the comment section below the video to hopefully prompt some ideas for all of you. Now I look forward to reading the ideas that everybody has and I promise I'll read them all and attempt to respond the best I can, but no promises because I have some planning to do. Now before I wrap this video up, I want to give a special shout out to Battle Warm Batteries for coming on as the title sponsor for this series. The support they're giving me going forward is allowing me to push aside some obligations that I've had in the past that have really gotten in the way of making these videos for all of you here on YouTube. This sponsorship has also allowed me to hire a full-time content creator to help me with camera operations, video and picture editing, Instagram stories, and all kinds of other stuff that I need to be able to make these videos and blog posts for all of you on a more consistent and frequent basis. Now, as always, thanks for watching and consider subscribing if you haven't already to stay current with this project. And I will see you in the next video where I'm going to talk more about this van and the features that we had Ford put on it from the factory. So I'll see you there. But in this video, I'm going to give you a walkthrough of some of the stats, the optional equipment, and all that kind of stuff that we chose to have installed on this Transit by Ford. Now this is a 2021 Ford Transit 350 single rear wheel cargo van with a high roof, all wheel drive, and a 10 speed automatic transmission. Now for the engine, we went with a 3.5 liter EcoBoost twin turbo V6 gas motor capable of putting out 300 horsepower and 400 foot-pounds of torque that I was actually able to lay down a seven second quarter mile time with but I just I didn't have a camera with me so you're just gonna have to take my word for it. Now the exterior is abyss gray which seems a bit too dramatic for my taste uh, so I'll probably just be calling it dark gray from here on out. Now the standard equipment is mostly well standard equipment for the most part. 
Outside we have a black bumper instead of a painted one, a single sliding door on the side, and two rear cargo doors out back. It's got a full-size spare tire, headlamps, and rain-sensing wipers as well. Inside we've got air conditioning, oh shit handles, a center console with storage, interior LED lighting, a locking glove box, a 12-volt outlet, and a tilting telescoping steering wheel. Now there are also a ton of other standard functions, safety, security, and warranty features that I'm not going to read through, partially because I don't have a good way to demonstrate the fact that we have some of this stuff, like a heavy-duty front axle. Now, on to the optional equipment. Now, some of this stuff was dependent on the other stuff that we chose in a if you get this, you have to get that sort of fashion, but let's just run through the list. We upgraded to the twin-turboed EcoBoost gas motor since we plan on loading this thing up to pretty much max capacity and we want plenty of power for mountain passes and steep forest roads. The 3.73 rear differential is a good split between fuel mileage and power and the limited slip is going to give us better traction off-road. Now, full e-lockers and air lockers or something along those lines would have been better, but that's not an option directly from Ford, so that may be something we investigate as an aftermarket solution later on. We also added wheel well liners. Now, I think it's kind of absurd that the Transit doesn't come with wheel well liners. I kind of think they're a necessity, uh, so we, we bought them. We also got fixed rear cargo door glass. We wanted a bit more sunlight to be able to come into the van than our last van, and with the current shortage of aftermarket van windows, we just opted to have Ford install them for us, and at only 250 bucks for the pair, it was significantly cheaper than aftermarket options. We opted for the 9,500 pound GVWR package, and this was the highest weight rating that we could get while still having single rear wheels. Now, unless I'm towing a trailer, I don't want dual rear wheels. In my experience, they're worse when off-road and on slick roads, and it's just more tires to buy when these wear out, and it also lowers the fuel mileage. We got two-way power seats up front, and we opted for the two-way seats over the higher-end 10-way ones because with the 10-way ones, they seem to have issues with swivels, apparently. Now, I'm sure we could have made it work, but the two-way seats are what we decided on here and will work great with the aftermarket swivels that we're going to install. Now we opted for the built-in block heater since it's actually negative 16 degrees Fahrenheit outside as we speak. Even though keeping the block warm for starting isn't as important for gas engines as it is for diesel engines, it sure is nice not to have to start and run the engine for as long for the heater to start actually blowing hot air. We also added the keyless entry pad so I don't have to carry keys in my pocket when we're out skiing or hide them when we're out paddleboarding. We added the tow haul mode with trailer wiring for the times that we may be hauling a trailer, which will probably be a pretty rare occurrence for the most part, but will happen occasionally. Also, the tow haul mode is fantastic for traveling up and down long mountain passes to keep the transmission in a lower gear. And we also got the modified vehicle wiring system because, well, I think it was actually added automatically because we got dual 250 amp alternators, which also added dual starting batteries. Now we're going to add some pretty substantial alternator charging capabilities to this van, so dual alternators will be fantastic to be able to feed some big amperages without overworking the alternators. Now, I thought we got upfitter switches in this van, but when scripting out this video, I actually realized we didn't. I, I meant to, but ultimately, this may just give me a chance to show you how to add switches up front for light bars and other stuff like that. Now we did end up with fog lamps though, so those will be nice for tapping into if the project calls for it. Now we opted for black steel wheels instead of silver because these wheels will probably get demoted to snow tires and we'll probably get some different wheels for some beefier all-terrain tires for the summertime. And we also got adaptive cruise control. Now I really like adaptive cruise control so that I don't have to manually adjust my speed when I come up behind somebody in traffic. Now adaptive cruise control, it uses a radar to do that function for me automatically and it's really nice. And we also added lane assist for a little added comfort on those long drives, just you know, to help keep us between the lines. And we also got a 31 gallon fuel tank for the next time we go to Alaska or something like that, because it's sometimes a long way between fuel stations. And finally, some of the other stuff that we got is just kind of self-explanatory, like we got an overhead shelf up front, because shelving is nice, illuminated sun visors, two additional keys, a 12 volt outlet, an auxiliary fuse panel, 120 volt 400 watt power outlet from an OEM inverter that's powered by the starting batteries and wiper activated headlamps. <laughs> Some of that stuff I was pretty set on getting like the um, 9,500 pound GVWR package and the dual alternators and some of the stuff was just added because that's how the Ford build process works. But ultimately, I think this is a fantastic platform for this new camper build series on this channel. 
And in this video, Steph and I are going to give you a ton of insight into the initial planning of the interior of this van. So kind of want to talk about the, um, the goals of the build. So the first one that we talked about was we wanted everything to be modular. Yep. So everything can be removed for the most part. Yep. So we basically want to be able to turn this van back into a cargo van if needed. Yep. And I visualize that being uh, L track on the walls. So there and there. Um, and then the only things that will probably stay in the van pretty much full time would be like the utilities cabinets, which will be like over the wheel well for the water, uh, potentially water heater, uh, water tank, water pump, mm -hmm. anything watery over <laughs> on this side. And then that side will be electrical uh, over that. But yep. aside from that, like I think like cabinets up top, um, the kitchen, the bed, all that stuff will be able to be removed um, without like damaging the walls or anything like that. Everything will just bolt right to the L track so that we could turn this back into um, a utility vehicle for the most part if needed. Yep, perfect. Pretty much. Yep. Next is going to be repeatability. So since we're doing this all for like tutorials for you guys, uh, we want these projects to be repeatable, which means that we want, if, if we do a project, we want it to be at the DIY level uh, where you guys can repeat it because ultimately we're doing tutorials so that they can be repeated, uh, which means that the things need to be, um, we're not going to be using tools that are like, we're not going to be using CNC machines uh, or anything that like, you know, the common person doesn't have a hold, uh, can't get a hold of like pretty easily. Um, we also are going to have to weigh the options of doing things like, for example, walls. A few weeks ago, whenever I asked about walls, everybody wanted me to DIY the walls. But also, we're going to have to weigh the, uh, weigh the options between something taking four days and four weeks. Um, because that's kind of the difference between like the adventure wagon kit versus the DI walls kit. Anything else on that? And lastly is bang for your buck. So if you've been around the channel for a while, you've heard do it right, do it once. And we're going to be doing that a lot. Like we're not building the cheapest build. That's definitely not the goal. Uh, but we're trying to get uh, high quality components that you've installed yourself and you're being able to save money on the labor because we're hopefully going to be providing you with the knowledge to install this stuff correctly uh, and have those high quality components. So I would say those are the three things. Do you have anything to add to any of those? I don't think so. Okay, let's start actually planning. Let's do it. <laughs> so we have a ton of sticky notes and a bunch of tape and let's, Jet, get, where, do you, where would you like to start? Um, let's start with general layout of things that we well, let's start with things that we know where it's going to go. So water, 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 water side. tank. Yeah. Right. So tentatively, let me have a color. What color you want for water? Blue. Blue. That makes sense. And we're not doing exact measurements, obviously, but we're just going to get kind of close because we'll probably be sketching a lot of this stuff out in SketchUp as we go. So probably up to. So I imagine this will be our first line of L-Track. Yep, so, so we'll probably go pretty much all the way up. Water cabinet, essentially, for now. Cool. And so in that cabinet, we'll have the water tank, water pump. What else? Water uh, heater. Water heater. Yeah, if we do an electric water heater, that would live in there. If we did like a diesel fired heater, that would probably live maybe up front. Uh, but it could also potentially live back here too. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking about doing the the water tank. It's just like over the wheel well. Um, having the water tank inside because uh, Four Seasons capability is really, really important. Yeah. We live in Colorado. We travel for snow skiing. And so having the water tank inside as opposed to outside, it's really important for us. And I think for everybody on that YouTube video from the other day, uh, having Four Seasons capability was like really important to everybody. Definitely top of the list. Yep. So tank, pump, water heater, everything like that will go into there. Cool. Now this cabinet won't move. This will be like one of the modular things that it's just going to be just going to be there. It'll be bolted to the wall, but ultimately it's not going to be something we plan on taking in and taking out like very often, I would imagine. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Not without some work. <laughs> yep. Okay. Electrical. Electrical, Electrical. cabinet's going to be on the other side. We're going to use blue again because it's Victron. <laughs> Perfect. 
And that's basically going to mirror this, the water tank, right? Yeah, pretty much. I think it's going to be, I think I'd like to make these the exact same size, the exact same look, just for aesthetics. Um, so kind of what I meant by mirroring you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wasn't that fancy. So electrical, so probably, we hadn't decided all the way on like batteries, but probably we'll do like two of the 270 amp hour Battleborn batteries um, in this general vicinity. Uh, Victron Multi Plus inverted charger back here and all the associated charge controllers uh, up top. Something along that, those lines. Uh, we'll be putting all that together in SketchUp and, try, and trying to actually figure out how that's gonna look. Uh, but tentatively, that's that. Okay, what's next? From those, we'll have, we'll basically be making benches to go over both of these and a table in the middle, correct? Yeah, sounds okay. good. Benches, I think that's fairly self-explanatory on the side so we can like actually sit here to eat. Yeah. Um, we will be putting, I think we're gonna try to find like a way to do, to make the, the table into a uh, like a convertible like table slash bed kind of thing where the tabletop drops down and we put the, the mattress across. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of the thought with this, but I think we're also going to have an option for a standard like, you know, elevated bed. Yeah. Um, because sometimes, you know, kind of playing into the modular aspect of things. If we're going somewhere that we have to take bikes, uh, we want to be able to put the bikes in here and the bed up top. If we're going somewhere that we're not necessarily going on a biking trip, uh, it's nice to have like seating room and, you know, spot for tables and or yep. a table and everything like that. Yep. Pretty much. Yeah. So question there. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in my head, I had it as the L track would be here mm -hmm. and we would be able to um, do the dinette bed like we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And then we would also have another bit of L track above that we would be able to mount the bed to if we wanted to have it elevated. In my head, that was about right here, <laughs> but that's not going to work. Okay. So bed potentially right here. I'm going to put a question mark on that because okay. we're going to have to figure out how to do that. So I know like the adventure wagon kits, they have a bit of like extra bracing in here. And I will, I want to say, I'll have to look after this video, but I think there's an extra piece of L track right here, or there's a way to span the gap from the L track that would be up here to the L track that would be down here. So okay. we can have that bed, you know, in this area because okay. otherwise that's right there in the way. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we're going to figure that out. Yes. Okay. What else you got? Okay. So then, um, upper cabinets staying back here um upper cabinets do we want any kind of upper cabinets back here so in our last build we kept hitting our heads on our upper cabinets yeah <laughs> they were above the bed specifically i kept specifically you head. well i didn't have an upper cabinet above my side of the bed yeah so in the light in the sprinter we had a we had a cabinet up here um and i think we i think i think we still have one um, but I think the cool thing about it is, is I, I would like to make one, um, but being modular, I mean, it's like if, the, yeah. if we keep hitting our heads on it, we can either a pay attention or b like take them out. Yeah. Well, four years of me doing it and I still wasn't paying attention. So I don't know how, <laughs> how good of a plan that is. It might not get any better, <laughs> but we could also just do a, a smaller cabinet, like not as deep because the ones in our sprinter came out, if I remember cor correctly, it was 12 inches. Um, no, it was 14 inches, I think. Uh, anyway, 12 to 14 inches. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a ways. If we did it like, you know, a smaller shelf or a smaller cabinet that was maybe half the, half yep. the width, depth. Yep. So cabinets, maybe 12 inches and an eight inches kind of thing. We could like make, um, different ones, you know, kind of put together some plans for a few different ones and 
you know, then we can pick out which ones we like and then we can make the plans available for you guys. And that way you can kind of like play around with whichever ones you see. But ultimately either one would work. Let's make, regardless of whatever size of cabinets we make there, let's make it work for uh, whatever l track system we put up up here. Cool, got it. Um, another option on those is I've seen like, um, it's a, it's like basically like a bag. I mean like a, it's like a soft bag. I think, I think Adventure Wagon makes them, but I think there's a few other companies that make them too. It's just like a, almost like a duffel bag, if you could imagine the duffel bag being just fastened to the l track. So it kind I of- personally don't like those though. Okay, yeah. It, I don't look, like the look of them. Yeah, they look kind of dumpy. Like a, like, like a duffel bag. <laughs> like you screwed a duffel bag to the wall. Okay, you screwed a duffel bag to the wall. Okay, well, we won't do that then. Cool. Okay, what um, else we got? Okay, I think that's it back here, yeah? What else goes back here? Um, we need to talk about outlets, um, but let's get furniture well, and stuff in the, out of the yeah, way Yeah, let's, let's do the whole whole floor plan first, and then that'll give us a better idea of outlets. Okay, perfect. Kitchen? Okay. Kitchen. I loved where our kitchen was in the Sprinter. So that would be like here to uh, like roughly here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So sticky note, what color is our kitchen? Green. Kitchen, it's like kitchen. that. Uh, we'll figure out heights and stuff like that. That's actually probably pretty close. Okay, cool. Um, overhead cabinets, uh, that could be definitely a thing that like either gets extended or it could be like, you know, the whole modular functionality. It could be something that's the exact same width as the kitchen and just plop it right there Yep. kind of thing. So the, uh, we've got quite a bit of space above the door on the transit. So it's like, in my mind, it's like, you know, the bottom of the shelf is right here or bottom of the cabinet is right here. Where does the upper L track go? I'm not sure if there's holes behind this or not. I hope there is. I have to tear that off and look. Okay. So if not, it'll be like right here in this area. So. Okay. That'll be another project is getting in here. That'll be next week. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. So definitely uppers up there at the very least, like something, something even just a little bit shallow for like spices spices and stuff like that like kind of a spice rack type thing okay but but yes uppers there what's going on that side i don't know a ball pit um <laughs> maybe not no. um okay bathroom needs to go somewhere yeah um so we're not doing a full floor to ceiling bathroom like we did in the sprinter correct correct but that's what we've decided i think so okay um but we need somewhere for a toilet to go. So in my head, this side was like basically cabinets all the way over for the most part. Um, and then honestly, what if we had like some kind of like cabinet module that has like, you know, it's like a bathroom module slides inside of it or then like a shelving unit can slide inside of it kind of thing. So it's almost like a countertop that's here could come all the way out to here. Mm -hmm. So whenever this swivels around, it's like you have a little bit of workspace there. Yep. Uh, but then like, it was basically just a countertop is effectively all of it is. Countertop that secures to the L-Track down here. Mm -hmm. And then we could take a, a, like a secondary, like insertable module type of thing. And it just right in there. Okay, cool. And just a little, little cabinet for the toilet. Yep. Cool. Want to figure all that. But do you initially hate the idea? No. Okay. Uh, and then I think same thing right here. It's just, well, maybe that would be kind of cool because it's like um, countertop and then we could it could be like a bathroom module, a store, you know, a, um, a, a drawer module, a, mm -hmm. um, I'm losing the word for just the doors. Cabinet? Cabinet module. Um, could also le have have it left open for like, just make that a desk oh, area. Yeah. A desk module. Desk module. That would be a lack of module though. <laughs> <laughs> Leg space. You have to pay extra for that. 
<laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah, no, I like that idea. So it'd be so that that'd give a lot of counter space too. Yeah. So that kind of extends the kitchen. Yeah, I think so too. And you know, we're gonna have to play around with the kitchen idea because uh, it's like you know, if we're talking about putting a refrigerator inside of it. So I'll be doing like an upright refrigerator this time around instead of a chest refrigerator, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, it's just like seems smaller, more compact. Um, we'll have to play around with how big this actually is. I already have that an idea of that modeled up in SketchUp, um, which we did like last year or something like that, like pre-pandemic or whatever. But we'll uh, we'll have to figure out like how big that actually is in in relation to this. So. Yeah. Well, because the the refrigerator could go on this side too. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. have to go in this. Yeah. No. This cabinet. Yeah. Agreed. Cool. Uh, uppers up here yep. as well. Yeah. And then I think I would personally like a window right here. Okay. Would you like it to open? I would like it to open. Yes, that would be oh. ideal. Okay. Airflow. Because mm -hmm. we don't have a window. Well, we don't have a window anywhere back here, except for the doors. Okay. Opening for a window. Um, do you want a window in the in the door? This thing. I'm indifferent. <laughs> indifferent on window. Indifferent on All right, window. So we'll leave it off for now, I think. Um, because if we have a window on this side, like ultimately, ultimately we can open the door. There. We can open the door and it becomes a window. Yes. Um. Yeah. So this is gonna be a bunch of open space, which will be nice. Yes. Compared to our last sprinter, which was really closed Fire. off and everything like that. Yeah. I'd also like to have, so we're going to have the swivel seats, right? Yes, swivel seats. On this, this cabinet, I would like to have a slide out table that comes all the way across here so that both seats can have a table. Both seats need a table for both, sure. Both seats need a table. Yes. Swivels. And Swivel. And then uh, tables. Slidey table. Tables for chairs. Cool. And that'll Light. be over in this general vicinity. Because I know they have like the ones that come out from underneath. We'll kind of brainstorm how we want the tables to work. But what we know now is that we want tables. Yes, I want tables. Yeah. Yeah, we'll brainstorm more. But I was actually thinking more of it being built into that cabinet mm -hmm. of a have a slide okay have a um module that slides Very out cool. and makes a yeah kind of turns it into an l cool oh i see we'll throw it in a sketch if you find yes. it figure it out okay perfect so that is up there it's cabinets upper cabinets uh utilities beds um what else are we thinking Furniture wise, layout wise, anything like that. Off to a good start, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk about outlets. Where we want okay. outlets. Um, so I've got uh, two colors here. Yes, yeah, that's that two one. different colors. Um, so we want. I think we just have outlets evenly spaced. Last time, last time around, I think we got way too creative with outlets and I think people get too creative with outlets. So if we put like 12 volt, 24 volt, I'm sorry, 12 volt and 120 volt outlet back there, same thing right here. Oop, sorry. Same thing up here with outlets. So all these, these green or yeah, green ones are going to be uh, just basically outlets. Um, up here, and back here so just evenly spaced honestly kind of like they are in a house like you know in a bedroom you've got an outlet on either side of the bed mm -hmm. and then one behind the tv and then one on the wall opposite of the the bathroom so basically if we just evenly space them out and about yeah i don't see there's gonna that's gonna be just fine Six outlets, yeah, that's plenty. Yeah, six outlets, that's, like, that's I mean, more than enough. It's like 80 square feet. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> I think we're good. Yeah, that's, that's way plenty. And most of these will be on the same circuit, so 
you know, it'll be this one and this one, and probably that one will be on the same circuit. So I'll keep that easy. Um, something else I want to incorporate that is from a from an outlet standpoint. So all the wiring, uh, we're going to put all the wiring in the walls this time around because if we have wiring that's exterior of the walls, whenever we pull everything out, you know, to keep goal number one in mind with being modular, uh, I don't want wires and looms and stuff like that still exposed. Yeah. So I want to try some stuff with having like basically plugs in the sides of the walls um, where we can run like lighting and switched lighting into some of the cabinets. Um, I think that's going to be some, I'm going to have to figure that out, out off camera because it's going to take some advanced brainstorming and beer drinking <laughs> and just looking at it basically. Um, but I'll probably do that this evening or tomorrow or something like that and kind of come up with an idea of how that's going to work or anything like that. Because I really love whenever I can have cabinets, upper cabinets that have under, that have lighting underneath. Yes. But whenever it's a matter of like taking the cabinet off the wall, it's like, well, you're left with a bunch of wires that are already connected. So if I had like a plug, you know, that was, oh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in the cabinet. And it's, it's like, okay, plug the cabinet in and then put the cabinet up. And then there's a part of the plug that's a, on a switch that's over here that's built into the wall full time. Right. Then sure would look nice. And that'd be a really cool function. I haven't seen that yet. So we're trying to be brown, groundbreaking on that thing. Groundbreaking? <laughs> <laughs> groundbreaking outlets <laughs> groundbreaking outlets cool yeah no i like that idea okay um so that's most of the electrical outlets and loads and stuff like that uh refrigerator we may we may make it to where we wire it for in the wall to where it can be on either side like okay. i don't see a problem with doing that um and then we can just fuse it in the fuse block uh, it's not a problem okay um stuff on the ceiling so we're going so we're probably going to do a rooftop air conditioner. Uh, we really like the idea of the cruising comfort air conditioners, but they just take up a lot of space on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so we, as of shooting this video, we haven't made a big decision on that yet, but yeah. we're definitely leaning more towards a rooftop air conditioner. Um, and I'm going to have to play around in SketchUp to find out exactly where it's going to be so that I can maximize the amount of solar panels that we can put up on the roof rack as well. So, we're gonna have a max air fan somewhere up here and we'll have an air conditioner somewhere up here. And then we'll have lights everywhere. There's not a air conditioner or a roof air fan. Right. Uh, do you care if they're like puck lights or like strip lights? Do you have a preference? Um, as of today? As of today, no. I mean, I like the puck lights and the other van. Okay, but cool. So we'll kind of play around. Works. We'll kind of look around for some inspiration too. And yeah. like, you know, as we- Track lighting. Track lighting, track lighting? Oh, that'd be fun. That would be fun. Okay. <laughs> so, Modular. <laughs> <laughs> we could get rid of the lights <laughs> altogether. <laughs> Modular lighting. Um, yeah. So I think that's pretty much where everything is going to go. Is there anything that we're missing? I'm sure there is. Grace, are we missing anything? No. <laughs> okay. So I think I think that's all. Can we can we say this is good enough for now? Now this is pretty much just like, you know, planning for phase one of this build. Uh, we didn't really talk about like, you know, color palettes and stuff yeah. like that, that that's going to be 112% your job. That's, yes. I'm not going to do color yes. palettes. Um, you can't tell green from blue, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll do that. This is true. Um, so this is more like where things are roughly going to go, making sure that we're on the same page about this, uh, trying to incorporate the ideas that everybody gave us uh, over the last few YouTube videos and everything like that. And then like, as this project evolves, there's a good chance we're gonna have another planning phase or two or three or five or however many it honestly takes. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but this what's- This is an evolving process. This is an evolving process. And um, we're excited for it. Yeah. This is gonna be great. Now I'm gonna hop into Microsoft Visio for the first part of this episode and show you how I'm going to map everything in the van out. And then Steph is going to come down and help me measure everything out. And then we'll wrap up this video by putting all of that information into the Explorus Life Wire Sizing Calculator to determine what sizes of wire that we need to be using for all of those circuits. Now, let's get started. Now I use Microsoft Visio for all of the diagrams you find on Explorus Life, and this one is no exception. So I have a brand new file right here. Now, I'm not going to be teaching you how to use Visio, but more so the process of how it all comes together. 
This diagram is going to be a rough draft and should be considered a work in progress throughout this build as we refine the electrical system and add components. Rough drafts are just that, rough, so don't expect it to be pretty by the end of this episode. This stuff takes time. By the end of this build, I'll have this diagram and most of the parts list and kits for the entire electrical system available to you, so check out the video description and first comment below for more info on that as I make it available. I started out with a handful of rectangles. The top one represents the ceiling, the middle one represents the front of the van, and the left and right rectangles represent the driver's side and the passenger side of the van, respectively. Picture this diagram as if you were looking into the van from the back doors. Next, I'm going to place all of the components around the van in roughly the same location that they will actually be in the van. I already had some component placeholders, so I just dragged and dropped them into place. The component placeholders aren't really anything fancy, they're just boxes with the component label, the operating voltage, and the operating amperage on them. I was able to find the operating amperages by simply looking in the user manual or the data sheet of whatever component I was looking at, and these can pretty much always just be found online. Now, if you're trying to do some planning like this for your own camper, the best piece of advice I can offer is to take your time, but don't get analysis paralysis. Remember, this is just a rough draft, and you can move these boxes around once you get into the van and start to actually see where things are going. You'll see us do this in the upcoming episodes of this series, and I can pretty much guarantee you that this diagram will look different by the time all of the electrical is installed. Next, I added the rear of the van, as I had a few components to install back there, like some auxiliary exterior lighting. Now, I'm definitely going to put those on a switch, but I might also make it so that those come on automatically when the reverse lights come on, which I think would be pretty cool. We'll see, though. Let me know if you think that's a good idea or not. Next, I started drawing wire paths. Now, I actually only drew a few wire runs to give me a quick idea of which devices and outlets will be on each circuit. I didn't draw all of the wire runs just yet, as I know that the devices are going to change, and I also know that I'm going to be incorporating relay blocks or some kind of relay-based switch panel to control all the lights and other devices that need to be turned off and on. Trying to draw those in right now would require too much rework for me in the future. Now, if you're trying to do this for your own camper, I would actually just recommend trying to draw out as much of the wiring runs as you can, because this might help you visualize how all of this will look, but keep in the back of your mind that these things will change, and know that you can build this diagram in stages. Even planning this out on a circuit-by-circuit -circuit basis will be helpful. You'll see us do that in the upcoming videos as well. Next, I made a spreadsheet and put down all of my different circuits. I'll be installing two separate 12 volt fuse blocks in this van to try to keep the wire runs as short as possible and to minimize the number of wires that have to go laterally across the ceiling or floor since our Battleborn battery bank will be positioned on the driver's side of the van. I divided this spreadsheet up into passenger side circuits and driver side circuits, then I listed out where the circuits would be going and what components they were going to be for. Some of these circuits are for auxiliary power circuits, and that just means that I plan to have a pluggable outlet in the wall of the van that can be connected to whatever we need it to. It might be a refrigerator, or it might be a light. Who knows? The upper switch power circuits will also be plugs in the walls that will be powered by switches for things like under cabinet lighting that can be connected and disconnected as needed if we want to uninstall the cabinet modules. Remember, one of the three main goals of this van is to make it modular so that most of this furniture can be removed as needed. Now this part was simply using a tape measure to measure approximately how far it was going to be from the fuse block to the furthest load in each circuit, and putting that information into the spreadsheet. It's pretty important to think about where the wires will run when doing this so that all of the wires can also be bundled together. Next, I went back to the computer and put the amperage for each circuit into the spreadsheet. For each specific device, I put it as its listed amperage. For every circuit that doesn't have a defined amperage, like multiple 12 volt outlets for example, I just put those circuits as 15 amp circuits. So just like in your house, you may have five different plugins around your bedroom, each with two outlets on it, each rated for 15 amps. But all of those outlets are all combined on the same 15 or 20 amp circuit. You can use as many outlets as you need to at the same time, but you just can't exceed the total circuit amperage. Same principle here. 
we just won't be able to pull more than 15 amps from any one of these circuits, which is more than enough for what we'll be using any of them for. The length of wire runs in the 12 volt DC circuits matters quite a bit. The longer the run, the bigger the wire needs to be. So the length of both the positive and negative wires needs to be accounted for. So I just multiplied everything on the one way length column by two to get the total length of the conductors in each circuit. Next, I made two columns, a column for the recommended wire size at 3% voltage drop and a recommended wire size at 10% voltage drop. ABYC recommends no more than 3% voltage drop for all critical branch circuit loads and no more than 10% voltage drop for all non-critical branch circuit loads. We don't really have any circuits that would be considered critical loads because if, for example, our overhead lights went out, that really wouldn't put us in any kind of risk to our health or safety, like if the bilge pump lost power on a boat or something like that. So next, I'm just going to go through each of these circuits, putting the numbers into the Explorus Life wire sizing calculator for both the 3% column and the 10% column, using the voltage drop slider in the calculator to go back and forth between the two. Next, I made another column for consolidated wire sizes so that I could come up with a more concrete plan for the actual size of wire I was going to use. Now, I wanted to err on the side closer to 3% voltage drop just because it's always better to round wires to the next biggest wire size within reason. But for some of the circuits recommending 6 and 8 gauge wire, I'm actually going to round those back down to 10 gauge because the fuse blocks that we're using have a max wire size of 10 gauge. But anywhere in between those two values of 3 and 10% voltage drop is allowed. The two circuits at the bottom are exceptions. The Nomadic 24 volt air conditioner that we're going to be using has a four gauge recommendation from the calculator, but the manufacturer recommends two gauge, so we're gonna go with that. Same on the Victron 100 amp DC to DC charger that we plan on using. The calculator is recommending four gauge to stay at 3% voltage drop, but I'm actually going to round up for the sake of consolidating wire sizes, as I won't be using four gauge anywhere else in the build. Now the wire sizes of these last two circuits can be bigger than 10 gauge as they will not be going to the smaller fuse blocks with the 10 gauge max wire size. They will be going to the, links, the Victron Lynx distributor down in the same area as the Battleborn battery bank over the driver's side wheel well. Parts needed. Here's a list of parts we need for this project. The Explorus Life 30 amp short power inlet wiring kit, which includes the 30 amp short power inlet, 10 3 wire, 3 10 gauge ferrules, number 8 by 1 inch stainless steel machine screws, number 8 stainless washers, and number 8 stainless nylock nuts. You'll also need Rust Oleum spray paint, painter's tape, duct tape, and a cardboard box. Here's a list of tools that we need for this project. A cordless drill, an eighth inch drill bit, two and seven eighths inch hole saw, a screwdriver or impact driver with a Phillips bit, 11 seconds inch socket and ratchet, diagonal cutters, wire strippers, a Sharpie, a mechanical pencil, a deburring tool, trim removal tools, tape measure or a ruler, gloves, safety glasses, and a shop vac. We are going to install the Battleborn battery bank and other related power equipment over the driver's side wheel well of this van. So we will be installing the shore power inlet on the other side of this wall, right back here on the rear quarter panel. We needed to gain access to the inside of the rear quarter panel, so we removed the factory installed panel by using a trim clip removal tool and worked our way around the panel, removing the trim clips so that we could get the panel out of the way. To protect the outside of the van from any kind of metal shavings, we covered the entire area with painter's tape. And then we drilled an eighth inch hole from the inside of the van with our cordless drill. We duct taped our shop vac nozzle to the inside of the van to be sure to catch all the metal shavings. We drilled this hole from the inside so that we could be sure to give ourselves plenty of space from any of the body support ribs or any other obstructions inside the van. Then we moved outside and taped a box around where we will be using our hole saw to further control any metal shavings. 
Now, if you're not picking up on it yet, metal shavings are bad. They always seem to find their way into the most inconvenient spots and start rusting. Next is hole saw time. We used a two and seven eighths inch hole saw and very carefully started cutting our hole from the outside of the van. The metal of the van here is incredibly thin, so this doesn't take very long. We didn't use cutting fluid as this cut shouldn't take long enough for the blade to heat up and it wasn't worth the added mess. Now that our hole is drilled, we are going to take our shore power inlet and put it into the hole and line it up so it's nice and level and then use our drill to lightly mark where the holes need to be in the van body. A mechanical pencil with some long lead or something like that would have actually worked better here, but alas, we just didn't have one. Next, we used an eighth inch drill bit to drill the four screw holes. And then we used a deburring tool around the bigger hole to get rid of any sharp parts or edges. With all the edges cleaned up, we held a piece of cardboard over the back of the hole and then sprayed a bit of Rust-Oleum paint over the area we've been working on to cover up any exposed metal to prevent it from rusting. And then we did the same on the back side. We didn't tape off the back since all of this will be covered up with insulation and walls, so we weren't too worried about it. Now that we were done making metal shavings, we could remove the box and tape from the quarter panel and carefully give the area, both front and back, a once over with the shop back brush attachment. Next up, we can wire the shore power inlet. So we're going to remove the retaining clip on the back of the shore power inlet and then feed the 10-3 wire from the Explorus Life 30 amp shore power wiring kit through the back cover of the inlet. Next, we're going to strip the outer sheathing back about two and a half inches and then strip about three quarters of an inch off the end of each wire. Now, ferrules don't fit particularly well in this shore power inlet, so we aren't going to use them here. Next, we're going to loosen the wire retaining screws on the sides of the shore power inlet. And then I'm going to insert the black, white, and green wires into their respective color-coded holes. And then I'm going to retighten the wire retaining screws to 20 inch pounds of torque, making sure that there is no insulation under any of the terminals, creating a poor connection. And then we can slide the shore power inlet rear housing up the wire and then put the retaining clip back in place. Next, we're going to fasten the inlet to the van by placing the inlet in place, putting our one inch number eight stainless steel pan head screws into place and then threading our washers and nylock nuts on the back and tightening them until they're snug. The back of this inlet has a waterproof gasket pre-installed on it, so no additional sealant should be necessary. But if you're mirroring this installation and don't trust the seal, feel free to add a bead of die core sealant around the perimeter if you like. The ferrules that were included in the wiring kit from this installation will go on the opposite side of the wire when we wire this inlet to the Victron MultiPlus inverter charger later in this series. So I'm just going to tape this baggie to the end of this wire and coil the wire up for safekeeping for later. And that's all there is to it. The shore power inlet is now installed and could technically be connected to a 30 amp shore power inlet at a campground or to a standard 15 amp household outlet by means of a 30 amp to 15 amp adapter. But don't connect that yet. Remember, the other end of this wire in the camper is not connected to anything, so we don't want to send power to it. So I think we need to take the visors off first because okay. um, ultimately I think this is fastened to the roof behind the headliner okay. and it's also kind of in the way. So we're going to need a trim removal tool here and then pull that off. See if you can work on that side okay. and then I'll work on this side and then we'll see what size of, uh, of bolt is behind that. Okay. I was going to use that. <laughs> Too slow. How did you do that so easily? I pulled on it. Um, and yeah. there's, there's also, so there's actually a, a tab. There's right a here. tiny little slot back there. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Okay, so use that little slot on the back of that. Yes. And then it comes off. Really easily.
Okay, so it has the wires. Is that for the mirror? Yeah. Yep. So if you can, uh, Steph, if you'll, if you'll pull that in that way and then swivel that in down. Okay. That should come out of there and then the wires. Um, not quite like that. Yep. No, that's oh, good. Is it? Okay, cool. Okay. Use a pry tool to undo. Oh, just your finger now. Clip. Uh, it, it's just your finger now. It's, it's really easy here. Here. I don't know if you're pulling too much on it. It's this little clip right here. Oh, nice. Okay. Just out. Fantastic. Cool. Okay, let's put this screw back in there. Okay. Okay, so next, I believe, is. We can pop these down, yep. but I think I also saw a tutorial that was saying that uh, there's wires behind here to undo. Okay. So. So maybe pop this down first. Yeah, I think so. And this is just a retainer clip, probably. Yes. Okay. Looks like. Hell yeah! Easy. So remove. That clippy. It's, yeah, there it's it a is. tiny one again. That clippy. <laughs> uh, what other clippies? So actually, this is that's, both of those. Yeah, that's all that's keeping this together. So that comes down and off. So that just kind of puts in there and swivels up out of way. And then we'll need to take this one off once we get the rest of the headliner out. Yeah. We'll probably need to take this one off as well. It is definitely something we need to remove. Okay. Because it's way up in there. So let's go ahead and pop it loose. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> pop now, it loose without breaking it. <laughs> now I don't believe you needed to actually disconnect this then. Okay. So I'm just going to reconnect that together. Okay, I see. Because those both stay up in here. Fantastic. Cool. Um, now there is a bolt up in here for that's holding this up. I will get the I will get a socket to fit that. Okay. If you want to start working on uh, these little trim cover things. Okay, and that's a nine thirty seconds socket. That's up in there. Okay, and do you want to do these yep. sides? So there's two bolts up here. Um, one is one is a nine thirty seconds. The smallest one is. Oh. <laughs> and the bigger one is five sixteenths. I definitely think those are bolts. I do too. Okay, so I can get my fingernail under this one, but yeah. I just need something to go under it after that. I yeah. just don't have enough hands to do so. <laughs> okay. Oh, 
Never mind, just got it. Hey, let's look at that. That let is me, indeed a bolt. <laughs> let me see that. Okay, so it, I mean, there's nothing to it. It's just prying it out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we have the part number if we damage one. <laughs> Literally my fingernail. <laughs> Literally here. Well, how about I hold the headliner with my head <laughs> and, you, and you do all the work. Okay, okay. perfect. <laughs> you watching this. That was a pain in the ass. Um, but a good mixture of prying tools and screwdrivers and equal parts cussing uh, did the trick. But we're going to try to find where you can source these uh, from and the parts numbers and all that kind of stuff. We'll put it in the video description. If we can find it. If we can find it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best. Okay, but next up is the bolts that are the screws that are holding this together. That is nine thirty seconds on these four bolts up front. Could okay. That clip too. That's on the floor. Oh, never mind. No, oh, we're coming down. Yep. Okay. <laughs> hey. Whoa, that was it. Okay, that was all the connections. Nice. So the next step is going to be removing the actual headliner. Uh, now that the shelf is out of the way. Now I know there are three trim clips, like right up there, where Stephanie is pointing. <laughs> and those will, should just uh, just pop down with this. Yeah, that works better. So we're just kind of pulling the sides out here. Yep, and then it's going to be the um, pulling it out of that. Yeah. Something holding it, it in there. Something here, yeah. Something holding that in there. It's interesting because it's not on this side. It's just on this side. Sorry. <laughs> I honked with my booby. <laughs> there, there it was. Go. So there's a clip right here that needs to come loose. Okay, now. <laughs> I'm just gonna stay here. <laughs> if you'll just hold that <laughs> forever. No. Okay. If you'll uh, pull his wires out. Yep, and are these, hold on. Nope, those are. Nothing's connected. Nothing's connected. Wait, something's connected. This green thing that I said not to disconnect earlier, you do indeed need to. So the green thing, Steph said, not to disconnect. We should disconnect. Yep, okay, now you're good. We'll just have, it, we'll just have Grace add subtitles <laughs> over that in editing. We didn't need Careful to- Careful over there, you're really mangling it. Okay. Okay. Now Avoid. good luck. The camera gear. Okay. <laughs> hey, we got it. <laughs> nice. Okay. So I think that's pretty much it. Headliner's out, headliner shelf is out. Um, pretty easy for the most part. How long did that take us about? Any, I have no any idea. ideas? No, what time is it now? 930. 930. So like probably an hour, hour and a half, hour and a half at tops. And that's also hour. Yeah. hour. So not too big of a, uh, a process. Ultimately, this is going to give us fantastic access into insulating uh, all the way down into this cavity here, as well as uh, doing like sound insulation and everything like that. Uh, 
we now have access into these cavities so we can put some sound insulation and uh, thermal insulation in there. So that's uh, pretty much that. Uh, things we learned. Um, these little clips are really frustrating, but having actually having fingernails helped get them out. I'm going to fingernails or a very, very small screwdriver. Because what we were running into was the metal of the screwdriver was marring the edges of that trim plate. And so we're going to have to like kind of just, you know, we'll just take our fingernails and like push the plastic back down into place and make it look nice again. Uh, it's it's fine enough, but ultimately we're striving for perfection the best we can. And uh, so that's what we're going to do with that. Um, I'll try to find part numbers for these and put them in the video description in case you break some. Uh, hopefully that'll help uh, get a hold of new ones. Should be able to get them from Ford though. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also look for trim tools that have a flatter head on them and leave those in the video description as well. Uh, Cause I do think that would have been helpful because yes. honestly your fingernails were working better than the trim tools yes. sometimes. Yep. Uh, anything we would have done differently? No, I mean, uh, knowing the order of operations would, would have helped a little bit more, but. Yeah, so I'll put the, our order of operations, I'll put that in the blog post, uh, video description on that as well. Anything else? And in this video, we're going to spray lizard skin sound control sound deadening to make our transit a little bit quieter while driving down the road. Now, the first step in this process is honestly just a ton of prep work. We needed to access the metal under the floor liner and seat pedestals, so we started removing the seats. Now, this isn't really a full tutorial on how to remove seats, so I'm going to gloss over this pretty quickly, but let me know if you need a full tutorial on this and we will make that happen. We slid the seat forward, removed the rear battery tie-down screws, the battery cables, the seat to seat base bolts, the wiring harness under the seat, the seat belt restraining cover, the seat belt bolt, and pulled out the seat. Then we did the same thing on the passenger seat and got it out of the way. Next, we undid the connections to the inverter under the passenger seat and unbolted the inverter bracket and removed it from the van. Next, under the driver's seat, we removed the batteries and battery box and then unscrewed the CCP and wiring harness from the seat pedestal, removed the pedestal, folded the floor liner back as far as possible, and removed the cover from the center of the van. We wanted to remove the floor liner completely, but the floor liner really went quite a ways up underneath the dash and completely around the steering column. So for the sake of not making this project bigger than it already is, we decided to call it good enough. And especially after seeing that there was already some sound deadening and insulation up under the floor liner up front. Uh, so we would just spray as far forward as we could get up underneath the floor liner without getting into the dash. Next, we removed the door panels, which was just a matter of removing the screw covers, the reflector light, removing some screws, and then prying the door free of the trim clips, and then disconnecting the door lock and window connections, as well as the door handle release cable. Now, if you need a more detailed tutorial on this process, let me know and we will make a dedicated video for that one as well. Now the next step was to clean off all of the surfaces that we were going to be spraying. So we vacuumed up all of the surfaces, wiped everything down with degreaser, and then lightly scuffed up all the surfaces with a Scotch-Brite pad. Now it was a little painful putting all of those swirl marks in the new paint, but we wanted to make sure that this lizard skin would stick properly, so it had to be done. Next, we taped and masked off all of the areas that we did not want the lizard skin to get onto, which meant all the windows, the dash, the wires, the electrical components like the electric door slider motors and stuff like that, and also the threaded bolt holes around the van. Now, we sort of messed up on the threaded screw holes, uh, but I'll talk about that at the end of the video in the things we learned section. Now, Taping and masking took the better part of a full day between the three of us. 
We were pretty thorough on this though, as we definitely didn't want to be cleaning up overspray after the fact. Now this was definitely one of those projects where the prep work took over twice as long as the actual project. After the van was completely masked off, we gave it one final cleaning and wipe down. This time we wiped the surfaces off with alcohol to make sure that there was a nice clean surface for the lizard skin to bond with. Next was on to getting ready to apply the lizard skin. The instructions that came with the lizard skin are actually pretty good. So if you're trying to take on this project, go ahead and just spend the extra four minutes it takes to read the application instructions that comes with the application kit. Now I put on a Tyvek suit because lizard skin is considered um, non-hazardous, but I just really didn't want it all over myself and my clothes and with hindsight being 2020, uh, that was a good idea. Next was getting the spray gun ready, which just meant setting the nozzle to the correct position as noted in the instructions, connecting the air hose, setting the air compressor to 70 PSI, opening the lizard skin bucket, mixing the lizard skin with the paddle included with the application kit, cleaning off the paddle in a bucket of warm water, and then pouring the lizard skin into the sprayer cup and connecting it to the spray gun. Next was finally game time. Now I started working my way around the van, spraying the lizard skin onto all the surfaces, paying special attention to all the surfaces that were large and exposed to the outside, as those were going to be the noisiest while driving. The body support ribs don't contribute as much noise while driving, but I just went ahead and decided to go ahead and give them a single coat of lizard skin just to be sure, and also keep any weird vibration noises to a minimum as well. Now the goal here was to spray two 20 mil coats of this stuff on all the body panels, let it dry, and then come back and then spray another 20 mil coat. But I did have some issues here. Number one, the lizard skin goes on in a rough orange peel type of texture, which makes measuring the lizard skin accurately with the included gauge seemingly impossible. And number two, I am personally not accurate enough with a spray gun to uniformly spray exactly 20 mils of product onto a surface. So for thickness here, I, for the most part, just tried to use the gauge the best I could to get a good idea of what 20 mils looked like. And then from there, I just measured with my heart. Once I felt like I had 20 mils of coverage all over the large body panels, I cleaned up the spray gun and let the lizard skin dry overnight. The instructions said that the lizard skin would dry in one to two hours, but I really didn't want to walk around on a barely dry coat, so I just let it dry overnight. Now the next day, I followed the exact same steps as the previous day for the second coat, and then cleaned up the spray gun by disassembling everything that could be disassembled, scrubbed all the lizard skin off of the sprayer, sprayed some warm water through the sprayer, and then set it out to air dry. Now the following day, after the second coat dried, here's how it turned out. Here's some things we learned during this process. Number one, a properly sized compressor is key. Some of the other lizard skin videos on YouTube are using an undersized compressor and they have issues with the gun not being able to spray enough volume for the lizard skin to not clog up the gun. Now, never had that issue, but lizard skin recommends an air compressor uh, capable of delivering four to five CFM at 55 to 70 PSI. The compressor that we upgraded to for this project delivers 5.3 CFM at 90 PSI, so we were good to go there. Number two. A respirator is a pretty key tool here. Now this stuff is classified as non-hazardous, but there's definitely a lot of particles and fumes in the air when spraying this stuff in an enclosed space like this. So I would even say that a simple dust mask is probably not going to cut it here. As far as fumes go though, once the coating actually dries, the smell goes away dramatically. So I estimate that after it cures even further, the smell will be completely gone. Number three, that little spray cup on the bottom of the spray gun, it just doesn't last very long. So I think next time I tackle this project, I think I would get a second spray cup and just have Steph keep refilling those cups to keep the process moving a little faster. Now, I was emptying a cup of sound control every probably three to four minutes. So a bulk of the time of this project was actually spent getting out of the van and getting refills. Now, number four, 
This lizard skin is actually pretty thick stuff, and when it cures, it's actually pretty hard. Not as hard and durable as like bed liner, but maybe pretty close, I guess. Now, on some of the threaded bolt holes we covered up with painter's tape earlier, the lizard skin completely covered up some of those little small tape squares, and we're probably going to have to dig some of those out, which may require tapping some threads. Now, hopefully not, but I'm going to go ahead and mentally prepare myself to do so, and we'll see how that works as this build progresses. For this video, we have done three different tests. The first test was an in-vehicle driving test. So before we sprayed, we took a little drive and recorded some audio to see how loud the van was while driving and how it sounded while speaking in a normal talking voice. And here's how it sounded. speaking voice sounds like. Uh, we're cruising down the road right now, about 70 miles an hour. Uh, this is with no sound deadening on. I feel like I'm talking just a, loud, a little bit louder than I normally would be if I was just carrying on a normal conversation. But this is what it sounds like with no sound deadening in the back of the van. And we'll check back after we get it all put on to see what it sounds like. So this is the after test. Uh, we've got 12 gallons of uh, lizard skin sound control on in the back. Uh, we're cruising at 70 miles an hour. The microphone and audio is set up to the exact same as it was before. Um, yeah, and so just, I think I'm talking just a little bit louder than I would if I was in like a dead quiet room. It's not silent in here, obviously. I don't think anybody expected it to be. But just from listening to it, uh, not having it back to back, uh, definitely seems a lot quieter and I'm pretty happy with uh, with how well it did because I know the headliner metal was particularly loud. So this is what it sounds like at 70 mile an hour with the lizard skin sound controls had sound deadening in the back. So the next test that we're wanting to do was we wanted to see how noise or music on the outside of the van uh, kind of translated to how it sounded on the inside of the van. So. We've got a phone set up right here with some music ready to go. And then we're going to move the camera inside the van once we get this music playing and to see how it sounds with sound deadening and without sound deadening. Uh, not really sure if it's gonna make much of a difference. I don't think it will, but that's why we're testing. So we're gonna get the music started and move the camera inside. So now we're going to do the after uh, audio test or music test, the same as we did. Uh, we have these back doors taped shut for masking purposes. Um, so I'm going to start the music and then I'm gonna go out the front doors, set this over on the uh, work table in the exact same spot and see if we can tell the difference. <laughs> So we just listened to the audio test up on the computer and uh, you just listened to it on the video. And unless you were listening through headphones, you may not have been able to hear a difference, which that's pretty much the conclusion that we came to as well. Uh, we couldn't hear a big difference between the before and after with the music sitting on the work table over there. Um, and that's pretty representative of what is um, what we actually heard. It was pretty quiet uh, before, you know, you have a phone outside and then you're inside the van. Uh, but it was just as quiet 
afterwards as well. So I think that's a pretty inconclusive test. Uh, we saw that maybe it doesn't really even matter for kind of soundproofing, if you will, uh, the van. So now that test is out of the way, we are going to go back into the van and do the tap test uh, before and afters. So now that we have two of our three uh, baselines set uh, for how this van sounds without sound deadening, we did the driving test, we did the kind of music inside versus outside test, and now we're just going to do like a tapping on the panels test to see how like kind of the resonance of the panel sounds now versus whenever we install the sound deadening afterwards. And so what we're testing here is I'm just going to go around the van in a few spots and tap on it, just like that. And we're going to keep the camera uh, three feet away from the panel. And we're just going to be listening to the different, uh, like how long the panel rings after I tap on it. So similar with like, I don't know if we have any uh, former band nerds in the crowd, but if, uh, if you have like a bass drum and you tap on it and then you add mass to it with your hand, that resonance stops a lot faster. And that's really what we're doing here because as we try it, as we cruise down the road, the wind is shaking these panels just a little bit and causing some of that resonant frequencies and it's just going to make it louder in here. That's kind of the, the theory, the hypothesis, um, but we're going to be uh, tapping on this and we're going to get you those bass lines and then after we get that done, uh, we're going to spray um, the lizard skin on and then we're going to jump to the results and we're going to do some of these tests again. So let's get started. So we finished up spraying two coats of the lizard skin uh, sound control, sound deadening. Uh, so two coats at approximately 40 mils, which is 40 thousandths of an inch. And whenever you spray that onto that thickness, it adds about a half a pound of mass uh, per square foot to the body panels, which half a pound of mass per square foot is about the same as the 80 mil um, like kill mat um, uh, sound deadening, uh, this peel and stick stuff. So that's what we've done. Now we're going to do the tap test, exact same as before. Uh, I'm going to tap on the exact same three spots around the van, just like before. Same audio levels. Um, we are not editing anything in camera as far as the audio goes at this particular part. So what you're hearing now, me speaking, as well as uh, the tapping that you're about to hear, uh, it's going to be all unedited uh, so that we're able to keep it as consistent as possible. So, here we go. So now that the project is all wrapped up and we've had a chance to drive it around a little bit and some stuff like that, what do you think? Do you think it actually made a difference? Yeah, I mean, it definitely made a difference. Um, there's definitely a difference in the, the sound between um, before when we had nothing on it and now. So there's obviously some, some mass added, which is going to help. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely a difference. What do you think? Uh, I thought so as well. And I, you know, after listening to the before afters on the video that we took, uh, I wish that the differences came through a little bit more on camera. It's just so hard to sometimes capture what you hear in real life versus you hear on the other side of the internet, the other side of the computer. Um, I think the biggest difference was when we were driving down the road, it was significantly easier to talk to each other mm -hmm. uh, after the sound deadening than it was before the sound deadening. On video, I just think I just feel like it almost changed the note of <laughs> the sound uh, from the outside, for lack of a better word. But it didn't seem like it was quieter on video. But real life, it was definitely quieter. So that was kind of my thoughts on if it actually made a difference. 
So we got some questions in last week's video and I just kind of want to talk about them. Uh, so one of them is the cost uh, of the lizard skin versus a peel and stick like Dynamat or Killmat or something like that. So you looked at the costs. What did you find out about those? Yeah, so the Killmat is definitely less expensive um, at about $1.75 per square foot. Um, versus the lizard skin is about $2.03 per square foot if you're getting a, a coverage of 90 square feet per two gallon bucket. Um, in addition to the cost of the product itself, with the lizard skin, you will need to have the spray gun. Um, you'll need to um, have, a, have an air compressor that is large enough to, um, to do the job. And then the, the other thing with the um, lizard skin versus the kill mat is all of the prep work. So you're gonna have to have all of that painter's tape, the, the, uh, the masking paper, um, the Tyvek suit, all of that, the respirator. Um, so all of that adds up with cost. Um, so, I mean, the end, at the end of the day, definitely lizard skin is more expensive per square foot. Yep, definitely. Um, the other question we had was weight. Uh, versus a peel and stick. So the weight's gonna be the same. Uh, per square foot, the weight's gonna be the same. So kill mat, uh, 80 mil is um, a half a pound per square foot. And lizard skin, when applied to the manufacturer's recommendation of 40 mils, is also a half pound per square foot. So per square foot, it's the exact same weight. You know, we sprayed about 12, we sprayed 12 gallons um, of product in this van. And so we estimate it, um, we got about a hundred extra pounds of mass, which mm -hmm. is kind of the point. Like it's, that's not a negative, you know, we have to add weight to, that's kind of the whole point of adding mass to uh, decrease the, uh, the sound, uh, the sound resonance from the outside. Um, but as far as like comparing one to the other on a per square foot basis, uh, that's the difference. Now, um, a lot of people don't you don't do 100% coverage when using lizard skin or something like that. Um, so if you're, oh yeah, when using kill mat, sorry, yeah, they don't go for 100% coverage. Which if you're only going for 20% coverage, it's going to be even less weight. So you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, how much coverage is going to work for you and in what spots and all that kind of stuff. So, that, but then the answer gets kind of complicated there. Yeah, absolutely. So the next thing was um, application time. So um, about how, mu how, how much time did it take uh, to apply the lizard skin versus um, the kill mat, which we have done before? Yeah, so we've done both of them before. Um, the actually applying the lizard skin took way less time. Um, it was about, I think, maybe two and a half hours per coat. Um, so, you know, five hours for the entire thing. Uh, but there's drying time and there's curing time in between those and the masking time the uh the, the prep work took a long time um that definitely was was the longest piece of of this whole process um, and there will be additional time um to remove all of that masking yep so true um the other questions we had what we got here application time overall thoughts i suppose yeah so what are your overall thoughts about the uh the product the um, the application and everything in general. Yeah, so overall thoughts. Um, I think it, uh, the Lizard Skin is a great product. Um, I'm really happy that we were able to get full coverage on this van. Um, that makes me feel a lot better going forward about the, the, the fact that just every surface is covered for sure. Um, there's no bare metal in the back of the van. Um, obviously in the front of the van, there's that's a little bit different, but in the back of the van, there is no bare metal that we're gonna have to be worrying about. Um, so that's definitely a, a huge plus. Um, that being said, I think that if if I were weighing the cost um, the cost benefit of this um, this product versus Kilmat, I personally would probably choose Kilmat um, one because it's less ex expensive, but more so just because it's less complicated to install. Um, the the time commitment of having to really commit to this project and once you are, once you get started on it, you said, you know, two and a half hours of spray time. Um, that's a long time to be really committed to a project. And for me personally, I would like, I would prefer the the ability to put in a little bit of the, the kill mat, you know, go and work on another project. Um, 
I don't really have the attention span to, to spend two and a half hours on one project. So that's me personally. What about you? Uh, so wrote down my list here. So got some pros and some cons about the whole project. So I think one thing I do like you touched on a few times was the ability to really spray that stuff in all of the nooks and crannies. Like there was a few spots that, you know, as I was doing the process, I was going around and like tapping on various surfaces to see how resonant they were. And in some of the spots I was able to like spray some of the, the lizard skin up into some of the body support ribs. And maybe that makes a difference, you know, maybe it doesn't, but ultimately it's one of those things to, it's nice to get full coverage and have the ability to. With something like kill mat or a pill and stick, you know, there's no option to even do that in some of the spots I was trying to spray uh, the lizard skin in some of those little nooks and crannies. So the next thing was kind of a pro and a con all at the same time, the bigger compressor. So Stephanie said that that was a con. Uh, but I think it's a pro because I wanted a bigger compressor. <laughs> um, so I wanted the ability to, in the future, um, you know, run an HVLP gun or run air tools or fill up our tires in our, uh, in, in our car or our van faster. And the little pancake compressor that we have just wasn't going to cut it. So if you need a new compressor and you need a reason and a justification to get a new compressor, then you should probably just do this project. That way it's like, well, I have to get a new compressor to do this project. So I think that's a pro and a con. <laughs> um, well, worthwhile to note also, you can rent rent a, oh, yeah. uh, a, a larger air compressor if you don't have one. Yeah, most Home Depots and Lowe's and probably some other equipment rental places, uh, you can rent air compressors for pretty inexpensive. Uh, if you just want to rent one for uh, you know a few days or something, mm -hmm. so uh, our closest Home Depot and Lowe's is like two hours away, so we didn't really have that option. <laughs> so the next thing I like was uh, you can't be lazy with lizard skin, or it forces you to not be lazy. Um, you know, once you have everything taped off uh, and you have that expensive you know two gallon pail, um, it's pretty motivating to just use the whole pail and not be like ah that's good enough, it's fine. It's like well we've already got this taped off. I already had this pail sitting here. I'm already in this Tyvek suit with a respirator. Uh, let's just like do it once and do it right and keep it going. So I think that's kind of a pro with that. Whereas lizard skin, if you kind of get sidetracked, it's, it would be easy to just be like, ah, oh, that's good enough. <laughs> My next con on this one is you can't drink beer while doing the project because of that respirator. Uh, it's just not feasible to not wear a respirator on this uh, project. And it's kind of like, it's a lot like work. Um, I think this is a lot more like work intensive, you know, it's loud, it's noisy, uh, it stinks uh, while it's being sprayed, much like just painting in general. Um, and you can't really just, it's not like a chill activity where you can drink some beers, pop on some good music and listen to that and have a conversation while you're doing the project. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a con there. Um, wait versus I met, oh, those are the other things I had. Um, but I think, Oh, there was the others. I had them covered up. So in window issues, so in the front doors, we didn't spray any lizard skin up front because we really didn't have a good way to spray inside of the front doors without getting it on all of the like gears and the hardware that lets the, uh, the window slide up and down. So we'll actually probably go back through there with some kill mat in the future when we do probably like a upgrading speakers video or something like that and stick some of that on the front doors just because it was not feasible to try to mask everything up in the front doors that needed to be masked. So there was no uh, sound deadening up there for this those driving tests. Um, but as far as like lizard skin versus kill map performance benefits, like it's it's really impossible to tell. Like I think both of them are going to work just fine um, and probably really comparably, 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 I don't know, um, to each other, you know, that's, uh, they're, they're both going to work fine. They're both adding mass at the same rate to the body panels. Uh, I think the lizard skin is probably going to work better because we were able to get more full coverage. Um, you know, if you took the time to do absolute full coverage with a uh, kill mat or something like that, you know, that's probably going to work just as well too, but kind of have to weigh your, uh, what your options and how much work you're willing to do on one versus the other. Um, you know, shy of like setting up two separate vans, doing one one way and the other the other way, it's pretty much impossible to test that. But I think either way, we're super happy with it. And this is not the last ins insulation thing that we're doing. We're gonna be putting 3M Thinsulate or similar 
uh, once we get to the actual installation part of it. And that's going to add even more uh, sound, uh, sound deadening, sound absorption, as well as thermal heat, thermal absorption, or thermal insulation, sorry, to that. So um, once we get all that done, we anticipate the sound deadening and soundproofing to be even better. Any other thoughts? No, I think that about covers it. Perfect. So the front of the van, we had to unmask and untape everything uh, because we were doing the sound testing and driving around and all that kind of stuff for the video that you saw last week. Now, if you were trying to mirror this project, I wouldn't recommend <laughs> doing the sound control and then driving it around and then doing the ceramic insulation. Uh, it's just definitely adding a step to the process. But since we had to do that for YouTube, um, we are going to remask all of this now. We put the seats back in it, again, for the driving portion. Uh, so we're gonna have to mask off the seats, mask off the dash, basically everything from here and here and there, down and over. So that's what we're going to do right now. Now that we're finished with the masking inside, the next step is to get ready to spray. So I'm going to go ahead and reassemble my spray gun uh, after spraying the lizard skin sound deadening right over here. So I'm gonna put this piece onto the end of the gun like this. And then twist the nozzle all the way in. So once the nozzle is all the way in, it's, uh, we need to back this out two full rotations. So I just took a mark with a Sharpie uh, right there and then just gonna back it out two rotations. One and two. And that'll give us a good starting point for, uh, for this. Uh, the further out we unscrew the nozzle, the more product it's going to spray and vice versa for the opposite direction. And then next is attaching the siphon tube to the bottom of the gun. Just like that. So the next thing that we need to do is mix up the lizard skin ceramic insulation. So we're going to open this up. And this one's already about halfway empty or so because the other day, um, before we put the seats and the floorboard back in, I sprayed some of this up underneath the floorboard so we could do the sound testing and stuff like that. So that's why this one's part of the way empty. So I'm going to grab my paddle bit and drill. and start mixing. So the texture of this stuff is quite a bit different than the, uh, than the sound control. This is a lot, it has little ceramic beads in it, which is the ceramic insulation, uh, which makes it a lot lighter weight. Uh, per, per, per square foot, this only adds 0.1 pounds per square foot as opposed to 0.5 pounds for the other stuff. So it's just a lot lighter, which makes it weird to mix. It's almost like phloem, if you remember that stuff from like the 90s, kind of like that foam infused Play-Doh. But anyway, it's all mixed up now. I'm gonna clean off this paddle bit and then get it poured into the spray cup. So the other day I learned that since the stuff is so light, it's really actually kind of hard to pour it into this little cup without spilling it everywhere. So what I'm going to do this time around Saw this on a, another YouTube channel. I think it was DIY Home Renovision. Um, was to tape off a V with some duct tape on the side that I'm pouring it into. So it makes this kind of a spout, if you will. So I'm gonna do that and see if that helps at all. Oh gosh. There we go. Oh yeah. So I'm just gonna stretch it out over this way and then come back with it. So 
So we just got finished uh, shooting the first two gallon pail of the ceramic insulation. And I was just getting really tired of refilling up the cup over and over and over and over again, especially since this stuff is kind of hard to pour. So I came up with an idea that I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but we're going to try it. Cause I'm like 48% sure that it's going to work. So I'm gonna take this tube and I'm going to attach it to the bottom of the siphon hose that was inside the spray gun, drill a hole in the top of the lid and then drop this whole tube down in here. I think it'll work, but we're gonna give it a shot. I don't think I could live with myself if I didn't try it. So that's what we're going to do right now. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So actually, Grace behind the camera, she had a great idea. So we're going to um, put this on here like this. And then fasten this on here like so. Like that. And then it'll curve to the front of the bucket anyway. So I, that's what we're going to try this time. Put it at this end. Make sure that tube goes to the tube. Tube goes to the front. Okay. Yeah. Then whack it. Okay. Now we're gonna try it now. It's working! Nice! <laughs> Okay, so that worked way better than I thought it was going to. The main negative about that one was it was just kind of heavy and awkward, like holding it up above my head. Uh, I probably couldn't have done it with the sound control since it's a little heavier, but it wasn't too bad. Um, so I had to give my shoulders a chance to rest, which was good because the compressor couldn't really run the entire time that I was doing it either. So uh, I am going to keep doing that because it worked good enough for that. So we've got one more coat to spray. Uh, two hours to wait and then a second coat to spray. So I'm going to get the lid off of this, get it mixed up and then take it inside and then plop the lid from the pail that I just finished up inside. And that's what we're going to do right now. The thermal camera that we're going to be using for this test a little tiny camera that just plugs into the bottom of a smartphone and let's take a look at it real quick so on here we've got usb-c connection um we've got an android phone so that's for that there is an apple version as well uh power button on the bottom and two lenses on the front and really that's pretty much all there is to it and let's get it connected to the phone right now and i'll kind of show you how it works from there it's going to tell us to plug this into the bottom. Okay, it's plugged in, and registering. And now it is up and running. So we can see that it's picking up my hand, pretty obviously there. Uh, so let's take a look around the garage and kind of see what this camera is telling us. We can see looking out of the garage, we can see the garage door over on this side. Then we can see the van on this side. So as far as temperature goes, we can see that the white parts up here are about 81 degrees and the dark purple parts down here are about 63 degrees. And if we can kind of match those up to what's in the actual screen, the lights are the hottest part sitting at about 87 degrees or so. Um, and the area around the garage door is the coldest parts. You know, it's kind of cold outside and garage doors are inherently pretty leaky. And so we're having some cold air coming through the garage doors. So that's how we're able to see what the various temperatures are of everything around the garage. And so we're going to go around the garage a little bit and look at some random things 
and we can see the temperatures of those so that whenever we do our testing inside the van, it makes a little bit more sense. So just a few steps down these stairs and I already found the first thing I wanted to show you. So garage floor, right? Nothing there, just standard old concrete. But when we look through the thermal imaging camera, we can see all these lines, kind of squiggly, right? So what that is, that's just our radiant floor heating. And we can actually see where all the tubes are in the concrete. So what radiant floor heating is, is we've got tubes that have hot water running through them to heat up the garage space. And since we have different heat signatures that we can see through this thermal imaging camera, we can see exactly where the heat is coming from in our garage, which is really cool. And it's going to help us with this testing whenever we hop into the van here in a minute. So we are at the front door of the shop now, and it's a metal door, metal frame. So we've usually got quite a bit of like cold air coming through. And so I wanna kind of show a few things about that. So on this door, we can see the purple outline of the door, which means that there's some cold air coming through, as well as down there in the corners and stuff like that. But what I really wanted to show here is with this metal door, um, I can put my hand on the metal door, leave it for a second or two, and then remove my hand. And you can still see exactly where my handprint was on the door, just because it warmed up just a tiny, tiny bit in those two seconds that I had my hand on the door. So the point in this is, is that this thing is really, really, really sensitive, so that whenever we move into the van and we start doing our testing, we can see really, really small details. So now that you know how the thermal camera works, let's go back upstairs and we're gonna talk about the testing that we're actually going to do with it. For this video, we are doing two tests and here are how those tests are going to work. When we sprayed the insulation, we didn't initially spray the entire van. We sprayed two coats on half of the ceiling and two coats on the passenger sidewall, except for where we we're going to be installing a window where we didn't spray anything. This gives us some good testing surfaces for the two tests that we did. For the first test, we pulled the van from our 65 degree shop outside where it was 20 degrees and let the van sit for an hour. We had a time lapse set up inside the van observing the half coated ceiling and then we let that time lapse run for the entire hour of testing. The goal of the first test was to see how the lizard skin resisted heat loss when exposed to cold weather. After the first test, we let the van continue to cool down in the shade. We then pulled the van out into the sun and observed how the spot that we left uncoated for the window was affected by the sun beating down on the side of the van. The goal of this second test was to see how the lizards can prevent heat gain when the body panels were exposed to direct sunlight. Now let's see our results. So this is basically the first frame of the first test right after we had pulled the van out into the cold from our 65 degree shop. Now you can see I have two points here. I have point one and point two, and they're both registering this one's 72, this one's 70, the front of the van is 68. So they're all pretty close. And this one's registering a little hotter because you can see my face in the side of it. <laughs> <laughs> so we go a few frames uh, to the right and it gets out of the way. Okay, now, now we're sitting at 68 up front and 70 degree, 70.7 and then 70.7 on left and right side. So remember half of the van is sprayed so this is focusing up on the ceiling and the passenger side of the van is what's sprayed. So this wall and the right side of the ceiling. So there's no difference left to right because it had been sitting in the garage all night. So those temperatures had equalized left to right. There's a difference up front because our garage door is kind of leaky and cold. And so there's a little bit, that's just like one degree uh, or two degrees. Uh, difference up there on the front of the van where it was just a little colder um, up there by the uh, windshield. So let's keep on scrolling to the right and see how things change. So we're scrolling to the right, scrolling to the right, and we can already see after just three minutes, about four minutes, of the colors are starting to change. Now point one and point two is sitting at 68.0 and 68.1. So is there a difference? Yeah, but not really, not much of one. <laughs> um, so we're gonna keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And so the bright, the brightness right there, that was just us turning on some lights so we could actually see. So that won't, those were just LED lights that we had outside of the van, so they shouldn't affect uh, temperature at all. It just makes things a little brighter. 
So we are four and a half minutes in. We're at 65.3, 65.1. You can definitely see where the warmer side of the van versus the colder side of the van is. This side is losing a little bit of heat because it's 20 degrees outside. Um, but we're still in this range right down here, which that's only the difference of like a degree or so, 65.1 versus 65.3 in those two spots. Uh, I think the difference is a little more noticeable down here, so I wish I had those two points down here, but ultimately it's still probably, I mean. No more than a degree. Yeah, uh, probably not much at all. So we'll just keep scrolling. We'll scroll a little faster through this, and you can kind of see the, temp the colors changing. Now, the reason this over here is staying so warm is because this is the part of the van that was not in contact with the outside uh, environment. Um, all the body panels are effectively glued to the body ribs, and so there's a thermal break there, so these are actually staying nice and warm, uh, just like they are on basically the same temperature as the inside of the garage. We're still seeing temperature change there, but not enough to really warrant anything. So as we keep going, we can kind of see that the temperatures are starting to normalize across the left and right side. And then by, oh, let's call it like 45 minutes in, things are pretty much the same all the way across, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Pretty. 38.2 and 38.1 degree. Yeah, 38.2, 38.1. So a little bit of difference here, but still not very much difference, right? right. Okay, so that was Test number one. Uh, we're gonna go on to test number two now and share those results. And then we'll kind of circle back and kind of like share our thoughts about like what all this means to us personally yeah. here in a minute. So test number two was whenever we pulled the van um, out into the sun. So we went from a cold van to pulling the van out into the direct sunlight in the spot where we sprayed the side body panel, but we did not spray this section of this side body panel because a window is going to end up going there. Now this was a, within like probably like two minutes or so of actually moving the van out into the sun. So this happened really, really fast. And so right there, we're seeing temperatures of 64.2 and 55.8. So that's already nearly 10 degrees of difference from the point where we did not spray the ceramic insulation to the point where we did spray the ceramic insulation right down here. And just to clarify there, you did spray the sound deadening on that part, correct? Correct. There is sound deadening all over this entire panel at the same depth. So it's equal uh, across this entire thing on the sound deadening, but the ceramic insulation, we just I just sprayed like a probably a three inch section up here at the top. Um, most of this panel or all of this panel all of the bottom part of this panel, all the bottom part of this panel, all the bottom part of here, all of this here. So Great. that white that you're seeing there um, is where it's not sprayed. So as we kind of like keep scrolling uh, through this whole test, it's kind of hard to see because it's white on yellow, but I'll try to attempt to narrate what's going on there. So we've got 78.2 there and then 90.1 there. So that's a matter of, uh, or a difference of 12 degrees, like just shy of 12 degrees. Yep. And is that, is that four minutes into the test? Uh, that is, yep, just shy of four minutes into wow, the test. that's Three. quite the difference. Yeah, so 12, uh, so this is our, this, this body panel here is up to, yeah, 90 degrees in four minutes. Now, interestingly enough, this thermal imaging camera, it picks up the hottest and the coldest spots on the entire screen. And so right up here, 94.9, there's a little spot that I did not spray up here. It's just kind of an awkward nook and cranny to get up into. And so I missed that. But the thermal imaging camera is like showing me that I missed that. So that was something I actually ended up going back and hitting after whenever I did the other side of the van. But it's pretty cool to see that that's up to 94.9 degrees. This part right in here, uh, is at 90.1, which there's sound deadening on this. There's probably not sound deadening up there. So like maybe that had a little bit to do with that as well. So I know it's not, sound deadening isn't designed, you know, for thermal, you know, um, insulation, insulation yeah. but I guess maybe it had a little bit to do with it. And then 78 down there. So that's a pretty big difference from 94 to 78 right there. Uh, so at five minutes in, this point down here is 81.6 right down here. And then this is 92.5. 
And so we're at it's oh, 11 degrees, 11 yeah. degrees. And as we go to the six minute mark, that is 83.9 and 93.2. So where are you at on your quick math there? Uh, Just shy of 10 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. So nine and a little bit. So the difference between there and there is going, you know, is decreasing a little bit as this whole th panel heats up a little bit, but uh, there's still a big difference. Um, and then as we kind of get to the very end of the frame, 84.9 and 93.7. So nine degrees. Yeah, yeah, so nine degrees there. And that's uh, pretty much where we saw things uh, not change anymore. Like the temperatures kind of like just hung out around uh, those levels until, you know, we let this run for another few minutes and nothing really happened with them. So that's, it was, that's, I mean, I feel like this is a pretty big part of the test. And interestingly enough, the hot point that was up here, it actually moved to right there, uh, which is kind of in between that body panel and the support rib. There's kind of a void there. And that is where the hot point kind of like moved to as this test moved on, which is 100 degrees, 100 degrees exactly. And so that's really cool. And it kind of goes to show that it's like, there's definitely a spot in there that it's like really hot. Uh, and then the th and then the lizard skin sound deadening decreases it a little bit, and then the ceramic decreases it by yeah you know, nine to twelve uh, degrees pretty consistently across the board. So um, that's pretty much what we've got. That's the that's the results of this. Is there anything that you saw in this test that I kind of missed, or that you want me to go back to? No, I don't think so. Cool. So let's go ahead and get away from this uh, this screen here. And we're gonna talk about some of our just like final thoughts of this project, um, the product in general, uh, how this product compared to like the sound deadening and stuff like that. And any kind of like wrap up thoughts and frequently asked questions that we got from some of the previous videos. So first question, did it work? I think that it worked on the cold to hot test. So whenever it went from uh, pulling the van from the cold into the sun, I think that absolutely worked. Um, you know, 12 degrees of difference is a big difference. Uh, you know, the difference between 100 degrees and 88 degrees is pretty significant. Yeah. Um, did it work on preventing heat loss when we pulled it out in the cold? Not really. Like, may, I mean, a degree? Two degrees at most. Not um, significant enough. I don't think it was significant significant enough to say that that worked. How big of a difference do you think that it made? You know, I mean, 12 degrees of difference on that one specific body panel. I wish that we could have sprayed an entire van with the stuff and then had another van that was totally not sprayed. Um, but we don't have that. But So I think that the test that we did do showed enough results um, that it uh, did make a difference. And there's some other tests that have been done on YouTube. Uh, stuff as simple as like being able to put your hand up on the uncoated metal versus the coated metal. And sometimes you can't even touch the uncoated metal. So that's kind of a good test that you don't even have to have a thermal camera for. And then there's another test that I'll link to in the video description below. A guy was making a hot rod that he put the uh, body tubs of his hot rod out in the sun, half coated with the ceramic insulation, half uncoated and he uh, logged the data points uh, with a computer. Go check that video out, because that one's pretty cool too. But ultimately, uh, I think it did make a big enough difference to matter. So what was the difference between lizard skin and spray foam insulation? Why would you have chosen one over the other? So lizard skin only gets sprayed on uh, 40 mils thick, which is really, really thin, just a couple millimeters thick. And spray foam is gonna be, you know, an inch thick, two inches thick, three inches thick maybe. But the thing with spray foam insulation is whenever you spray that onto a van, there's been too many times that I've seen uh, whenever it cures, it shrinks and expands and it grabs the body panels and it warps the exterior body panels. Now, if you've got, you know, an 85 Chevy Astro van that you've, that you got from your grandpa for $5, you know, maybe that's a great solution for that. But if you're paying, you know, a fair amount of money for some of these vans, you know, it wasn't worth the risk to me personally uh, to to do that for us. And also, 
I do. I wouldn't feel comfortable recommending uh, doing the spray foam when there's a pretty big chance that you know it could potentially warp body panels for you guys watching. So the next point that some people brought up in our last video was condensation. Uh, so I want to hear your thoughts on like if you think this is going to do good for condensation, even though this is that's not what this is designed for. Yeah, it's it's not what it's designed for, but I definitely think that this is going to help with condensation. Um, the fact that we are able to just get a full coverage on the on the metal and there's no there's really no exposed metal um, in the van anywhere that's going to help us um, that's going to help the condensation issue and I'm, I'm really excited to see how it handles in cold weather and if we get that condensation buildup that we had problems with in our sprinter. So several of you asked whether or not this would be our last bit of insulation or if we're adding something in addition to the lizard skin. So we're definitely going to be adding more insulation on the top of this. Um, this isn't made to be, you know, the only insulation that you use. It's meant to be one step of the process. So the best way I could um, kind of explain it is, you know, if you go outside, you've got the outer shell of your jacket. It's going to repel some of the wind and rain, uh, but it's not actually going to keep you warm. You've got another layer of thin slit or um, fleece or wool or something like that underneath that outer layer that's actually keeping you warm. So it's kind of the same concept. Uh, the ceramic insulation is going to drop the heat that's coming into the van by 12 degrees like we saw on the testing. And then the additional insulation, whether that's 3M Thinslet, Havelock wool, or polyiso foam, or whatever you choose to use, is going to do the rest of the job. So what are your final thoughts on the overall um, process and the overall um, feasibility of using this, this product? So I think with the sound control, it's just really labor intensive. I'm really glad that we did it so that I know it's something I've been wanting to try for a few years at this point. And so it's fun to be able to try something new. Um, but ultimately it was a lot of work and, you know, something that's peel and stick, that's also going to work pretty good too. Something that we're both you and I could sit down and do the project, mm -hmm. drink some beers and listen to some good music. It's like, there's something to be said for how much fun you have during the project. The ceramic insulation, uh, there's not really another product that does that, not a steel, a, a steel and pick, <laughs> a, a peel and stick product that does that. And so I think that that one was probably worth doing that. Yeah. So. And that being said, this is really intended to be a two-step product where you do use the sound deadening first and then the ceramic insulation. So I think that if you are going to go the route of the cer ceramic insulation, it does make sense to do the, the um, sound deadening first rather than the peel and stick. Yeah, I think so too. So we just got our shipment of windows in. This is box one of three. So we're gonna start unboxing it. Hardware kit and the window. So we got the window out of the box, put this little piece of cardboard underneath the window uh, so it doesn't scratch up the outside of the window. It does have some protected plastic on it, so shouldn't be too big of an issue there. But there are three parts to this window. There is the outer sash that has the blinds in it, and then there's a outer and inner frame to it. The outer and inner frame are screwed together for shipping, but for installation, we need them to not be screwed together. Uh, so we are going to unscrew all of these. Uh, if you're missing any of these screws, be sure to check inside of the shipping box because there's a chance they could have fallen out in there. And we're just going to take these screws and put them in a bag for safekeeping for later. So now that we have our inner frame for the window, we need to make the template so we can cut the hole in the side of the van. Now to do that, we're going to basically transcribe the frame size onto the cardboard here. Uh, we're going to use the box that the window came in, but super, super important to inspect for damage and report to sender within 14 days, because if there's something wrong with the window and you've just cut a big hole in the box, ultimately uh, you can't use the box to send it back. Cool. Pretty well taken. So when we're tracing this, we have this outer actual perimeter of the frame here, and we're not tracing that. We're tracing this inner flange right here. Now I found it pretty easy to use a, a mechanical pencil like that to just get in there nice and tight against that inner flange. 
to get as accurate as possible. So we're going to cut out along this line. Stephanie's going to do that because this is a detail-oriented project. It's kind of her strong suit. It's pretty important to cut on the inside of the line that we just drew because then we can drop this into our template and we can double check. And if it doesn't quite fit in there, then we can trim out as necessary. It's always easier to take away material than it is to add material. So Steph's going to get started on cutting. Hey, Future Nate here. Whenever we did to Windows 2 and 3 on this side of the van, we actually used these sat-saying window spacers, which we'll talk about later in this video, as templates for drawing on the side of the van. And it worked pretty good, so consider that. So before we do any cutting or drilling on the, uh, the side of the van where the window is going to be, I'm gonna go ahead and put a whole bunch of tape on the side of the van, as well as like some trash bag, just plastic right down below, so we don't get any kind of hot metal from cutting the van onto this so we can prevent any kind of rusting. So we have taped off the outside and moved into the inside of the van and we're going to start figuring out exactly where we need the window. So turn overland instructions. The cut hole needs to be an inch and a half from the top support structures, inch and a half from the bottom support structures, and three inches from the front and rear support structures. There's a few other critical measurements that don't really apply to our particular thing right here, but Read through that if you're trying to mirror this. But the inch and a half at the bottom doesn't really matter because we are going to be putting this up as high as we possibly can. So we are going to be riding right up along that inch and a half. Steph and I are going to put a mark at an inch and five eighths from the top. And then we're going to take this ruler here that we're using as a straight edge and then draw our line. Now we're doing an inch and five eighths as opposed to an inch and a half because the side of this pencil and the lead is an, in, is, is an eighth of an inch apart. And so by the time I hold this up here at an inch and five eighths and slide the pencil across the top of the straight edge, it's gonna be exactly an inch and a half. So that's the plan as of now. We're going to do that and come right back. So I'm going to take my ruler and we're gonna draw a line across the top of the support ribs here. And then measure straight down an inch and five eighths and put another mark. And so now we're going to take this pencil and hold it flat on the top of this ruler that we're using as a straight edge. So now that we have our line drawn a inch and a half from this support rib, we're going to take a measurement all the way across so we can find the center point of this entire panel. The next step we're going to do is we are going to start making holes in the side of this van uh, and we're going to drill us or I'm going to use a screw to go all the way through the body panel right here. And then another screw to go through right about here. Right here. All on this line. So this is going to be the top of our cut line here. And then we're just going to take the template that Stephanie cut out earlier. Uh, we did put a mark at the center of the template, and so that's just going to hang right on the center screw up top and hang from the other two screws off to the side. And so this is nice and flush with the body panel on the inside of the van. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to put a few pieces of tape on the cardboard template to keep it from sliding around, and then we're going to trace the outline. I'm going to be cutting just on the outside of this line and maybe even just a sixteenth of an inch uh, outside of the line. That way it's not so tight that we can't get the window in because you know I was drawing on the inside of the template, um, but it's not gonna be so big that it's gonna cause us issues and being too sloppy of a fit. So actual last step before we uh, get cutting because I just thought of it. Uh, I'm gonna put these pieces of duct tape up here as well, just like so. So that we have a, um, a way to kind of grab this piece of metal as it falls out. I don't think I've seen anybody do this yet, but I just thought of it. So we're gonna try it, see if it works. We just needed a little bit more space right here, so we're just gonna go over it with a metal file. 
So making the hole a little bit bigger with the metal file does indeed work, but it does take a long time. So it may be worth using the jigsaw again for a second pass if the hole needs to be quite a bit bigger. So now that we have the hole cut for the window and everything is fitting nice and neat, uh, we need to actually trim away a little bit of all of these support ribs, probably about an inch and a half or so, because the turnoverland windows, they're not designed to go right on the sheet metal alone without any kind of extra support. So we need to have a little bit of extra substance here. And so we could have either made a spacer out of hardwood, like one inch hardwood, or some like one inch square tubing. But Satsang makes a prefab uh, ring that fits really nicely over that so that the windows have a little bit more to grab onto. And so this is how we got it from them. So it's already cut to fit the windows exactly. So this is the inner trim ring, and I'm gonna get these trimmed away to fit this. Hey, Future Nate here with another tip. On this side, we cut the hole first, and then we cut the supports away. On this side, we cut the supports away first, and then we cut the hole. And I actually think that ended up being easier because we weren't having to cut the body panel as well as the supports at the same time. So it was pretty easy. So consider that. So now that our hole is cut to size, um, we're going to knock off any of the sharp parts of the metal that are still around. So I'm going to use a deburring tool, just a little blade that's made to cut off little sharp pieces of metal, as well as this metal file that we used to actually enlarge the hole just a little bit earlier. And then after we get done with that, I'm going to use just Rust-Oleum paint to make sure to seal any of the edges so that they don't rust. So while the paint is drying, let's talk about the different screws that come with the turnoverland windows. So in the hardware pack, we've got uh, the short screws, short 14 millimeter screws, and the screws that we took out of the windows when we pulled them out of the box are longer 20 millimeter screws. Now, the screws that you use are going to be based on the thickness of the wall that you're installing the windows into. And since we can't install these windows into basically just a sheet metal frame, we have to use a spacer. Now, this spacer from Satsang is 30, uh, 36 millimeters, plus a little bit for the actual like metal uh, body of the van. Uh, it comes out to about 40 millimeters. So take your own measurements if you're trying to mirror this project, but that's where ours ended up. And once you find that number, you can look on page three of the instructions and find out 40 millimeters is requiring the longer 20 millimeter screw. So we are going to be using the longer 20 millimeter screws that we pulled out of this from the shipping box whenever we go to install this in just a second. Now for the next step, we need to fasten this to the van. So we are just going to use VHB tape on the trim ring and then clamp the trim ring into place on the van. Future Nate here with the last tip of the video. So on Windows 2 and 3, we actually used a Turn Overland approved polyurethane adhesive from the instruction manual to secure the spacer to the wall. Now, it worked better than the VHB tape, but it was way messier. So consider all of that. Now that we have the tape on the back side of this trim ring, we're going to move it up into place here. Try to line it up the best we can. And then put some clamps on it to pull the metal to the trim ring. And once the spacer was nice and secure, we removed the clamps and removed the tape. So Stephanie has got the window put into the van from the outside, and now we need to put in the inner frame ring of the window from the inside. So these two little hooks on the top, uh, these need to be on the up side of the frame uh, because this is where the like the window sash and the, uh, the blinds actually attach to, which we'll show that here in a little bit. But we just go around the outside of this frame ring with our long screws. Uh, with a screwdriver, not a power drill, and get them started. Uh, we need to do this in a cross pattern. So we're gonna do these two first, and this one, and this one, and this one, this one, this one. So you're just working your way kind of diagonally across the frame, similar to how you would tighten lug nuts on a wheel. Before you put any of the screws into the holes, uh, we're going to put this 
anti-seize onto the uh, screw threads before they actually go in the holes so they won't rust up and get stuck. So sometimes the measurement of the trim ring and the wall is on a borderline between the short and long screws. So you can always start with one or the other, try the short ones and see if they'll grab a hold. Uh, or if you do the long ones and you start screwing it in there um, and you feel any kind of resistance, stop. You know, you don't want to go too deep. You don't want to bottom these screws out. We're just looking for uh, 50 to 75% compression, which is something that we'll show in just a second. So I'm going to keep making my way around here, and put these screws in. So in order for this to be fully installed and waterproof, the gasket needs to be 50 to 75% compressed from where it was when we just placed the window into the hole. So we just take a measurement with a ruler before we ever start tightening anything down. We tighten everything down and we take a measurement again to check to see that the gasket has been compressed to 50 to 75% of the original measurement. So now that the window is all installed, uh, let me show you how it works. So we can undo all of these latches around the side of the window. And then it opens to the first position or the second position. Or we can close it most of the way and latch it in this position here. Or we can just close it entirely. So this is the sash with the uh, blinds inside of it. And this little ridge right here mounts on top of this hook and this hook. So I'm just going to set that right on top and line everything up. So now that the sash is mounted to the actual window, uh, we have our two blinds right here. So we have our standard blind uh, for pretty much blackout curtains right there, as well as the bug screen at the bottom. So these two just kind of latch together, which I'm going to do right now because we would want to fasten the sash to the uh, spacer right here. So we're just going to snap this up and out of the way. Same thing on the bottom. And there are four screw holes right here. One, two, three, and four. And we would simply just be using the screws that came with the hardware kit to put these screws into those four holes to mount this to the spacer right here. But we are not going to do that right now because this is actually going to get mounted to the front of the wall once we get to that part of the build. We have these window jams right here that are going to mount to the spacer. And then this is going to close the distance between the spacer and the wall. These are also from Satsang, all part of the same, uh, the same kit that I mentioned earlier. But we are going to take this off, get it out of the way so we can continue on with the other two windows and on with the rest of the build. Here's a list of parts that you're going to need for this project. USB outlets, some spade connectors, two conductor and three conductor lever nuts, some wire, a source of power, and some assorted electrical tools like we've talked about in some previous videos. This video is based on the diagrams found in the Explorer Slive 12 volt branch circuit guidebook. We have also assembled a USB outlet wiring kit with all of the exact parts that we used in this video, as well as a few alternative sizes, which can be found at shop.explorus.life. So before we get into the van, I wanted to do a tabletop demonstration showing you how to connect the batteries to the, uh, to the fuse block to the end circuit. We've already got the fuse block here it's connected to the battery bank so pause the battery terminals to the positive terminal of the fuse block there as well as negative battery terminal to the 
negative bus bar of the fuse block here. And then fuses would go on this side. We don't have any fuses in here, so we actually don't have any power flowing to this side of the fuse block. These are our three USB outlets. Pretty straightforward, simple USB outlet. Uh, there are no lights on this, uh, so this will not light up whenever we uh, when we get this all connected. We did not want lights in here because when we're trying to charge our phone at night or something like that, we just didn't want the obnoxious lights. But if you want lights and all the other fancy features of other USB outlets, the wiring is going to be pretty much the same. There's a positive and negative terminal on the back side of each of these USB outlets that we connect with a spade connector. And that's kind of the anatomy of this circuit. So let's start wiring. So to get started, we just need a little bit of wire bit of red and black. For this demonstration, I'm using 16 gauge wire, but the size of wire will depend on how many outlets that you have in your particular circuit, as well as how long the circuit ends up being start to finish. So first thing, we're going to strip back a bit of the insulation off of each of these wires. The positive wire here will go into one of the positive terminals on the back of the fuse block. And the negative wire will go into one of the terminals on the negative bus bar. Remember, we don't have any fuses in this, so we don't have any power at the ends of these two wires. But if you get nervous on this during your install, disconnect from battery. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to strip the insulation off of this end of the wires. So the next thing we're going to do is start connecting our lever nuts. So we're going to be using lever nuts for this particular project and pretty much all of the branch circuit projects going forward. We're using these instead of your typical wire nut, which you'll find at Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that, because over time these will jiggle and they'll loosen as we're driving down the road and when wires get loose they cause resistance and cause things to stop working and could potentially heat up enough to cause a fire. So we are not using these. We are using these lever nuts. So lever nuts are similar in the fact that they join wires together. This one's a three conductor wire nut or lever nut. And these levers just snap up. We're gonna put the wire in and then snap those back down. And it holds the wires in place and there's pretty much no chance of them wiggling free. So that's how these work. Now we're going to connect them. So those are the lever nuts on the wires. We can see that they are nice and secure all the way from the back and there's no insulation under the metal bar in the very back. So the next thing we want to do is connect the lever nut to these. So to connect these lever nuts to the USB outlets, we need two more pieces of really small wire, or two short pieces of wire, I should say, and strip the ends off of these. And then we're going to crimp a spade connector onto the end of each of these.
And then we can go ahead and heat shrink these down because uh, the plastic on these particular spade connectors are just heat shrink. And now we have the spade connectors on the end of the wire here, this heat shrink uh, spade connector. The ends really get small here. Uh, so you kind of have to be persistent when pushing this over the end of the terminal for the USB uh, connector here. Um, but just be persistent and if you need to, you can always kind of shave that back with a knife if you can't get that through. Just like so. Now, these other little pigtails here, they go into our liver nuts. Slide that into place and then cl clamp the lever nut down. Same thing on the negative one. Flip the lever up, put the wire in, clamp it down. And then visually inspect the back side of each of the lever nuts to make sure that there's no insulation getting in between the wire and the metal on the back of each of the lever nuts. Lift this up here so you can see that. Okay, and that is one USB outlet completely connected. Now I did use three conductor lever nuts here, but they also make two conductor lever nuts that we would probably use if we were just doing one USB outlet, but I wanted to continue on and show you how to wire multiple USB outlets onto the same circuit. So this is all you're doing. You could use two here, but ultimately leaving one blank isn't a big deal and is totally fine. You could leave that as is. So I'm going to go ahead and test this to make sure that this works before moving on. So I'm going to put my fuse back into the first position here of the fuse block. open up the cover, and then get something that can be powered by USB, and then plug it in. Cool, see we're charging there. We'll test the other port on here as well. And that one is also charging. So we have power to this USB outlet. So I'm gonna put this aside, and then we are going to Continuing down the circuit, and I'm going to add two more USB outlets just so you can see how a multi-USB outlet circuit looks. So to get these next two USB outlets wired up, we need to make the little short pigtail connectors that we've got here with the spade connector on one end for each of the USB outlets. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. So now that we have these four pigtails all made, uh, we're going to connect them up in the exact same fashion that we did this first one to the remaining USB outlets. Positive to positive, negative to negative, positive to positive, negative to negative, and then that is that. And now we can connect these lever nuts to these lever nuts to these other outlets over here. And I've already made the jumper wires that go from one outlet to the next outlet, just red and black wire with the ends already stripped off. And here's how to connect it all together. Since we are working with this again, I'm going to go ahead and remove this fuse. So we don't have any live power. We're going to connect the red wire into this first red lever nut. Black wire 
do the first lever nut. Red wire to the next lever nut down the line. Black lever nut to the next lever nut down the line. Go ahead and put our jumpers for the last one on. Red wire to the last connector in this lever nut. And then black, connect, black wire to the lever nut over here. And then finally, I've got a two conductor lever nut right here that will connect both red and black too. Give all of these a visual, visual check to make sure they're nice, and tight, and well connected. Looking for making sure there's no insulation in between that metal bar and the wire. And all looks good to go there. So we'll take the second lever nuts in the circuit and connect the black wire of our USB outlet to the middle connector there. And the red wire to the middle connector of this lever nut. And then same on the last lever nut of, this, of the circuit. Black, black here, and red here. Visual check, and all secure. So here's how the circuit looks. So we have red and black coming off to red and black lever nuts, if you will, to positive and negative of the backside of the first USB outlet, positive and negative wires to positive and negative lever nuts to positive and negative conductors of the backside of the second USB connector. And then finally, positive and negative wires to positive and negative lever nuts to the positive and negative terminals of the final USB outlet. So that is all good. We can now put the fuse back in. So fuse is back in place. Now we should have power to all of this and we're going to double check all the different USB outlets just to make sure the same as we did before. We'll check the first one again to make sure nothing happened in between now and the last time I tried it. And we have charging on both ports. Second outlet charging on both ports. I heard that one beep, so it's good to go. And lastly, charging there. And charging on the third one. So that is how you would wire three different USB outlets into the same circuit. Now you can add pretty much as many, many outlets as you want to into the circuit. It's very much like in your house, let's say around your bedroom, you've got multiple different outlets around the outside of your bedroom, uh, but all of those outlets are on the same circuit. So we are only pulling a, a certain amount of current for the entire circuit, and that's what all of this wire and the fuse in here is sized for, but there's going to be more information about that in the video description below. Now that the tabletop demonstration is all wrapped up, we're going to move into the van and actually wire everything together and then circle back around and then show you how this looks like in the van where it's a little harder to see.
We just finished wiring the van and sometimes it's just easier to do it and then show a flow of power. So we're going to get started on that. So the fuse block will actually end up living right up here, but for the sake of demonstration, I uh, got this uh, battle worn battery and a step stool and just a temporary fab up of this uh, fuse block, but ultimately it's going to be up here. So this is where all of our wires are starting. So they are running through this wire loom down through this cavity here inside of this cavity and out this direction. So we have two different circuits. One is going to be the driver side USB outlets and the other one's going to be the passenger side USB outlets. The driver side ones comes down to right here. It's connected with the lever nuts. So all positives together and all negatives together with the spade connector on the back of the USB outlet. From the first USB outlet over here, positive and negative wires coming over to the second USB outlet, which is going to ultimately live about right here. We do have quite a bit of extra slack here. I would much rather take these wires out and trim them up and then restrip them and put them back into lever nuts. If we decide that we don't need near this much wire, it's always easier to cut wire off than it is to add it. This is the driver's side circuit. For the passenger side circuit, it's starting up here and going through the same cavity up here. And I'll let Steph show where that is running currently. This circuit is coming out this cavity here and we've got it routing around the door coming down here. And then similar to the driver's side, we'll just have one USB outlet here and that will live on this side of the window and the other outlet coming around here, routing to this side of the window. And this outlet will live right here. So one thing about the wire routing uh, that we've got going on here, all these wires are gonna be as close into the corners as they possibly can, because they're gonna be covered up by the walls. But the interesting part about right here that we found is there's this nice little contour that whenever we put the walls on top of the van ribs right there, uh, it's a great spot for the wires to come through. So this contour right here also lines up with this hole. So if you know if you're taking on this project yourself, uh, you could probably use that for something. So that's what the plan is here to kind of keep this nice and neat. But you know, as this series progresses, uh, you're gonna see all this get cleaned up a lot more. So the next thing we need to do is actually test these outlets. To test these outlets, we're just going to plug in a phone to each of these USB outlets. That one works. That one works. That one works. And lastly, that one also works. All of those work, so we are good to go. Here's a list of parts that you're gonna need for this project. Some 12 volt outlets, some spade connectors, two conductor and three conductor lever nuts, some wire, a source of power, and some assorted electrical tools like we've talked about in some previous videos. This video is based on the diagrams found in the Explorer Slive 12 volt branch circuit guidebook. We've also assembled a 12 volt outlet wiring kit with all the exact parts that we used in this video, as well as a few alternative sizes, which can be found at shop.explorus.life. So let's talk about how we are going to wire these 12 volt outlets that we have here to our fuse block that is already connected to our battery bank. So we have our battery bank, which is effectively just one battle born battery for the tabletop demonstration here connected positive terminal to the positive terminal of the fuse block, negative terminal to the negative bus bar of the fuse block. And there are no fuses in the front side of the fuse block, so there is no power to any of these positive terminals on this side. For our 12 volt outlets that we have here, just pretty typical 12 volt outlet with a positive and negative con uh, connector on the back side of that, that we will be connecting to. And we have three uh, that we're going to be connecting all three of these. So you can see how a multi outlet uh, circuit looks, but we're just going to start off with doing just one. So let's get started with that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cut off a bit of wire 
where we'd be cutting off enough wire to get from the fuse block to the uh, first, U first 12 volt outlet, which in this tabletop demonstration is only about a foot. But in a van, it would be significantly longer. Cut those, get those out of the way. And then we're gonna strip about a quarter to a half inch of insulation off of each of these wires. So we're gonna take these two wires that we just cut and we're going to connect them to the back of the fuse block here. So I'm gonna take my negative wire and connect it to my negative bus bar. And then my positive wire to the positive terminal on the side of the fuse block here. Now remember we have taken the fuse out of the front so there's no power to any of this on this side here. But if you're nervous about what is and is not powered, you can always disconnect it from the battery as well. Okay, so now that we have the positive and negative wires coming off of the fuse block, I wanna make a special mention that this wire, if we were doing it permanently, we'd probably want this wire to go on the inside here so that everything lines up nice and neat down this channel. But for tabletop demonstration purposes, uh, I'm putting it over here so it's just easier to see. Also, you can use ferrules, but I'm not using ferrules on any of these because whenever we move into the van and we start using 10 gauge wire on some of this stuff, 10 gauge wire does fit in these terminals, but not when you use a ferrule. So uh, I'm not using a ferrule because a ferrule is ultimately a tool and not a requirement and it doesn't make our life easier in this case. The next thing to do is connect our lever nuts to the wires that we just connected to the fuse block as well as the back of the 12 volt outlet here. Now we're going to use lever nuts here. Uh, so quick intro about lever nuts. We talked about them last week, but maybe you're new to the channel uh, and first off, welcome. But we're using lever nuts instead of wire nuts here because these have a tendency to loosen as we drive down the road and everything like that. You know, these are typical in a house, but houses aren't vibrating down the road. And so we're not going to use these as these have a tendency to loosen cause issues and potentially heat up. So we'll throw those away. And we're using these lever nuts and these two that I have here, we've got some two conductor lever nuts and some three conductor lever nuts. And the only difference there is how many wires they can hold. And how these work is these little levers on the top, they flip up and out of the way. And I can put the wires inside there, flip the levers back down to lock the wires in place. And then all the wires are connected electrically through that little bar in the back right there. So since this is just going to be connecting this wire to the wires that are going to the outlet here, I'm going to use the two conductor lever nut. Put both of those up, put the wire in place, put the lever back down. Same thing on the black wire, flip the lever up, Put the wire in place, flip the lever down, and then we can look on the back side of these to visually inspect to make sure that there is no insulation between the actual wire and the little bus bar that's inside of the lever nut. And all looks good there. Now to connect the lever nut to the back of the 12 volt outlet, we need a little small jumper wire to go from spade connector to the lever nut. So I'm going to make that right now. I'm going to get some of this wire and cut off a short section. Two to three inches should be fine. Strip the insulation off of each end. And then I'm going to connect a spade connector right here onto these two little wires I just made so that we can connect the spade connectors to these terminals here. Put the wire in the spade connector, crimp it down. Same on the black one, cramp it down. And then these are heat shrink uh, speed connectors. So we're going to use our heat gun to shrink the heat shrink down around the speed connector. Now we have these little short jumper wires made with the spade connectors on the ends. And then we can just push those onto the positive and negative 
uh, connectors here on the back of the 12 volt outlet. Let's see if we can get a shine on there so you can see the positive one and the negative. And that is pretty much on every 12 volt outlet. So positive to red, negative to black. And then we just connect these to our lever nuts. So connect black to the, I'm sorry, the red to the, uh, the positive lever nut there. And the black to the negative lever nut here. Give that a visual inspection on the back. Make sure that there's no insulation between the wire and the bus bar in the back. That should be good there. Nice tug, everything seems nice and tight. So we should have power to here uh, as soon as we put the fuse back in place. So I'm just gonna put that fuse back in place. And now we just want to test it. So we've got a, uh, just a drone battery here and there's a little spot on this charger right up here where that'll light up uh, if we have power. So keep your eye on that, Let's see if it works. That light just came on, so we have power to this charger. And then our drone battery is gonna start charging in just a second. It usually takes a few minutes, so we're not gonna wait on it. All we need to know is that we have power to this charger from here. So this is how this would look if we were doing just a single 12 volt outlet in, uh, in the circuit. But we are actually going to be doing multiple 12 volt outlets in the same circuit so I'm gonna show you how to take this and wire it to the rest of these. So to wire up these other two outlets, uh, we need a few more pieces of wire. So we need the little pigtails uh, to go to both of those connectors there for both of them. And I went ahead and made those for the sake of um, sparing you some time, but I made those in the exact same way that I did that. So if you need to see how to make these, just uh, reverse the video a little bit. So uh, we also need the wires that go from this uh, outlet to this outlet and from this outlet to this outlet. And I went ahead and made those too, also for the sake of saving a bit of time here. So now that we have all these wires, let's go ahead and connect them together. Negative to negative, negative to negative, positive to positive, red to positive. So that got red to positive, black to negative, red to positive, black to negative. And then since we're going from the first outlet here to the second outlet here, we need another spot on this lever nut. So I'm gonna replace the two conductor lever nut with a three conductor lever nut for both of these. And something we just realized, uh, we didn't have an issue here, but we could have. Uh, so be careful with this. Be sure to take the fuse out when you're working on this because that's a uh, live power and we don't want to short anything out. So fuse is out. Don't be like me. And then we're going to make our next connections here. So we're going to do positive wire, red wire to the positive lever nut here. black wire to the negative lever nut here, just like that. And then on the next circuit down, we're gonna get another three conductor lever nut, black wire in it. Next one for the red wire. Okay, those are nice and secure. Now I can connect the next outlet to their respective spots on these lever nuts. Black and red respectively. And now we have two outlets in the series. So red from the, red from the positive uh, terminal of the fuse block, negative bus bar, positive and negative, positive and negative, positive and negative, and positive and negative here. And we'll test it here in a second, but we're just gonna connect up the last one real quick in the same manner that we just did that one. Red wire to the positive lever nut here. Just like so. So we've got 
a complete circuit now. So all of our red wires are connected to red terminals on all three of these circuits. And so now everything is nice and neat. We've visually inspected the backs of the lever nuts. All of our spade connectors are nice and tight. So now we can put our fuse back in and give it a test. Back with our drone battery here. Remember we're looking for the light, which is right there. Right there. Outlet number one. Green light comes on. Outlet number two. Green light comes on. And outlet number three. The green light comes on. So this circuit is now complete. And we have three outlets in this particular circuit, but you know, if you needed uh, two outlets or four outlets or 30 outlets, ultimately it can be wired in the same way. The wire size and the fuse size just needs to be sized as appropriate for the entire circuit amperage. So in your house, this is, this is very similar to like in your house, let's say in your bedroom, you've probably got an outlet uh, on each side of the bed, maybe on the other side of the wall and maybe on an adjacent wall. And all those outlets are probably on the same circuit and you can't load all of the outlets up to their max capacity, otherwise you'll blow the breaker for the entire bedroom. This is the same, the same thing. We're only gonna be pulling a max of 15 amps for this entire circuit, which this is what the wire size will be based on for the circuit, as well as the fuse size. Now that you kind of understand how this is all wired up on a tabletop demonstration, we're going to move into the van and get that wired up and then circle back around and show you how we did it. Now that this is all wired up, we want to show you kind of how it's wired up. So we have a 100 amp hour Battleborn lithium battery right down here for you know, kind of temporary demonstration purposes. That is wired to a fuse block right here. And fuse block will actually end up permanently living right up here. Uh, but for demonstration purposes, it's just how we've got it for now. These wires right here, they're connected to the back of the fuse block, will be connected to the back of the fuse block once it actually is permanently mounted up there. From there, it goes through this wire loom, the same wire loom that we wired our 12 volt USB outlets in in last week's video. Runs through this channel here, over here, over here, down through this wire loom, through this channel, right down here, out of the bottom of that pillar, and Steph's gonna talk about that down there. This wire run comes out the bottom and connects to the 12 volt outlet, and then once we go through that, I'm gonna test it as well. Now we have these connected to lever nuts here and then to a jumper to the spade connector on the back of the 12 volt outlet. You could really put these spade connectors directly to the back of the outlet and omit these lever nuts. However, we went ahead and did this because we're not exactly sure where this is going to end up, if it's gonna be on this side or this side or over here. And so we wanted to have that flexibility of just being able to take off that lever nut and move it around wherever we needed it to be. Let's go ahead and test this. Well, that sucks. <laughs> Fuse is in there. Uh, this, oh, <laughs> USB outlets. Um, okay, so <laughs> we'll actually power up the right circuit this time around. I think that'll make it work way better. <laughs> now that Nate has the correct wires wired up, let's try this again. This is actually the only 12 volt outlet that we currently have planned in the van. Um, we may add some more later, but for now we already have some USB outlets around the van and this one seems to be the only one that we are sure that we need. Um, so that is it, that wraps up this project.
Here's a list of parts that you're going to need for this project. Puck lights. A single pole, single throw switch. Some spade connectors. Two conductor and three conductor lever nuts. Some wire. A source of power and some assorted electrical tools like we've talked about in some previous videos. This video is based on the diagrams found in the Explorer's Life 12 volt branch circuit guidebook. And we have also assembled a puck light wiring kit with all of the exact parts that we used in this video, as well as a few alternative sizes, which can be found at shop.explorus.life. I have my tabletop demonstration set up here to show you how this circuit is actually going to look once we get it into the van, as well as kind of teach you how the lighting circuit actually works, as well as how a switch works. So on this tabletop here, we've got one battery that's got positive and negative wires coming to a fuse block. And this switch right here is off. And uh, so we don't have any power to anything down here. I also, go ahead, I also do have a fuse in position number one where the positive wire is connected and then the negative wire is connected to the negative bus bar right down here. So this is all kind of pre-connected and if you're not really sure how to connect all this stuff, you may check out two of the other videos that we put out right before this one as this video kind of builds on that one. I want to show you how the lighting circuit actually works at its most basic level. I have a puck light, just an LED puck light, with a positive and negative wire coming off the back. Now these are black and white, it's just what the manufacturer chose for these and the black is positive on this and we're using black as a negative coming off of this negative bus bar here which is typical in these systems so that's kind of confusing don't let that confuse you just pay attention to the label on the back of the light i'm going to take my lever nut here and a real quick refresher on lever nuts is these just pop up like so we can put our wires in there and then the wires are then effectively connected via this little bar in the back these are better than wire nuts because they won't loosen over time. Everything is locked in place and there was little chance of failure, resistance, heat, fire, all that stuff that we don't want. I can put the negative wire into one side. And the negative wire into the other side. Remember, remembering it's white on the back of this light. And then take another lever nut, put the positive wire from the fuse block into one side, and the positive wire from the light into the other side. And then visually inspect the back of this to make sure that each of these wires is in the back of the lever nut, nice and secure. A great thing about these lever nuts is this is a perfect solution for wiring different sizes of wire together in the same connector. Now this is essentially hooked up and I can go ahead and turn this switch on and our light came on. Turn the battery switch off, light goes off, battery switch on, light goes on. So ultimately this is now a fully functioning light, but you know, I think for most purposes, people are not going to want this light to be on 100% of the time. And so now we need to wire in a switch. And that's the next thing I'm going to do here. Here is the switch that we're using for this project and pretty much all of the other circuits in this, uh, in this build for the most part. Pretty simple switch here, just a simple on off switch. Power comes in, power goes out. We have a switch here, just goes back and forth. Now I wanna to talk to you about how a switch actually works. This is the switch that we are using in this project. So it goes on and off. Very similar to what I've drawn out here. I wanna show you how this switch works. So this is the power coming in and power going out. 
When the switch is in the on position, there is the piece of metal that comes down to connect the incoming contactor to the outgoing contactor. And whenever the switch is in the off position, incoming contactor, this piece of metal slides up out of the way and goes like this so that this is no longer connected to this and that's how this works. So effectively, the switch is just doing this to the light. It's just disconnecting it and then reconnecting it, disconnecting it, reconnecting it on the positive side. And now here's how we're going to wire the switch. I've made two little jumpers uh, with stripped ends on one side and spade connectors on the other side. I went ahead and pre-made those for the sake of time. If you don't know how to make these, uh, just check out the last two videos that we made. We made these a, a few dozen times. So check those out if you don't know how to make those. Those just go on the back side of the switch, like so. And then we can disconnect this wire from the fuse block. Put a lever nut on this side. Get a tug, make sure it's secure. Put it on this side of the switch, which is connected to the middle terminal of the switch, like so. Well, it's not middle, but on a lot of these switches, there are other uh, connectors up top, so it's in the middle most, the center most position of the switch there. And then for the positive light, the positive connector going to the light, just put that on the other side of the switch. Clamp that down. And then we have a light switch. In this circuit, the positive wire comes from the fuse block through the switch, other side of the switch to the light. And then the negative wire comes out this way, lever nut here and back to the negative bus bar. So the negative side in this system is not switched, only the positive wire. We're just breaking the positive wire connection here. The chances of us having a single light on a switch in our camper is, a, I mean, it's a possibility, but usually there's more than one light. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. We are going to need to introduce some three conductor lever nuts into the system. So one, two, and three, so that we can combine more of the positive wires into the same lever nut. And before we get working on the rest of the system, we're gonna go ahead and disconnect battery power by turning off this battery switch. I'm going to go ahead and just disconnect this light here since the chances of you having the light directly next to the switch are also pretty small. Move it down the way. And if you were actually wearing this, you probably want to put your light switch a little further away from the switch. So you're just going to connect an appropriately sized length of wire to these lever nuts here. Now these two wires here are ultimately only like eight inches long, but this is kind of simulating this switch on the wall and then the light being on the ceiling. So in real life, this would probably be closer to, you know, I don't know, five feet long or something like that. Now I'm going to grab two, three conductor lever nuts here. Get the positive on one side. and negative in the next lever nut. And then we can put the positive wire from the light, remembering that the positive is black on this particular light. Into that lever nut and the negative one which is white on this particular light, into the negative lever nut, and so effectively this would be on the wall and this would be up on the ceiling and we would have one light on the ceiling. Now what if you wanted to put another light next to it? Well we just keep on doing the same thing that we've been doing. We add another wire to this three conductor lever nut. A black wire to the 
negative three conductor lever nut. And then we can add more lever nuts to the ends of these two wires. We can put our next light in. Remembering that white is negative on these lights. And the blacks are positive on these lights. Now we have a nice string of lights. So we have positives to positives, positives to positives, negatives to negatives, negatives, positives to positives. So it should be good to go here. Go ahead and turn my master switch back on. Turn the switch on here. And both of these turned on. So good to go here. Now, if you wanted more lights in the same string, you just keep on going, really. You've got positive and negative wires here. You do positive and wired negative jumpers, positive and negative jumpers, and jumpers and jumpers on down the line, attaching lights all the way down the line, just like I've got pretty much on this little diagram here. So you can add pretty much as many lights like this as you want. Now, the other way I want to show you how to do lights is this way here. And this is a really good way to get pairs of lights going down the center of the van, which is actually what we will be doing in our sprinter over there. And I'm going to show you how that looks right now. So we've been working with the power off. We're going to go ahead and turn this right back on. See, we have lights. Go ahead and turn these off for explaining. We have positive and negative wires coming through our switch the exact same way as we did before. I did not change anything here. And then those are going through positive and negative wires to the first little, let's call it a little junction, if you will that would go off to our first pair of lights, okay? And then the positive and negative wires would go to our next junction, if you will, to our next pair of lights. The key takeaway here is to understand that all of the positives and all of the negatives are simply tied together, regardless of where they are in the system. At no point in time is a positive and a negative wire connected here. This is how this is actually going to look whenever we get it into the van, as we're going to have pairs of lights going down the length of the van. So we're going to go ahead and install all this stuff in the van in its proper spots, and then circle back around with all of you so that you can see how this is actually going to look and how it's actually wired when it's a little harder to see inside the van. Down here, we've got a single 100 amp hour Battleborn lithium battery that is just serving you know, as power for our testing purposes. The battery bank will be in the back, but ultimately for this, we're just putting it here for now. We've got positive and negative wires that are coming up to our temporarily, in, uh, temporarily installed fuse block that's right here. Uh, this will live in this general vicinity, actually mounted up properly, uh, but we just have a zip tied for temporary for now. Uh, positive and negative wires coming off of the back of the fuse block to the switch right here. Switches will live in a switch panel that'll be right here above the door. And that's where all of the switches for our inside lights will be. From our switch here, we have our positive and negative wires going off to all of our puck lights. And the uh, lights are indeed actually working, which is always good. Um, positive and negative coming up to this first pair of lever nuts. Two wires are going off to these lights that are up front. And then from these same lever nuts, we have positive and negative wires coming back to this cross member right here. And we've got these positive and negative wires running down this cross member. 
This part's a little confusing, but if you can imagine these just being broken up side to side, we're gonna have two lights right here and then two lights here in the back. So this first junction, uh, this first junction, if you will, of the lever nuts is feeding the forward two lights and the back one is feeding the back two lights. Just important to remember, all reds go to reds, all, all blacks go to blacks uh, in terms of these right here. And then be sure to account for positives and negatives on the actual uh, puck lights if they're a different color, which in our case they are. Now back at these pair of lever nuts here, we're going back to the back to this cross member here. Positive and negative lever nuts there. Two of them are coming from this side. Two of them are going down this cross member to our puck lights here. Positives to positives and negatives, negatives to negatives on both of those. And then back through the cross member, back to this junction to here, and then curving around to this back cross member back here. And this is the exact same as these forward ones right here. And then these are going to live right back here. So three other thoughts and considerations I wanted to talk about before we wrapped up this video. Uh, the first one is wire management. So we did leave a bit of slack on some of these wires um, that will get trimmed off eventually. You know, you want all this stuff to be nice and neat. And the great thing about these lever nuts is to trim off the wire. You're ultimately just disconnecting the lever nut, pulling the wire out, trimming the wire, restripping it, and then putting it back into the lever nuts. You're not having to recrimp or heat shrink, anything like that. So that's gonna take care of a lot of the slack that we have going on here, but we're not going to do that in this video. The next thing is wire loom. And a lot of these wires are going to be in wire loom, but we wanted to see where like the biggest majority of the wire loom is actually going to be before we started putting all this stuff in there. Because once you start putting stuff into wire loom, it kind of makes uh, splicing and making these cuts and wire management a little bit more difficult. So that might mean pulling some wires out and rerunning some wires around some stuff. And that's okay for the same reasons I just talked about with the lever nuts. The last thing is the way we wired these lights that are going to be in parallel just all the way down. And we put lever nuts on each light just to make it easier on ourselves. Because if we had done it the other way, like this, if we connected both of the lights to the same lever nuts here, then this would have been up inside of the ceiling and would have been pretty hard to get to to actually make the physical connections once we actually put the ceiling up. The way we wired these is just going to make our lives easier because we have to actually um, have these exposed through the holes that these lights are going to be installed in in the ceiling whenever we actually go to install the ceiling. So when the ceiling actually goes up, we'll have holes here that the puck lights are going to be installed in and these lever nuts are going to be sticking out of the holes. We can make these connections to the lever nuts from the puck lights really nice and easy through those holes and then stuff that wire back up inside of the holes and then these lever nuts just kind of clip right in place inside of the ceiling. Here's a list of parts that you're gonna need for this project. A 12 volt DC dimmer, two conductor and three conductor lever nuts, and a pre-existing lighting circuit. This video is based on the diagrams found in the Explorus Life 12 volt branch circuit guidebook. And if you're using the Explorus Life puck light wiring kit, the extra lever nut required is already included. We're just gonna pick up where we left off from last week with a fully completed lighting circuit here. So battery, positive and negative wires, fuse block, switch, light. Everything here we learned last week. We're going to turn the uh, switch on here. We have a fuse in there. And then we've got a completed lighting circuit. Now, ultimately, this light would be up in the ceiling, which is why I have left all of these wires here so long. But we are going to be focusing on this switch right here. And so I am going to drop the light off the side of the table so that we can focus on just what goes on here because it gets a little messy. This is the dimmer switch that we are going to be using in our build. And this is just pretty common dimmer on Amazon. Just turns 
forward and backwards to dim the lights. Now it has three wires on the back, red, black, and white. And all of these dimmers are going to come with instructions. And this particular set of instructions is pretty nice. The, part, the hard part about this is that the colors are quite confusing. You can see that the black is going to the is going to the uh, the battery ground, which is common, and then the red one is going to the light negative. Which red going to a negative wire? That's that's really confusing to me, and I have a hard time keeping that straight. Also, on the uh, the positive wire, we have the red wire here. So we have red wires on both positive and negative sides. So here, so we really just need to be able to interpret this diagram onto these wires here. So we went to town with a label maker and simply labeled what all these go to. So we have our light negative, our battery negative, and our positive wire here. This helps keep things straight for me. So if this helps you, feel free to copy. If you can keep it all straight in your head, that's fine too. Since we're about to disconnect some of these wires, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my main battery switch off here or otherwise disconnect power from the battery. To connect all of these wires, I'm just going to simply connect the positive wire, which is white on the back of this particular dimmer, into this lever nut here, like so. And now the switch has power. Next, I want to disconnect the negative wire that goes to the light from this lever nut that's installed by the switch. Set it over here for now. And we're going to connect the battery negative wire to the battery negative side of the circuit here that's going to the fuse block. And then the light negative is going to go to the negative wire that goes to the light. So that goes in the lever nut. as does this one. And that is the circuit. So double check everything that we've got here. So we've got positive going to positive, battery negative going to the negative fuse block, which is connected to battery negative, and then light negative there. So a little closer view of that looks like that. Now let's test it and see if it works. Bring our light back up here. Nope. Turn our battery switch on. Turn the light switch on. Our light comes on. So we've done something hopefully right. And now, So it is fading on and off. Let's kill the lights just a little bit to see how this works. And this should be a little easier to see. So there is a little weird flickering whenever it's like all the way down, but that's barely, barely on. Now this is a common problem I've seen in people who just try to use just the dimmer switch, the on off function of the dimmer switch. But if it's down like that, Remember, we have this secondary switch that can just turn it completely off like that. Now we have a fully functional dimmer switch in this lighting circuit here. So whenever we get this actually fastened in the van, this dimmer switch is just going to live right above or right under, I haven't decided yet, the actual on off switch right here. So we'll be able to turn the circuit on, adjust the dim or brightness level, turn the circuit off, nice and neat. So we are actually going to be installing this dimmer switch into the circuit inside of the van that we showed last week with all the lights going down the center of the van. So we're going to go install that over there and then circle back around with how that actually looks completed in the van.
Just finished up swapping this dimmer switch into this pre-existing circuit. Now, if you don't know what this pre-existing circuit like looks like, uh, we did a video last week that covers this one uh, start to finish. So go check that one out if you haven't seen that one already. The dimmer switch is pretty easy to integrate into this existing system. We had to disconnect the negative wire from the pre-existing lever nut right here and add a lever nut on this side so that our dimmer switch could split the uh, the wire coming in, the negative wire coming in from the fuse block and then going out to all the lights. On the positive wire, uh, the positive wire for the dimmer switch, it needed to connect into the wire that's before the switch. And so we had to swap the two conductor lever nut for a three conductor lever nut so that we could add that in. So it was pretty simple. Uh, it took me about three minutes and that was even messing up the colors one time, but thank goodness we have them labeled and I was able to check before I actually sent power to it. But as far as testing it, the switch, turn the switch on, lights come on, and then dimmer switch functions pretty well. So I think let's kill the lights and actually see how dim this actually gets because we have 10 lights in here, so it should be pretty bright and then pretty dim. So let's check that out. So these are the lights when they are 100% uh, on, uh, 100% off from the switch on again and then using the dimmer switch to slowly dim them down to that. That's as dim as they get before it actually stops and this is pretty dim like it's definitely not in your face lighting um, probably only be good for like not stubbing your toe on something on the ground I suppose uh, but probably not good for reading or anything can bring them back up and they are pretty bright. So we have 10 lights um, that are gonna be going down the center of this van. And I think these are gonna be plenty bright uh, by the time we get the walls in and everything like that, because we're gonna have like kind of a natural finish like bamboo wall uh, covering. Um, that's the plan as of now. And so we have matte black walls, so it looks a little darker right now because that black is really soaking up the light. So uh, I'm really happy with how this turned out. I like the dimming feature. I think that's gonna be super nice. And that's it. Here's a list of parts that you're going to need for this project. Some wire, two single pole double throw on on switches, a 12 volt dimmer switch, some lever nuts, spade connectors, a 12 volt light, and a source of power. This video is based on the diagrams found in the Explorus Life 12 volt branch circuit guidebook. And we've also assembled a two-way switch wiring kit with all the exact parts that we use in this video, as well as a few alternative sizes, which can be found at shop.explorus.life. How about a tabletop demonstration of a two-way light switch? So we already have our battery here connected to our fuse block, like you've seen in the last, I don't know, four videos or something like that. It's got positive and negative wires off of the fuse block so that we can show this as a tabletop demonstration. This power is off, so we do not have power coming to any of this kind of stuff. Let's talk about the switches that we need to actually wire a two-way switch uh, lighting circuit. This is the type of switch that we need for the uh, two-way lighting circuit. This is a single pole, double throw, on-on switch. This one has there are five different pins on the back. These top two, we are completely ignoring. These are only to make the light work that is inside of this, and I do not want the light to work on this, so we just simply don't connect anything to this. What makes this good for a two-way uh, two, a, a two switch circuit is power is coming into this pin right here, and then it's going out to this pin when the switch is in this position, and then it's going out to this pin whenever it's in this position. So whenever the switch is activated in either direction, power is just flipping from going to this one versus this one. So it's coming in and then going out or out depending on which direction the switch is going. And we need two of these switches to accomplish this circuit and so let's wire up this circuit. 
We have two of these switches and I went ahead and wired the pigtails onto the connectors here. Um, just the same as I have in the previous videos. So if you don't really know how to do this part, consider going back and watching some of the previous videos because we've covered this multiple times. Uh, so let's wire these together. From our fuse block to our first switch, we need power being delivered into the center terminal of the first switch. So now power would be being delivered to the first switch, like so. And then for the second switch, we need to wire the first switch to the second switch. I'm gonna place them like this. The bottom terminal on the first switch gets wired to the bottom terminal of the second switch, like so. The top terminal of the first switch gets wired to the top terminal of the second switch. Like so. Now I have my lighting circuit here, just positive and negative wires going all the way to a puck light at the end. And I'm going to connect the positive wire to the center terminal of the second switch. So this is the positive side of this circuit. So note all of these wires on all of these switches are positive just because we are breaking up the positive wire that goes in the full circuit. For the negative wire, that simply goes back to the negative bus bar or one of the lever nuts that is in on the negative side of the system, just like so. Okay, now we can turn battery power on and we have a light here. So that's a positive sign, but we're going to kind of kill the lights so it's a little bit easier to see this light turning on and off. And let's test this out. We have two switches that would ultimately be in two different locations. They're both in the off position right now, but the light is on. But with two-way switches, that's not really how, it really doesn't matter. So we got one, the light turns off. Up, light turns on. Down, light turns off. Down, light turns on. Okay, that's working perfectly. And this is why this works. So now we have a fully functioning two-way circuit system, but I also know that a lot of people want to have dimmers in this system. So I'm going to show you how to put this dimmer into this circuit so that we can control the brightness or dimness of the lights from the first switch location. And through the power of movie magic, I'm all done. So this was the exact same process as it was in the last video where I showed you how to wire this dimmer switch. I went over that in a bit more detail in the last video, so you may want to go check that out. But this is all connected to the upstream side of the first switch. So positive for the dimmer switch goes to the positive lever nut between the fuse block and the first switch. And then the negative side of things is still split the same way I showed you in the last video with that dimmer to the battery negative and the light negative here. So we can see that it's still turning off and on as appropriate. We'll turn this on, get this over here in the shade a little bit. I'm gonna turn it up and down and it is still dimming. Now you could actually put this dimmer on the downstream side of the second switch as well in much of the same way. Is that true? Yeah, I want to try it. <laughs> okay, so that, that goes away. So this needs to be on the center connector.
So now that the dimmer switch is powered, at any time that the light is actually getting power, it actually does work. So we can turn it down, turn this on, brighter, dimmer, turn it off on that side. I don't know which way we want to do this. Leave that on off here. Turn it on, it dims. Yeah, I would say that's fully functional. So you can definitely put the dimmer switch uh, powered from the center terminal of either the first switch or the second switch and it works just fine. So now that we know all of that, we are going to take this circuit and we are going to install it in the van. We're going to run all the wires and then circle back around and show you how all this actually looks installed in the van. Now everything is wired together, it's time for a circuit tour, which is going to start from our single 100 amp hour Battleborn lithium battery that we have temporarily just affixed to the floor right here. It's not affixed, it's just sitting there. Running positive and negative up to the top, up here, to our fuse block, which fuse block's going to ultimately live right up here, but it's just temporarily zip tied right there for demonstration purposes. Here is our first switch. Off of our fuse block, we have our positive and negative wires coming down to our switch and our dimmer. The negative one is coming in to this lever nut, which is going to the battery negative wire for the dimmer. And then negative is coming out on that red wire right there, which is going negative wire out to our lights. On the positive side of things, we have our positive wire coming in, feeding the center terminal of our switch. And then it's going in through the switch and it's going out one of these two side terminals, depending on which direction the switch is going. The center terminal of the switch is also feeding positive, the positive wire for the dimmer. Then our two positives and one negative that are coming across the top of the van back to the back. And when we get back here, Stephanie is going to talk about the rear switch. Now we have our two positives and negative are coming into the switch. The negatives are just passing by the switch and then going back out. It's not actually connected to the switch. The two positives are coming in and are connected to the switch on either side. And then that positive is coming out right here and going back up to our loads. Showing how the flow of power through this switch and through these two wires and the back switch, uh, showing that in person is kind of difficult. Uh, so I've made a graphic representation of kind of how the power is flowing through this circuit whenever the switches are in their various positions. <laughs> the dimmer works pretty good. Um, there it is, almost all the way off, as low as it can go before it actually turns off. And then full brightness. And somewhere in between, you may be seeing some uh, flickering of the lights right over in this area where it's bouncing off the walls. We're not actually seeing that in real life. That's just how the camera and the frame rate is picking up the light coming off of uh, this LED strip. But rest assured, it looks great on our end and there's no flickering or anything like that. And we're super happy with how this turned out. Uh, this circuit is going to be what is controlling our, uh, our strip lighting. It's going to be underneath all of the cabinets um, once we get this thing all built up. So we're pretty excited to see how that turns out. And that pretty much wraps up this video. Here's a list of parts that you're going to need for this project. 12 gauge, three conductor wire, electrical boxes, switches, outlets, and GFCI outlets, face plates for the GFCI outlets, switches, and outlets, lever nuts and spade connectors, 
and some various tools that we've already talked about in a previous video. And before I make my first connections, I want to talk about the breaker box really quick. Uh, this breaker box is just temporarily fabbed up just on the tabletop with an extension cord here. This is what would be coming from the inverter charger in a fully built system, but it's just important to know that it is disconnected. Uh, any, if this was connected, most of this in here would shock you. So this is really important here. Power would be coming in through the breaker that would be powering the right side bus bars of this breaker box. And then we're going to be installing this 20 amp tandem breaker. So we can put two circuits on this breaker into the slot immediately to the right of the 50 amp breaker. It just clips on to that reel. And snaps into place. The wire that we're going to be using for this circuit is 12 gauge triplex wire. It's got a white, a green, and a black. So neutral, ground, and hot inside of that. And we're going to connect that black to the breaker, green to the ground bus bar, and white to the, the neutral bus bar. Now we have our 12 gauge triplex wire connected into the breaker box. Got the positive wire coming to the positive terminal of this 20 amp tandem breaker here. And then the ground wire coming to the ground bus bar back here. And the negative wire coming to the negative bus bar here. Now in the actual van, these are most, I think all of these are going to get ferrules uh, when we actually wire this up for real. But for tabletop demonstrations, we're leaving those off for now. To start wiring in the first outlet, I'm just going to cut this right here and then strip back the sheathing, strip back the wires. And now they're ready to go into the box with the outlet. Now there are a ton of different electrical boxes that you can use, depending on basically how you want to attach the box to the wall. I'm not going to talk about all the different types of electrical boxes in this video. That would simply take way too long. And I'm just going to be showing it in this, and then we'll talk more about electrical boxes whenever we actually install these onto the walls. Simply stab one of these little access ports open. Like that. Feed the wires up and through. Like so. And we're going to be using lever nuts to make these connections, same as we have in the last, I don't know, half dozen videos or so. Now that we have our lever nuts on the ends of these wires, we can start making the actual connection to the outlet. So here's the outlet we're going to use. This is pretty much the most common outlet you can find at any uh, hardware store or anything like that. And the instructions are usually on the box that these come in, uh, but the ground wire goes on the green screw. The negative wire or the neutral wire goes onto the silver screw there. And then the hot wire goes to gold. So think of like silver as white. I don't know, maybe that's how I, that's how I remember it, but that's pretty much how that works. Now we can't with stranded wire, we can't put stranded wire underneath these screws here. And so we need to use 
fork connectors like these. And I have went ahead and pre-made these, just a fork connector uh, crimped onto the end of wire uh, with heat shrink on it. And we're gonna go ahead and connect these to all the terminals in their appropriate spots here. And that's all done. We've got our green wire on our ground terminal there, white wire on our neutral wire, neutral screw there, and our black wire on the hot terminal over on this side. Good practice to go ahead and screw the remaining screws that we're not using into place. Now all we have to do is connect up these wires we just put into the outlet into these lever nuts. green to green, white to white, and black to black. Do a little double check of your work. Green to ground, white to neutral, black to hot. And then this can just simply feed back into the outlet box like so. Screws go in their appropriate spots on the box. Just like so. Then here's the faceplate that would go on this. It's just a simple one screw you put right here. This faceplate would go on after the walls are up, but just wanted to show you kind of how that looked as is. Good workmanship right here. Make sure your screws are either straight up and down or straight sideways whichever you prefer on that. Now that this outlet is good to go, I'm going to go ahead and connect this into just an extension cord I've got going over to the wall. And it's important to know now that that screw right down there is hot and would shock me. So be careful with this now that it's under power. Turn this breaker on. I can turn the breaker on to the, this circuit right there. And then now we should have power here. We can go ahead and plug in this charger. And we are indeed charging. So just a little battery charger right there for our DeWalt equipment and stuff like that. But this is how you wire a single outlet. Now I'm going to disassemble this, turn power back off, and show you how to wire in a second outlet. So we have this all disassembled, and I also cut another section of wire here. It's got uh, just stripped off ends there. On both sides. And now we're, this is going to be the wire that we're going to connect from one box to the next box to our second outlet. It's going to pop out the other protector right there, throw that away, and then feed that wire into the same as we did earlier. All three of these are going to be connecting up to their color-coded spots on each of these lever nuts. And that is all wired up. Blacks to blacks, whites to whites, and greens to greens. It's really important to check your work here because I see that I missed a few strands of wires getting into that lever nut. 
But that's one of the great things about checking your work when you do this stuff. Just slide it out of the lever nut, pop it back in place, and clamp it down. Now all of this can go back into the box the same way as we just had it, except with the introduction of a few new wires. Okay, and that one is in the box. Now it's pretty important to know, like you wouldn't actually be installing these outlets until the walls are up because these little ears here are gonna kind of get in the way. So tabletop demonstration here, remember. Now for the next outlet. This one gets wired the exact same way as we did when we did a single outlet. Just imagine if this was coming from the breaker box. It's the same thing here. So we're just gonna speed through it. And that is that. That's the second outlet in this circuit. Now I did use three conductor lever nuts here and I'm just using one blank. And that's totally fine to do. You don't have to fill all these up. Now there are two conductor lever nuts, but I think the uh, three gives you a chance to add a circuit if you need to, or also gives you a point to probe with a multimeter if you need to. So options here. Be sure to screw these down too, like I almost forgot. So now that this circuit is completely wired up, I'm going to go ahead and plug the breaker box back into my extension cord here for the sake of tabletop testing. I uh, just remember all this will be hot and so will everything inside of there. So just be careful there. Okay, and our light for our battery charger here is on. So this one is working just as well as the first one was working. Perfect. So now this is all good to go. I'm going to disassemble most of this and I'm going to show you how to wire in a 120 volt switch so that you could control something, let's say like a water heater or something like that that's buried in the back part of your camper or van uh, from the living area. So let's get started on that. So I went ahead and disassembled this first outlet, left the second one in place. I didn't change anything in there because I'm going to show you how to wire a switch into where the outlet was so that we can control this second outlet. So the greens, the, uh, the, the grounds, and the neutrals, the whites, those two just stay together. I just pulled the outlet out of that lever nut. So those just get left like that. Now the black is what we're splitting in our switch here. So on this switch, we have two hots and a ground here. We're gonna attach the ground here and then a hot to the top and then a hot to the bottom. And it doesn't really matter which one goes to which, but we're just gonna use those jumpers like we used in the outlets to make those connections right now. And that is all done. So we have the green screw here, green wire, coming to all of the grounds here. And then we've got the black wires on this side, spade connectors there, or fork connectors there, going to these terminals here. One is coming from the breaker box, and the other is going out to this secondary outlet. Now we can put this back in place into the box like we did on the outlets.
And that is that. So we have our switch here and our outlet controlled by the switch here. So we're gonna go ahead and plug in our breaker box, turn on our breakers and test it out. Okay, we're all plugged in here. Switch is in the off position. Turn it on and our light starts flashing on our DeWalt charger there. Turn it off and flashes a time or two more and then goes away. So this is working perfectly. If you wanted to wire multiple outlets onto a switch, you would just wire multiple outlets in the same way that I showed just a second ago, but the switch would just be the first thing in line. So this is how you wire a switch to control an outlet. And the next thing that we're going to talk about is GFCI outlets. So this is a GFCI outlet, and we're not going to get into like what this does on the internals or how it actually works. What you need to know about these is these add protection from shock in wet areas. So like kitchens, bathrooms, outdoor areas, things like that. This needs to be wired pretty specifically. Um, it's similar to the other outlets that we installed here with two screws on one side, two screws on the other side, except this one is particular on which screws get attached to what. So it's the same in the fact that this is the silver screw for the white wire, silver screw for white wire, gold screw for, for, uh, for the black wire, gold screw for the black wire. But on the back here, it says line. And what line means is these are the positive and negative wires, positive and neutral wires coming from the breaker box. And underneath this sticker that we should read that says the load terminals under this label are for feeding additional receptacles. This wiring can leave this outlet without ground fault or ground fault protection. Read instructions prior to wiring. So be sure to read the instructions prior to wiring. But it's important to know that these two screws underneath where it says load, let's see, you can see that load right there, that needs to go off to the additional outlets in the circuit because this GFCI outlet will provide protection to all the outlets downstream of this outlet. That's the short of it. We're gonna go ahead and wire this up and I'll show you how it looks. Now I have all my pigtails attached to this. Now this particular GFCI, it has these little plates underneath the screws that we're able to put the wires right underneath it. So since it has this compression plate, we actually don't get to, or don't have to, and can't use the spade connectors as, or these fork connectors as they won't fit. But since this plate prevents any breaking of these strands of wires, that's fine there. So we have our hot and neutral, and ground wires attached to each side of this GFCI outlet, the line wires up here and the load down here, so from the breaker box and to the remaining outlets. The ground gets tied to all of the grounds in this box. So we're gonna wire all of this together and then I'll show you how it works. Okay, and this is all wired up. It gets pretty messy in a hurry, but this is the wire coming from the breaker box here. And then we've got line right here, so it's our positive and negative coming from the breaker box to these. And then load is coming out of these bottom two screws, these two lever nuts here, going to that wire that's going on to this outlet here. So this it, this GFCI outlet is protecting this outlet here. All the grounds, they just get tied together in the same lever nut there. 
So ground screw there, ground screw coming in from the breaker box, I'm sorry, ground, ground wire coming in from the breaker box, and then ground wire going out to the secondary outlet. So let's put all this back into the box and fire it up and give it a test. Okay, this is all wired up here. Now I'm going to grab my handy dandy charger, plug it all in, get all the breakers turned on and give it a test. Okay, we are all plugged in here, turned on here. This is hot, so I'm not going to touch. And we can go ahead and plug in our charger here, see if it fires up. And it does. Top one. Same thing. Last one out here. If the top one works, the bottom one should too. Should be good there. Now we can give our GFCI outlet a test. Little button on there that just says test. Push it. That light goes away. And now our outlets no longer work. So that is working perfectly. We can hit the reset button. It flashed red, then flashed green, and then solid green. So that is working perfectly. So this is all complete. Now we're going to go into the van and we're going to wire our, uh, all of our outlets, our outlets, GFCI outlets, 120 volt outlets and all that kind of stuff. And then we're gonna circle back around once we get all that wired and show you how it actually looks once it's actually installed. So let's get to it. We have all of our 120 volt wires that are going to be powering all of our 120 volt outlets uh, run now. So let's talk about the circuits and why we're just leaving these like this. So for the circuits, we're going to have our breaker box mounted right here up into the wall, nice and neat. And we have three circuits coming off of that currently. So we have one that's coming up and back down to the outlet that's going to be right here. And then we're gonna have another wire that's going to come up to in front of the front window, uh, the front of uh, the bay window basically. And these two outlets are going to be on the same circuit. The second circuits, we'll say the second two circuits, these are the independent circuits. They're running up across the top here and then over on this side. We have one circuit that's going to be back here. This is gonna be like the uh, the rear dinette or bed, depending on how we have the back setup uh, outlet right here. And then this front one is going to be basically the kitchen outlet. It's going to live right here. And we wanted a dedicated kitchen outlet and that'll be a GFCI outlet so that if we're powering induction cooktop or something high powered like that, they can have its own circuit and not be sharing it with any other loads that we may have going on. The reason that we don't have any outlets on any of these, and we're just leaving that for now, is because we're just not ready for it yet. Um, this is not really the part of the build where you put the outlets on because the boxes that we have to put the outlets in, that the wires go into, these really need to be mounted and the walls really need to be up before we wire the actual outlets in. We're gonna have furring strips on the walls here that these boxes are gonna to mount to. And we don't have the furring strips up yet. We haven't got to that part of the build yet. So once the furring strips go up, the boxes get mounted to here. And then we can put the wires into the boxes. But the wires really can't be wired to the outlets at that point. They just have to be curled up at the back because when we put the walls up, I wanna be able to use a roto zip to go in there and cut out the hole for the outlet. So we're just not ready to actually wire these up yet. So these are gonna live just like this for now. But when we get to the walls portion of the video, we're gonna be wiring all this stuff up just like we showed on the tabletop earlier. And that pretty much wraps up this episode. Here's a list of parts you'll need for this project. Wire, 
our 12 volt DC scene lights, a 12 volt relay, a single pole, single throw switch, spade connectors, and lever nuts, a source of power, a drill, drill bits, and a burring tool, rust-oleum paint, and some sealant, and some other various electrical and hand tools like we've talked about in other videos. These are the lights that we're going to be using in the, for the scene lights on the side of the van. We've got six of them. There's gonna be two of them on each side and then two of them in the rear. And these are the Light Force Rock 9 utility lights. And they are super bright and pretty streamlined. So we'll show those off kind of once they're installed. But we have a fully completed lighting circuit right here. Um, that's nice and functional with our positive wire coming to our switch from our switch to our positive wire of the light and negative wire coming back to the fuse block right there. So this is the same lighting circuit that we've showed in previous videos. This kind of lighting circuit is really good if the wire run from the fuse block to the light has the switch, you know, just right in line so that you're not having to go out of your way to install the switch. But in the van, when we get all this installed, we're gonna have our fuse block up top and then our lighting up top, actually pretty close to the fuse block, sort of like this. But our switch is going to be up in the front cab area of the van. So that's why we want to introduce relays into this system. And that's pretty much what this tabletop demonstration is going to be about, is teaching you how to wire a relay and what you would use them for. Now this particular relay, it comes with a little bit of a wiring harness, if you will, for the back, and it just plugs in just like that. And what a relay does is, a relay is effectively just a switch that is controlled by another circuit. Now let's talk through how that actually works. So far, this is the basically step one of how a relay works. So very similar to a switch, got battery power coming into the relay and then out of the relay to the light. And then the negative wire would just be going past the relay to the light. Inside of the relay, very much like a switch, there is a piece that connects and disconnects the relay. And this is the circuit that actually tells the relay to open or close to power the light. So from the battery, positive power is coming up to power the relay. And then to close the circuit, it's coming down to the switch, back out, and back to the battery. So that's on paper how it works. But why would you need to do this? Let's say, for example, it's only from here to here is five feet. And let's say you wanted to have the switch mounted, I don't know, whatever, 30 feet away, something pretty long. If you were going to go from battery to switch, from switch to light, that's gonna be whatever quick math there, 40-ish feet, um, and then double that for the positive and negative conductors. So there's going to be um, a lot of wire that would need to do that. So if this is only five feet from there to there, to there, we might be able to use, let's call it 16 gauge wire, depending on, you know, for this particular light. But if we had to go 40 feet, 30 feet this way, and then 30 feet this way, five feet from there and five feet from there, you know, we may have to start using, let's call it 10 gauge wire to satisfy our voltage drop requirements. So by using a relay in this location, it may not necessarily mean less wire always, sometimes it will, but more importantly, it means that we can probably use smaller gauge wire on all of these circuits because this circuit right here that controls the actual relay is carrying just a few hundred milliamps, like 200 milliamps usually, um, at the high side. And so it's not enough amps to really need to use big gauge wire. So if we are using the relay, 
This can also be 16 gauge as well, even though that distance is pretty far. Let's show how this is actually wired now. The relay has four wires on it, just like I showed. You've got red and blue, looking at the wiring diagram that actually came with the relay. You've got red and blue is going to be your load wires. Uh, the, the blue one is coming in from the battery, and then the red one is what is going out to power the light. And then for the trigger source, which is the switch, it is going to be the white is coming in from the battery, and then the black is going off to the switch. Now let's wire this together. And now we have our relay wired in, and it is functioning perfectly. Get all this stuff up so we can see it. So what we have here is we have our positive and negative from our fuse block. Negative is just going straight through to the light. The positive wire is coming to the blue wire of the relay, through the relay, and coming out the red wire of the relay to the positive wire of the light. Now these two are being connected and disconnected because there is a circuit being connected and disconnected on the black and white wires of the relay. So on this one, we have our relay being powered coming out from the fuse block to the white wire. And then the circuit's continuing black wire to the switch. We're interrupting the negative side of this particular circuit. And so when we connect the circuit, we have a complete circuit between these two wires, the light turns on, light turns off, the light turns on with a switch. And we can really make this particular circuit as long as we want, really. Uh, we can stand, you know, 20 feet away and turn the switch off and on, and the relay is going to be uh, controlling the light, and the switch over there is going to be controlling the relay. You generally will not actually connect the power wire to the relay uh, from its own specific fuse on the fuse block you can usually power the relay from the load wire coming in, which is this one. Let me show you how that looks. And now we have our very patriotic circuit right here and our switch over here. This is the same thing that I had going on just a second ago, except now we're powering both the coil inside of the relay and the actual load from the same power wire coming off of the fuse block. And this is fine, given that the fuse that's in the fuse block is sized appropriately as to protect all of the wires in the entire circuit, which in our case, it will be. And that is pretty much it. So we have our switch that's working to control our relay and our relay is controlling our lights. And that's pretty much all there is to this particular circuit uh, for a tabletop demonstration. Whenever we move into the van, we're actually gonna be doing three separate relays, all controlled by three separate switches so that we can control our Lightforce Rock 9 utility lights that are going to be on the side of the van, uh, left side, right side, and the rear of the van independently. So I'm going to go wire all this up in the van and then we're going to circle back around and show you how all this looks actually wired up. Now that all of this is actually installed, let's talk about it. We measured and marked where all the lights would go. We created a template with some masking tape we taped an envelope to catch our metal shavings. We drilled some holes and deburred where necessary, then wiped all that down with alcohol, then treated the holes with some Rust-Oleum paint, and then we repeated that for all of the lights. Then we put some sealant on all of the rubber mounts for the lights, pushed the wire through, 
and then put in our screws, bolts, and washers. And then we tightened all that up with a drill and a wrench. And once everything was actually installed on the side of the van, we moved inside to start the wire. Now that everything is wired up, let's do a system walkthrough of these three circuits, passenger, rear, and driver side. So all power is starting at our 100 amp hour Battleborn lithium battery. We got temporarily down here. And it's coming up positive and negative wires that are going to where the fuse block will eventually permanently live. So through our fuse block, we've got positive and negative wires coming out to this mess right here. These are the two positive wires coming out of the fuse block. That is powering these three circuits for our relays, okay? So power is coming in to these two five terminal or five, uh, five wire uh, lever nuts. And then the white wires is what's delivering power to each of the relays. So one, two, and three. And then the blue wires is what's powering the loads. So one, two, and three. So the blue wires are simply passing that power through the relay to these three wires that are going out to each of the individual circuits. One's going to driver, one's going to passenger, and one is going to the rear scene lights. So those are those wires there. Now, the way that the power actually goes through the relay is from the signal wires that we're seeing right here. So let's circle back around to the negative wire coming off of the fuse block. So negative wire from the fuse block is coming to this five terminal lever nut right here. And three of the wires are going off to the individual lighting circuits, driver, rear, and passenger. The other one is coming up through these wires along with these other three colored wires. We got a uh, orange, and pink, and uh, a purple there and those are coming up this direction up to the front up here and the switches are going to live somewhere in this general vicinity of the headliner got a little bit of slack there so we can move them around as we need to the black wire right here or the negative wire is feeding one terminal of a single pull single throw switch right here and then it's coming out of each of the switches going to each of those colored wires that we were talking about just a second ago. Purple, uh, orange, and pink right there. And so what's happening there is these switches are breaking the negatives of each of the circuit. It's delivering negative, uh, it's delivering negative to each of, the, each of the switches. And then the switches, and then this, this lever nut is distributing the, that negative wire essentially up to each of these switches and then the switch is breaking that circuit into each of these negative wire, each of these colored negative wires here. So those are coming back up here, back to our relays. We have pink, orange, and purple right here. And those are connecting to the black wires of the relays. So whenever there's a negative signal to any of these wires, this relay is going to close, which is going to combine the blue and red wires and send power to all the lights. Now I know this is pretty confusing and there's a lot of wires here, and I wouldn't even say that this is particularly beginner friendly, but I do think that if you're trying to do more advanced wiring, this is definitely a skill that you need to learn how to do. So it's just one of those things that it's another tool that we can add to our arsenal to be able to turn off and on a circuit 
from a remote location by using relays. I'll see if I can reach that. Step one, we're gonna see what's in the box. We got everything unpacked and laid out and we checked through our packing list to make sure everything was here and here's what was here. Metal 14 by 14 trim plate, 14 by 14 foam gasket, straight foam leveling strip, the faceplate, two mounting brackets, the control panel and control panel faceplate, screws for the control panel, screws for the metal faceplate, some heat shrink, DC to DC connectors, threaded rod mounting bolts with the associated washers and nuts. Some extra black vents. Because I'll probably break them. The remote with the AAA batteries. And stickers! <laughs> and the actual air conditioner itself. Now that we know all of the parts are here, we're going to bench test this unit before we lug it all the way up onto the roof. To bench test it, we're just going to connect it to uh, two 100 amp hour, 12 volt Battleborn lithium batteries wired in series so that it's a 24 volt battery bank. So we're gonna make those connections and then see if it works. We got the air conditioner flipped over and Stephanie pulled the wires out of the bottom of the air conditioner. Got a little data cable there, more wires for the control panel, and then the two big power wires that are actually going to deliver power to the air conditioner. So we want to connect our positive and negative wires that are going to the Lynx distributor later on in the build uh, to these two wires. So we're gonna use the butt splice connectors and crimp the butt splice connectors onto the wires there to make that connection, and then finish it off with some heat shrink. So now that everything is connected, uh, we're going to flip this air conditioner uh, right side up because I don't think you can run an air conditioner when it's upside down. Now that we have battery power connected to the air conditioner, it's time to press the on button. And it works. <laughs> so bench test is complete and I would say that it works. Uh, so now let's go cut some holes in the van and get this thing mounted up top. We just finished cutting the hole and painting the edges for rust prevention. And the next thing we have to do is put this gasket on here. 
Now in the instructions for the pneumatic air conditioner, it says anywhere that there is a high spot to cut out part of the gasket. So on our transit roof, uh, there is a high spot that goes from right here all the way to over here on each side of this little channel that's on each side. Now, would it be fine to leave it? Probably, it's probably fine, uh, especially if we put some sealant on this side. You know, we'll be putting sealant all the way around the whole thing. But Stephanie wanted to try something. She wanted to use a hot knife, hot knife, hot knife, to attempt to cut out just a little bit um, for clearance. And we're sitting right at 3.5 millimeters. So we need to cut off 3.5 millimeters, this bottom part of the gasket. And Stephanie's gonna see if it's gonna work. So wish us luck. I give it a 4.6 out of 10, I think. Mostly because I'm sure this smoke has really terrible fumes in it. It's not good for me, but I think it did work. I think if I was doing it again, I'd give a shot, just uh, clamping a razor blade to this and do the same thing, but it worked and it's gotta be better than it was. Now that we got the gasket all cut to fit and it fits, pretty nicely. I know that took a little bit of time, but it gave us some time for the paint to dry. So the next step is going to be pulling off these strips here where there is still double-sided adhesive left, where we didn't cut it off, and then using some uh, Dicor sealant to just go around the outside edges, plop it in place, and then seal around the outside edges. Now that the gasket is uh, secured and sealed down uh, with a nice bead of die core around the outside, I need to put the, um, the leveling block in the back. And so it's made out of the exact same stuff as this, but it just sits right back here and it keeps the back of the air conditioner kind of supported up uh, off of the back of the van. And since we cut this down quite a bit, uh, I'm also gonna cut this down a bit as well, but I'm just gonna use a razor blade this time and see if that works any better. So now I'm just gonna put this gasket right here where it's gonna have lots of good contact in the back. And then this is just gonna get sandwiched down in between the pressure of, you know, whenever we clamp all this down. So now that this is on there, it's actually time to move this thing up here. So we're gonna to try to wrestle it up here. Got Chad here to help. So um, we'll see how it goes. So now that the air conditioner is actually up on top of the van, uh, we need to secure it to the van. And we've got this metal trim ring and it simply goes up around the perimeter of the hole. And then this trim ring gets uh, held in place by these two support brackets right here, up like that. And they get bolted into the bottom of the air conditioner with these bolts like this. Now, these only go up in there so far. And we have to put these nuts on these studs like that with a washer like this and like that all on the bottom of the air conditioner so that's what i'm going to do right now we just wrapped up securing the air conditioner actually to the van so we have the flat plate flat metal plate that actually goes onto the body of the van. 
and we're actually going on the outsides of both of these body ribs here. So we're actually capturing the body ribs for a little bit of extra support. The cross braces here, going across, and these studs are threading into the plates on the bottom of the air conditioner. And then these nuts here uh, are secure, are actually like tightening up these, uh, these cross braces. And whenever I tighten these, you don't want to tighten them too tight. They were pretty uh, adamant about that on the website. And so I was just using my wrench here and only using two fingers or so about halfway up the wrench to just snug it into place. You're just trying to compress the gasket. It doesn't really need to be torqued down a lot. And that pretty much wraps up this project. All these wires and stuff like that are gonna be connected to the Lynx distributor whenever we get to that part of the build. Same with the uh, data cables and all that kind of stuff. Well, those will be connected whenever we do the walls. So Steph is going to hop up top right now and take all of the plastic off and that's gonna wrap up this project. Now that we got our Max Air Fan 7500K uh, box, let's figure out what's inside. Got our instruction manual. The remote and batteries. <laughs> the hardware baggie with some assorted screws and spade connectors. The receiving flange. The interior trim ring. And of course, the fan itself. We also grabbed this adapter, which is not included with the Max Air fan kit. And this is just to sit on top of the roof and it's curved to meet the, uh, the ridges of the top of the van. And that came with uh, butyl tape and some more screws. We have all of our main parts and the next thing we wanna do is bench test this fan. And so we're gonna connect this fan to that fuse block that's connected to that 100 amp hour Battleborn lithium battery. Uh, so that we can make sure that this works before we actually glue it to the top of the van. We've got our 100 amp hour battleborne lithium battery here, positive and negative terminals, positive and negative wires feeding our fuse block, and then positive and negative wires off the respective spots on the back of the fuse block to go to the positive wire of the Max Air fan here, into this lever nut, and the negative wire from the Max Air fan. To the negative wire, going to the negative bus bar. Now we can turn our battery switch on. We heard a beep, so let's flip this over and make sure it actually opens and the fan turns on. Cool, so the lid lifted up. The fan is now working, so we got pretty good confidence that it's going to actually work whenever we uh, install it up on the roof. The next thing that we need to do is make an interior support ring uh, out of some wood for the bottom of the fan so that we can mount it to, and that's the next step. I have the square cut out that's going to be underneath the roof of the van that everything is going to actually screw to. But in order to fit the curvature and the ribs of the underside of the van, I need to cut off 3.5 millimeters off of this side and this side where I've kind of scribbled that line. So over on my table saw, I have adjusted that so that I have a cut depth of 3.5 millimeters. And I'm just going to run that across in multiple passes and kind of shave off 3.5 millimeters off these edges. Just finished up this wooden support and notched off the sides so it fits nice and neat between the ribs on the inside of the van. And now that this is made, uh, it's time to go cut a hole.
Now that the hole has been cut, it is time to install the fan. Uh, so we have this adapter we talked about earlier. It's going to sit down right on top of that. And this is going to be secured to the metal of the van with this 3M window weld. And then we're going to wait overnight for it to cure so that this is all nice and watertight whenever we drop this flange right on top. And the wood support structure on the bottom will go inside the van and that's what all this screws to. Yesterday we finished mounting the flange to the roof of the van and let the sealant dry overnight. So we attached the, uh, the adapter to the roof and the flange to the top of the adapter and the wood support to the underside of the roof like you just saw. And for the sealant, it's just Dicor lap sealant. And the way that we put that on is we put a bead around the upper part of this flange and let it run for about five minutes and then put another bead around where it left off. And that stuff is really runny whenever you put it on. And it's made to kind of waterfall over the edge. And then we taped around the outside uh, so that everything is super, super waterproof. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to open this fan up, put it on top of the flange here, and then put the screws in, the shorter screws that came in the hardware kit. And that's pretty much gonna wrap this up. And now the fan is secured to the roof and this video is pretty much over. Now there is this um, interior trim ring that is going to go on the bottom side of the fan, but we can't put that up yet until we put the ceiling on and we're just not there in the process yet. So consider subscribing because we will be installing this whenever we install the ceiling. The wires that are on the bottom of this fan, those are going to be uh, connected to the fuse block, which we'll be showing later on in the build as well, whenever we show how to wire the 12 volt fuse block. Four months ago, we released a video introducing our new transit project. And we asked all of you what projects you wanted to see us tackle during this build. One of our viewers, Chase, emailed me and told me that Unaka Gearco made his roof rack and that he was super happy with it and recommended that I check him out to consider it for our build. So I checked out their website and it appeared that they really didn't have that much in terms of Ford Transit roof racks. But a few hours later, I got a call from Dan, one of the co-owners of Unaka, asking how they could help. I told them about the idea that I had about a custom roof rack that would hold a max air fan, a nomadic air conditioner, with every single remaining square foot covered with solar panels. They love the idea of helping us bring our ideas to life and also make it available to anybody else wanting the same roof rack for their own build, so we decided to partner up for this project. Eric, Unaka's other co-owner, took my idea and ran with it. He took my rough SketchUp design and put it into a much more accurate format and then set up a time to come out to our shop here in Steamboat Springs to hash out the details. We spent a late night working through his questions and a few follow-up Zoom calls later, and a few months later, we received three boxes via UPS Ground to make this vision become a reality. Here's how the project ended up, but let's take a step back and show you how we made it. And we actually have Eric from Unaka here for this install, which I'm pretty excited about. The cool thing about this is, is this is Mark one, you know, prototype of this roof rack. It's a prototype fin. And some things can change when it goes from, you know, being modeled up on a computer to actually being installed on top of the transit. And that's what Eric is here for. So Steph and I are pretty much going to be doing the install and Eric's going to be here kind of in the background, checking test fits on stuff like that and seeing if there's any adjustments that need to be made for whenever this roof rack is actually available for sale to the general public. So, welcome. Let's get started. This roof rack comes broken down in quite a few parts. This lets Unaka ship it via UPS ground in just a few boxes as opposed to freight shipping to keep costs and logistical issues lower for all of us. We laid out all of the parts on the floor, taking special care to keep all of the hardware nice and organized. 
The hardware baggies are labeled according to what function they serve in the build, so we kept all of the hardware in their individual baggies to make our lives easier. So on these side rails, it's pretty important to notice that uh, the lengths of the 8020 and the side rails are not the exact same in terms of where they're split down the middle. The front piece of 8020 is longer than the back piece of 8020, and then this is offset on the side plates so that it makes a stronger joint. So it's important to know that the longer piece of 8020 is the front piece, and for the side rail, the side rail that kind of curves down is the front piece on the side rail so that it fits the contour of the van. Just makes it a little bit stronger uh, once we actually get it installed. We're gonna kick off the assembly process here by bolting the side rails together using these splice plates and the splice plate hardware kit. All the bolts that are being connected to nylock nuts get anti-seize on them to prevent the hardware from getting stuck. The bolts get torqued down to an appropriate torque. The side plate is fully assembled now with the splice plates and the fairing cap up front. And now we need to attach all of this to the actual 8020. Now, if you've never really dealt with 8020, the way we're going to do that is taking these T-nuts here and they simply slide into the top part of the 8020. Then you can move them around with, uh, with just a tool. And it's also important to know that it is directional and so the kind of protrusion off the bottom of the T-nut needs to go down. We're gonna put these fasteners, one at the front of this plate, one at the back of this plate, one at the front of this plate, and one at the back of that plate. And then the remaining ones, they simply go in the same spots as shown in the instructions here. The side rails get bolted down to the 8020 with T-nuts. These T-nuts aren't nylock nuts, so they get a drop of blue Loctite to keep the screws from backing out due to vibrations of driving down the road. The instructions for the rack show where approximately the roof mounting feet need to be positioned, so we measured out where those would go and marked them with some painter's tape. These can be adjusted as needed later, so we're just going for pretty close at this point. The next thing we want to do is attach the mounting feet to the 8020. And so the mounting feet just mount to the 8020, much in the same way that the side plate mounts on the other side. So we're gonna slide all of our T-nuts into place all the way down and then bolt them down. Now these mounting feet they have rubber on the bottoms of them already, and so it makes it pretty waterproof, although we will still use sealant over the top. We slid the T-nuts in place to our pre-marked positions, put Loctite on the bolts, and bolted the mounting feet to the inside of the 8020, and tightened them to just past hand tight so we could adjust them further on the roof if needed. So this side rail is uh, completely done. Side, side plate is mounted to the 8020 and then the mounting feet are on there as well. Now it's pretty sturdy whenever it's up like this and will be really sturdy once it's mounted to the actual van. But it's important to note that right here is definitely the weakest part of this whole assembly because it is in two pieces. And it's not weak, it's just the weakest part of the assembly. So when you're handling it, you know, kind of use two people and pick it up from either side. That way it doesn't put a whole lot of stress on this joint. Same thing can be said for the side plates whenever they are not installed to the 8020. So just try not to stress out this area uh, too much while you're actually installing the thing. So I think that's all for this side. We are going to move over to the other side rail right there and get it bolted together in the exact same way that we just did this one, just opposite.
We just wrapped up finishing this side of this side rail here, and we found something that we uh, it made it a little bit easier than the first go round. The fairing cap that goes on the very front, uh, it was easier to leave it off until this is already assembled uh, because when you have this flipped over, this point kind of gets in the way and kind of makes it all wobbly and stuff like that. So one of the fun things about kind of doing this very first one is we're able to find some stuff that we'll be able to add to the instructions to actually make this process easier. So just fun little side note. So the next thing we need to do is we need to pop the caps off of the top of the transit so that it'll expose the threaded inserts so that we can actually uh, fix the rack to the roof. So me and Eric, we climbed up on top of the roof because we're going to start uncovering some of these caps and there's eight of them, so it's kind of a tedious process. We need to take these caps off, which are in the center of these punch outs, and there's eight of them up here, four per side. There's one, two, three, and then four right back there that they, mount, they match the mounting feet on the roof rack. And to take these off, put a little bit of heat on those caps and then take a plastic pry tool and then work our way underneath them. And then the cap will pop off. And then we just need to scrape away some of the adhesive goop that's underneath there and then clean it up with some alcohol. So this hole, this mounting spot right here is not aligned with the actual threads of the mount down below. And apparently this is a pretty common problem on these Ford Transits for whatever reason. Now, there's no good way to really make this hole better, but there is a way to make this hole bigger and it's with uh, surgical tin snips. Uh, so we're basically just gonna cut and notch out the uh, body panel right around the threaded inlet, just like probably a quarter of an inch and then fold that back under the best we can and then paint that for rust prevention. And that's what we're going to do. So day two of this project, yesterday, we finished up the mounting holes up on top of the roof and it took way longer than expected because literally half of them, so four of them were off-centered and we had to trim out and paint the holes so we could actually have access to the threaded inserts. One of them we even had to re-tap, so that turned into kind of a pain and it's kind of annoying, but we persevered and got through it. So now we are going to mount the actual side rails up to the top of the roof, so let's get started. We move the side rail assembly to the top of the van and loosely bolt it in place. We loosely bolted it in place because we needed to set the width of the roof rack with the cross braces. Cool. So side rails are up, looking good, it's taking shape. A few tips here is to loosen these two bolts if you need to, uh, to slide the mounting feet forward to back uh, if it's not quite lining up with the hole for the front of the van. So remember we took uh, measurements earlier and taped off where the mounting feet should be, and that should get you pretty close, but if you need to fine tune those, just loosen these up, uh, move the mounting foot, and then tighten it back down. The other tip is going to be to make sure that the distance from the front of the roof rack to the front of this mounting plate is the same on the driver's side and the passenger side. So we set ours to 10 and 3 quarter from the front of this mounting plate to the front of the roof rack on both sides so that the rack is gonna be squared up with the van for the rest of the install. Let's talk about this wind fairing for the third time in this video because we found a better way to do it. So we took these uh, side rail caps or the, uh, the fairing caps off the side rails um, because we found that it was easier to attach these to the actual wind fairing just on a tabletop because these require eight bolts to attach these side caps to the actual wind fairing and only two bolts to attach these to the side rails. So trying to spend less time on the ladder, just a little easier to build it on a tabletop as opposed to standing on the ladder. Uh, that's what we're doing this time around because we found it was actually the best way. Final answer. Let's bolt this together. We're going to attach the fairing and caps to the fairing um, and now these brackets are slotted so when you add them when you put them on initially don't tighten them down completely so that they can still move around a little bit so that we can have that adjustment so we're going to put that on and bolt it down
As we tighten this end cap down, we want this the end cap to be sitting on top of the fairing and then the end cap to be just perfectly flush with the outside of that fairing. We have the fairing end caps installed on the fairing at this point, and it looks pretty nice. So now that this part is assembled, we are going to take this up to the roof rack and mount these to the sides of the roof rails or the side rails for the third and should be the final time in this video. The fairing is now completely installed and I'm a huge fan of how just this, this looks with the angle, how it angles kind of in and down. It just looks really sleek and clean and I'm a big fan of that. But anyway, a few tips on the actual process here. Uh, first tip is going to be put a piece of cardboard right down here because you have a fair amount of adjustability on these two side bolts here where the fairing mounts to the side rails, which means that you can pitch this up or down a little bit forward or a little bit backward depending on uh, what you need in your own little uh, setup there. And that means that if you let this go all the way forward, it would actually sit on the paint. So just a little paint protection there. Hey, Future Nate here with a completed roof rack. So talking about adjustability of the fairing, we actually decided that it was best to adjust this fairing all the way down so that it actually sits on the roof of the van. And to do that, we wanted to protect the roof of the van. And so we added this gasket all along the front of the fairing. So it's a hard plastic gasket on the front and underneath is a round rubber gasket so that it doesn't scratch up the paint. We felt this better because it decreased a few vibrations as well as wind noise that was going on once we were driving this around from the wind getting up underneath the fairing and having turbulence back here in the panels. The other thing that we really liked about having the gasket and the fairing all the way down on the roof is it seems like just talking around the shop that it's probably going to keep wind from getting up underneath, which may decrease wind drag and may be a little bit better for just drivability and fuel economy. So that was a decision that we made. And so we dropped the fairing angle all the way down. And our next step is going to be to set the cross braces in between the side rails because that's actually what's going to set the width of the side rails. We installed these three cross braces into the roof rack and we're not really using the cross braces for anything right now. They'll hold the solar panels eventually, but their purpose right now is to set the width of the roof rack. We needed to have the distance from this side rail to the other side rail set for these cross braces, so why not just use the cross braces? So we put the T-nuts into the top of the 8020 and then pushed the side rails to where it's touching on both sides of this cross brace and bolted those down. And now our side rails are set perfectly uh, all the way down. And now we can tighten up the mounting feet to the actual van and finally secure this thing to the van. Once the 8020 and the mounting feet are tightened to their final torque, we then cover them with Dicor lap sealant. A little piece of tube around the sealant nozzle was helpful for getting under the side rail here. Since we had the sealant out, now was also a good time to drill our hole for our solar wire. Paint the edges. Put in our grommet, put the tape on the bottom of the roof entry gland, press it into place, and cover it with sealant. The goal here was to maximize the amount of solar panels and wattage that we could fit onto our transit. Now we have a few different sizes here. And if you stick around to the end of the video, I'm gonna talk about some of the stats and specs of these panels and how it works whenever these three different types of panels are in the same solar array. These panels are all from Rich Solar. This one is a 200 watt, this one is a 55 watt, and these ones are 35 watts. And this 200 watt, 
panel from Rich Solar has been on the market for quite a while and it's been kind of my go-to for a panel that gets mounted side to side on a van roof. It just fits really, really nicely. And these two I'm particularly excited about because they're brand new to the market. Um, we asked Rich Solar if they would be interested in making custom sized panels for our van, sure, but ultimately so that you guys could also have these same panels for the same functionality that we're having on our van. So these will be available to purchase. And the idea behind them was, is to have the 200 watt panels laterally, and then have this panel here with a max air fan, and then this panel on the other side as well. And then same thing with the air conditioner, panel, air conditioner, panel. So everything is nice, sleek, compact, and we can really utilize every single square foot on our van roof. So these rich solar panels, I'm really excited about them. I've been talking to them for months at this point. It's awesome to have them in hand, but I'm more excited to actually get the cross braces on there so we can get them pre-wired and get them on the roof. The Unaka roof rack comes with some spacers to put between the cross braces and the solar panels to lift them up so that they fit flush with the top of the roof rack. The bolts connecting the solar panels to the cross braces get anti-seize applied to them before tightening them to an appropriate torque. Then we measured from the ends of the panels to the ends of the cross braces on each end to make sure that the panels were centered. For the panels that don't go all the way across, like the 55s and the 35s, I have the 55s here, for example, the cross braces, they have a cutout here. And that's by design because whenever we designed this, the clearance between the fan and the air conditioner was pretty small. We made that as small as we could so that we could fit as much solar as we possibly could on there. So that meant that there wasn't enough room to have a bottom on here. So as you're kind of handling these, they flex a little bit, but that's okay. It's kind of how we made it. And you're just going to be able to see that come together and why that's important once we actually get this stuff up on the roof. Yeah. Now we have the solar panels mounted to the cross rails and it's starting to take shape and which is pretty exciting to kind of see like the vision come to life. So for these, we have the 200 watt panels up front and these two panels are gonna be wired in series. Behind that, we have the two 55 watt panels and we're gonna have the max air fan is right here. These two panels are going to be wired in series. And then lastly, we have this 35 watt panel and this 35 watt panel and the Nomadic air conditioner is going to live right here. And these two panels are going to be wired in series. So like solar panels are going to be wired in series with these three series strings wired in parallel going to our solar isolator. And that's roughly how this is going to work. And here is a diagram so you can kind of see on paper because I'm about to do the wiring, but it's probably gonna get a little messy. Now for the crossbars, you know, these get full angles. And like I said earlier, these are cut out. And you can kind of see that we have pretty low clearance between the fan and the air conditioner, which is why this doesn't have a full angle on the bottom there. And so this is doubled up and this piece adds stability to this part, which would ultimately be floating. Same with right here. So just lots of extra support to keep this lightweight, but also pretty rigid once it all gets all bolted in place. Now I'm going to do the wiring for this array. I'm gonna do as much of it on the ground as I can, make any jumpers that I need, so that whenever we move this all up to the roof, I'm having to spend less time on the ladder. Now I've made a video that shows you how to crimp and make new MC4 connectors and solar wires for jumpers and extensions in a separate video. And that's linked in the top right corner of your screen right now, as well as in the video description. Now is also the time to let you know that we have this entire array from the panels to the connectors to the wires available for sale through shop.explorus.life. We also have the roof rack available for sale through Unaka Gearco. Information for both of these can be found in the video description below.
The wires are secured to the bottoms of the solar panels with zip ties, so they are nice and protected from weather and the sun, even though the wire we're using is specifically designed to be exposed to the elements. So day two of this install, worked half a day on it yesterday, installing the cross rails to the solar panels, as well as doing all the pre-wiring on the ground, which I, I strongly recommend getting all of this stuff cleaned up nice and tidy. Now I wanna talk about how this array is actually wired. So kind of as we mentioned earlier, it's a series parallel array configuration with our like panels in series strings and all those series strings in parallel. So positives and negatives of neighboring solar panels here are wired together, creating a series string. Then the positive and negative of this series string is coming down here to our MC4 combiners on this end. For the next series string, is our 55 watt panels, positives and negatives of like panels wired together with the series string positives and negatives coming over here to the MC4 branch connector to wire in parallel with the previous series string. And lastly, the final 35 watt panels, positives and negatives are wired together with the positives and negatives of the series string coming over here and wiring to the MC4 combiners. Each of the positive wires gets a fuse, and we'll be talking about fuse sizing as well as array efficiency of a mixed solar array at the end of this video because it's going to get kind of math heavy and I don't have it memorized. But what we need to do now is we need to move all this stuff up to the roof. I've already installed the roof entry gland, and so now it's time to get on some ladders and actually put this stuff up on the roof. Two ladders are key for putting these panels on the roof. I handed the panels up to Eric and he handed them across to me on the other side of the van and they simply sit in place on top of the 80-20 side rails. Got it. Using the piece of styrofoam from the solar panel box was really helpful for getting the solar panels across the roof without scratching anything. Since we had to disconnect a few select MC4 connectors to move the panels to the roof, we had to reconnect those and put on a few additional zip ties. A few 8 inch sections of scrap 1x4 wedged into the side rails to tilt the panels roll. up made easy work with this. Lastly, we connected the MC4 combiners to the MC4 connectors that are connected to the wires going through the roof that would eventually get connected to the solar isolator and charge controller. Connecting these wires at this time makes the array live, so covering the other ends of these wires as well as covering the array with cardboard to keep the voltage down is important, or you can simply leave these connections disconnected for now until the array is connected to the isolator. The final step is simply securing the cross braces to the 8020 side rails with the cross brace hardware and T-nuts that we already slid into the 8020. These bolts got blue Loctite applied to them before tightening. Okay. Now that the array is installed, let's go over the math of how this array of mismatched panels operates. Here is how our solar panels are arranged on the roof. We have two 200 watt panels operating at 20.4 volts and 9.8 amps. Two 55 watt panels operating at 18.7 volts and 2.96 amps. And two 35 watt panels operating at 17.9 volts and 1.96 amps. The 200 watt panels are wired in series and matched panels wired in series get their voltages added together while their amperages remain the same, which gives us a 400 watt series string operating at 40.8 volts and 9.8 amps. The 55 watt panels are wired in series and matched solar panels wired in series get their voltages added together while their amperages remain the same, which gives us a 110 watt series string operating at 37.4 volts and 2.96 amps. The 35 watt panels are wired in series and matched solar panels wired in series get their voltages added together while their amperages remain the same, which gives us a 70 watt series string operating at 35.8 volts and 1.96 amps. 
Those three series strings are wired in parallel with all of their positives and negatives going to three to one MC4 combiners. Mismatched series strings of solar panels wired in parallel get their amperages added together while their voltages operate at the lowest available series string voltage, which gives us an array operating at 35.8 volts and 14.72 amps. And using Watt's law of watts equals volts times amps, we can see that 35.8 volts times 14.72 amps is 527 watts. Now, since we installed 580 watts of solar panels and are seeing a theoretical on paper output of 527 watts, we are sitting at almost 91% array efficiency. Now, the only way to get 100% array efficiency here would be to run each series string to its own charge controller, which is absolutely doable, but is more wire than I wanted to run and more charge controllers than I wanted to use in this system. For solar array fusing, using the same math as before, we have an array short circuit amperage of 2.13 amps plus 3.23 amps plus 10.2 amps, which gives us an array short circuit current of 15.56 amps. And since our solar array short circuit current is greater than our max series fuse rating of our panels, or at least two out of the three sizes, we will be putting MC4 fuses on the positive MC4 combiner, protecting the positive wires going to each series string. Now, technically we don't need a fuse on the wire going to the 200 watt series string since its max series fuse rating is greater than the array short circuit amperage. But since the other two need fusing, I didn't want this one to feel left out, so it's getting one. We've got 10 amp fuses for the 55 and 35 watt series strings, and a 20 amp fuse for the 200 watt series string. Now we are incredibly happy with how this turned out. And after our recent trip, 1600 miles across the country to Idaho, the roof rack and solar panels were incredibly quiet and didn't appear to negatively affect fuel mileage much at all. We are super excited to finally have the solution to be able to put solar panels on the sides of a max air fan and air conditioner, matching widths with a larger solar panel, which up until now hasn't really existed. Special thanks again to Rich Solar and Unaka Gearco for believing in the idea that we had and helping us bring it to life. Now, if you want the same roof rack and solar array set up as us, that would be awesome. And we have all of the information to help you do just that in the video description below. To get this project started, I immediately hopped into my CAD program or cardboard aided design program and started making a template. We'd been gathering cardboard for a few weeks at this point and had some nice big pieces from our nomadic air conditioner and rich solar panels that would set the base of this template. Now, I like to cover the big areas first and then work my way out to the small detail areas last. I simply use some Gorilla Tape to tape the pieces of cardboard together and just a tip here, but Start with a full roll so you're not being stingy with the tape. Once the template is made, we need to remove the template from the van and it's very, very important that the template stay as close to true size and shape as possible. Now there are loads of videos on YouTube about scribing small corners and such and I'm not going to try to teach any of that in this video, partially because I'm not particularly good at it, but if you need some pointers, look up videos on scribing cabinets baseboards, or crown molding to get you pointed in the right direction. Now I like using a scribing compass and a straight edge to make these detailed parts of the templates nice and tight. One of the positives of using cardboard here is if you mess it up, you can just cut it out, redo it, and retape it back in place once it fits. For the floor, we are using Zip System R sheathing, which is basically a half inch piece of OSB that has been mixed with resin, making it water resistive, which is laminated to a piece of one inch polyiso foam rated at R6.6. Now this is the same stuff that people use as the exterior sheathing on their houses up here in the mountains in Colorado. Now I've seen it used on houses for years and always thought it would make a good van floor. And then we saw AVC rig using it and knew that we had to give it a shot.
To fasten the three pieces of wood together, I half lapped the joints, which means that I took two inches off of the wood and two inches off of the foam and then overlapped the joint so that the wood of one panel was sitting on the insulation of the adjacent panel. These would eventually get glued together. Once the three pieces had their joints prepared, I laid the template on top and taped it down and started to trace the edges. I traced a bit outside of the template as it's always easier to remove material than it is to add it back. We cut all of the exterior straight edges with a circular saw and straight edge, and then cut all the details and corners with a jigsaw. Once the floor was cut to shape, it was time to set it aside for a bit and work on flattening out the van floor. There are little ridges and grooves in the van floor. Some are an inch and a half apart and some are more. Some are far enough apart that we wanted to fill the gaps so the floor was nice and solid when we walked on it. But in the true Explorer's Life fashion of something worth doing is worth overdoing, we decided to fill literally all the gaps. For this, we use strips of polyiso foam cut to width. Using a saw blade is kind of messy, and using a handheld box knife was resulting in less than straight cuts. So what did we do? Well, we gave OSHA the finger and lodged a razor blade into our table saw, set up a fence, and slid them through. Definitely had to pay attention to where the blade was in relation to my fingers, but this actually worked really, really well to cut all the foam to uniform widths. I also tried the hot knife here, but it was slower than I wanted. The gaps in the van floor were a bit under a half inch deep, so my half inch foam was a bit too tall. To trim these down to size, I got my hot knife and attached the wire attachment, shimmed up the knife on some washers to take off the proper amount, and slid all of the foam through. Now this actually took several hours, and during the time I was definitely regretting the tediousness, but now that it's all done, I'm glad I took the time because it definitely feels like it was done right. Now, how much R-value did these floor strips actually add to the insulation value of the floor? Well, we can take the total floor area divided by the square feet and then multiply that by the insulational coefficient of the polyiso hypotenuse for the rate. Actually, the real answer is... Don't care, couldn't care less. Goodbye. We were just using these as spacers to make the floor more sturdy. It's waterproof and adds a bit of extra insulation, sure, but that really wasn't the goal. Maybe some of the insulation nerds watching this video can calculate it all out for me. Once the strips were put into place, Steph came in for doing the honors of trimming off the ends of the foam spacers. Next would have been the time to add the PEX tubing throughout the floor for in-floor heating. And after mocking up a bit of a test piece to make sure that our plan would work, we actually determined that it wasn't going to work as well as we hoped for a few reasons. Number one, the wood floor did not spread the heat around its surface to be effective enough to distribute the heat from the pipe. Number two, we were opting for some super thin marine fabric flooring, which was not thick enough to fully conceal the tubing. And number three, it was going to take significant work with a router to inlay all of the pipes, which I felt would have decreased the structural integrity of the floor quite a bit. For these reasons, we had to make the decision to scrap the idea of in-floor heating for this build, which it's okay though, we still will have heating, so just stay tuned there. Next was time to move on to the L-Track. We planned out where we were going to put in the L-Track and made our cut marks. We cut the L-Track to length, drilled the holes with a hole saw in either end for the end caps, and then cut the grooves with a circular saw and pulled out the scrap wood.
The last step before putting the floor into the van was to cut our flooring to approximate size. Now we're using Sailrite cloth flooring, which is a bit of a plasticky waterproof fabric that seems super durable. We tested out a scrap piece by scratching it with a screwdriver and even spilling some hot sauce on it, and all four of us here in the shop were happy with its performance and it looks pretty great, which is also important. Next, we place the R sheathing floor into the van. We put glue on top of all the polyiso foam spacers so that the R sheathing floor wouldn't slide around once it was installed, and we also glued the pieces of the R sheathing together at this point. We let that sit overnight so the glue could cure and we wouldn't have any weird ridges or anything at the joints. The next day, we installed the Sailrite flooring. We rolled the flooring up and started spreading the glue with a trowel. One bucket of adhesive was plenty for this job, and going a little lighter on the adhesive was preferred, as it does tend to pool up a bit underneath the fabric if too much is used. We worked in three foot sections from the front all the way to the back. Once the fabric was laid out, we cut the holes for the L-Track and dropped them all into place. Next, we needed to make sure that the fabric was fully stuck to the adhesive. The instructions said to use a 45 pound flooring roller to push the flooring down. Now, we didn't have a 45 pound flooring roller and didn't really want to spend the money to buy a special tool when I am a special tool. Why buy a 45 pound roller when we have a 170 pound Nate and a piece of scrap PVC pipe? It worked pretty well. Next up is securing the L-Track through the floor. We wanted this L-Track to be as strong as it possibly could be because we're going to be adding a seat or two and also our cabinets are going to be attached to it. So we are going all the way through the floor of the van with these fasteners. Steph drilled a hole from the top. I deburred from the bottom. Steph vacuumed out the debris. I painted the hole. Steph put the stainless bolt through the L-Track. I put on the stainless fender washer and lock nut. Steph tightened the bolt from the top. and I cover the bottom with truck bed liner to prevent rust and leaks. And then we repeated that process about a hundred times. The flooring is looking great, but the unfinished edges look like hot garbage, so it's time to tackle all of those and make them look better and also be a bit more durable. For all of our edges, we are going to be using 1 16th inch aluminum angle. So an aluminum C-channel would have been perhaps better here, but I couldn't find any thin, non-structural aluminum in the proper size, so we're making an aluminum angle sandwich. We tackled the rear step of the floor first. I used a digital angle finder to find the angles of the rear step. The rear step is curved too much to simply curve the metal, so we decided to make the rear step in three straight edges. I found the angles to be 8 degrees off of straight, so we needed to make two relief cuts, each 4 degrees off of 90. I used a jigsaw to make the initial cut, and then a hacksaw to fine tune the cut, which allowed the angle to flex exactly as planned. And then I did the exact same thing on the other side. Now the aluminum was pretty scratched up from when we bought it and would only get worse as we used it. So we decided to hide the scratches with more scratches and we hit it with some 220 grit sandpaper, giving the aluminum a brushed look. We cleaned the aluminum off with some alcohol and put it in place for a test fit and all was good to go. 
We wanted to simply screw the trim piece down with some 3 quarter inch flat head screws, so we needed to countersink these so that they sat nice and flush. So Steph took the necessary measurements and used the drill press to countersink all of the holes where the screws would go. Next we did the exact same thing with the bottom piece of angle, just upside down. This one didn't require countersinking of the screws though, as it's just getting tightly wedged into place with the top piece of channel. We found that the bottom piece of angle was hitting the floor ribs, so I cut an inch off of the angle so it would fit better. Now this was a admittedly pretty sketchy cut, and I even felt that this one was a bit dangerous, but it is what it is, so all of you safety nerds can just back off. We've got good insurance here. With the bottom trimmed off, we slid it into place and then put the top piece in place as well, and then screwed the top piece to the floor, which wedged the bottom piece in place. If the bottom piece eventually wiggles free, we'll add some rivets to it. Now, I don't suspect that it will, but that's the plan if it needs it. Now, if I were better at welding, I would have welded the relief cuts and ground those down to flush, but a bit of sandpaper rounds over the edges so that they aren't sharp, and the back step trim piece is finished and looking admittedly better than expected. We moved on to the side step next, which we installed in nearly the same fashion as the back step. But we first had to finally make a decision on how wide we wanted our step to actually be. We decided just to make the step half the size as the OEM step, so we still had plenty of space to step, but also support a future kitchen and underfloor storage for a pair of sandals or something like that. We cut the cell right flooring to expose the wood, and then cut the zip sheathing with a jigsaw and a handsaw where the jigsaw didn't fit. And next was cutting the top and bottom aluminum angle to fit, nearly in the exact same manner as we did on the back step. This time we actually made full miter cuts though with our miter saw and our band saw to make the lip. Now this was just a ton of back and forth, just taking measurements on lengths and making sure that the angles were going in the right direction, and it really took me back to my last house remodel installing baseboards. Once all the pieces were cut, we used our drill press to countersink some screw holes in each piece, and then used our sander to give the aluminum a brushed appearance. Then we cleaned it off, clamped it in place, and screwed it down. Now these two pieces didn't stay together as well as the back one, so these got rivets along the whole front edge to make them nice and sturdy. And finally, we sanded down any sharp edges with a sanding sponge and cleaned it all off with some alcohol. Next up was making the underside of the step nice and pretty and give the corner of the step some added support. For this, we were simply making a bit of a veneer, if you will, with some scrap quarter inch and half inch plywood. I cut a piece of half inch plywood to fit the back part of the step and then cut some half inch plywood to make the protruding parts on the miter saw. I laid these pieces out inside the step to test the fit and mark their placements, and then pulled everything out and then glued and screwed them into place. And that was the structure. Now to make it pretty. For this, we simply glued the same flooring to the wood, and here's a montage of how we did that.
To finish up this part, I cut some aluminum C-channel, sanded it to match, and glued it onto the fronts of the step with just some super glue, and let it dry. And that's the side step. Pretty tedious, but it turned out fantastically. The front lip was definitely the easiest one here. We wanted to finish the lip for looks, sure, but we wanted to keep liquids from getting under the floor if, I mean, when we spill something up front. So we got some butyl tape and laid it in front of the front of the floor and then peeled off the backing. Then we pressed a piece of two inch angle into place and this was just going to be held down by the butyl tape and the top piece of angle that you'll see next. Then we measured the top piece and made some creative cuts where the B pillar was interfering. And then we countersunk some holes on our drill press, sanded to finish, and screwed it into place. And that's the front lip, all finished up and as water resistant as it can be. And the last piece of the flooring project is to make sure that we can access the mechanism that lowers our spare tire. We made a mark on the floor ahead of time so we knew where to drill and then used a hole saw to make our initial hole. Running the hole saw in reverse is key here to making sure that it doesn't mess up the carpet or skip out of the hole. Once the hole saw was through the top layer of wood and into the insulation, I took the bit out of the middle of the hole saw so that the teeth of the saw could get all the way down through the insulation without poking a hole in the bottom of the van floor. For the cover, we are using a marine deck plate and it simply drops into place and screws down with a couple of screws. Now we have access to our spare tire lowering mechanism with a nice and clean looking cover. And that's pretty much it. We are super happy with how it turned out. Now, this was not a fast project by any means. It took several weeks, but it was great to spend some time on it to come up with a flooring solution that we've been brainstorming for a long time at this point. It looks good, it's incredibly sturdy, it's water resistant, it's flat, and everything else a floor should be. Now we're excited to also have the L-Track for solidly attaching the cabinets to and even putting an extra seat or two for additional passengers. We are primarily using 3M Thinsula in this particular build. Uh, we've got 70 linear feet, uh, five feet wide. Um, in a few spots where it's not making sense to use Thinsula, we've also got Reflectix over there, as well as some rigid foam insulation. This is gonna be our primary insulation, and those are just gonna be supplementary as we need to. So I think that's pretty much it. You got anything else? Nope, I don't think so. Let's get started. To get started, we are going to insulate these ribs right here. Now these ribs are about four inches wide by five feet across. And so we're gonna cut four inch strips and leave them the full five foot length. Now there are five ribs going towards the front of the van here. And so we're gonna cut five of those strips. One. And to actually get the insulation through here, we're going to use fish tape and uh, what this is, is primarily used for electrical purposes, fishing wires through walls. Uh, this wire just comes out like that, and then we can feed this through that rib, attach the insulation on this side, and then pull it back through with the insulation, and then disconnect the insulation once it gets on this side, and then move on to the next one. 
Putting the insulation into tight cavities like the ceiling cross ribs was just about using the right combination of a screwdriver, a fish tape, and cussing. It was pretty tight on the sides, but doable. Working from the center out to the sides was also pretty useful here. We zip tied the insulation to the fish tape and pulled it through, helping it out with a screwdriver along the way. We just finished up the ribs and it was, it got easier as we went along. The first one was kind of a pain, the last one was less of a pain. So we're going to move on. The next thing we need to do is we need to fill in all of the other spots. So these big spots that are exposed, these smaller spots that are kind of exposed. And we're just going to be cutting the thin slit to fit, uh, spraying spray adhesive on top of thin slit and then pushing it into place. And that's, that's pretty much it. So let's get started. In the upper cavities, it was pretty easy to work in smaller sections, making sure that the insulation overlapped each other. As you'll see later in this video, this area is one of the hottest parts of the van when it's in the direct sunlight, so it's important to be thorough here. Once the squares were cut to shape, it was easy to spray a bit of spray adhesive behind the insulation onto the wall so that the insulation didn't sag. This was less messy than trying to spray the glue on a table or something like that we found. We put the insulation behind any wires so that we had access to them later as needed down the road. We also added an additional two inches or so on the tops and the bottoms so that the insulation could curve around a bit further to further insulate as well as keep the insulation in place better. Next we focused on the larger panels. This was the same as before, we just cut the insulation to size and glued it into place. A bit tedious but not difficult. It was nice to be working with something where the measurements didn't need to be exact. Just measure and then add an inch or two and then stuff it into place. The front ceiling of the van behind the headliner is another really hot area of the van since the sun beats down on it directly. A lot of builders install this stuff with the black side to the inside of the van, but after spending a bit of time looking through the manufacturer's instructions, it appears that the direction doesn't really matter. So we opted for putting the white side to the inside of the van for two reasons. Number one, it seemed easier to work with. And number two, Grace said that she was going to quit if we added more black to the inside of the van, and I will say the white on the inside of the van sure does make lighting for videos easier. In our Sprinter back in the day, we used rigid foam insulation throughout the build, and with the weird curve of the ceiling, we actually never got around to insulating behind the headliner, which was a pain point for that build. This time around, we were able to stuff thin slit into every nook and cranny behind the headliner. We even insulated the headliner itself while we had it out, so that area actually has a double layer. For the ceiling pieces, we worked from the center to the edges. It was simply easier to keep everything lined up nice and easy that way. Insulating the walls was the same thing as the ceiling for the most part. More cutting, more gluing, more patchwork. It's important to find somebody that's super detail oriented and persistent to help with this part if you're like me and have a tendency to say that's good enough too early. There is nearly no insulation behind the door panels, so we decided to add some for both thermal and sound insulation here. We took off the door panels, hard to see. traced the insulation, stabbed holes for the trim clips, marked out all the holes, and then reconnected and reattached the door panel. And through the power of movie magic, our double insulated headliner is reinstalled. How about a little finished product tour of the insulation here? So, got all the insulation wrapped up. 
We have some furring strips up for a uh, project we've already moved to, so stay tuned. But I think it's worked out pretty good. In here, we kind of overlapped everything the best we could in all of these spots. So right in here in particular, uh, peel that back and you can see more insulation back behind this little piece back here. So there's a bit of overlap all throughout here. We also added insulation behind the headliner up here. This kind of made it a little bit of a tight fit, trying to get the headliner back in, but with a little bit of persistence, we were able to get it back on. Same thing over here. So headliner is nice and insulated. That's nice. Nets, pretty much it on the ceiling. We ended up just like cutting an X around the max air fan here. So these will just get folded back, folded back, folded back and folded back. And that is pretty much how that works. So let's do something else here and use a thermal camera and kind of see how this is actually looking. So the red spots are gonna be the hotter spots. So as we're looking around, the black ring around the window is probably the hottest spot on this wall here, which is to be expected. Insulation is doing pretty good. The hottest part of the van up here, you know, we're looking at 93, 95 degrees. In this cavity right above the uh, the window, that's a spot that we haven't insulated just yet. We have to run one more wire through there. And so we left it. So you can see inside of there, there's one little spot that is registering 120 degrees. So pretty hot inside of there. So once we insulate it, it should be down about 90 degrees like we're seeing down there. Here's a fun angle as well. You can see right there, that red strip in the insulation that's sort of where the headliner ends and where the roof rack begins. So you can actually see where the roof rack is covering this, the roof uh, with all the solar panels up top. So I think it turned out pretty good. We can add insulation kind of as we go, as we add walls and everything like that. But we're pretty happy with how that turned out. So it is 1021 on Monday morning. We just got back from the lumber yard. Uh, got entirely too many dollars worth of lumber. It's way too expensive. Uh, but anyway, this week we're doing walls and ceiling. We have five days to get all this installed. And if we don't get it done in five days, we have to move on to the next project. So we're gonna be taking these five days to get all the furring strips, all the L-Track up, all the panels mounted, dry fit, finished, and then remounted. So. You ready to get started? Let's do it. We started this project by measuring and cutting all of our 1x4 furring strips. The L-Track and wall panels will both mount to the furring strips. With Open Roads Fest coming up, we were on a tight schedule here. Day two of the wall panel installation. So day one, we got a little bit of the furring strips put up, um, but we did run into a few issues. The main issue that we ran into yesterday was trying to drill through hardened steel on the van. So spots like right here, broke a few drill bits, ended up having to go get some cobalt drill bits and learned that drilling slower through that worked a lot better. But if y'all have any tips for drilling through hardened steel, please leave them in the comments. And this morning we will finish up temporarily mounting the furring strips to get them to their proper lengths and get them ready to mark their mounting holes.
We just finished up the furring strips and getting them all temporarily secured to the wall. A few tips that we found on the hardened steel is to use a really, really small cobalt drill bit. We ended up using a 1 16th inch drill bit uh, to make the initial hole uh, into the steel. And then we ended up making it bigger with a fairly small step bit. I'll put links to both of these in the video description. So the next step is going to be temporarily mounting and cutting or <laughs> permanently cutting and temporarily mounting the l track uh, we're going to tack it at each end and then we're going to drill holes at each of these spots in the l track through the one by four and through the metal of the van once we get all of those holes drilled on this entire wall we're going to put plus nuts into each of the holes in the metal of the van and these are going to secure this to the metal of the van nice and secure. In the spots that we can't put plus nuts, we're going to use T-nuts on the back sides of the 1x4s so that we're still grabbing a hold of this wood for added security. So we're still running behind schedule, uh, but that's the plan and we're going to get working. day three day three today so we are still just ever so slightly behind schedule we couldn't catch up from yesterday we actually had to pull uh, Chad in on the project yesterday and he's gonna be helping out today so this is the grand introduction to Chad to the channel he's our warehouse manager so he is doing all of the fulfillment so if you've ordered anything from shop.explorers.life he's likely been uh, doing that so everybody in the comments say hi Chad so he is going around and doing all of the hole drilling right now for the remaining pieces of l track and everything like that. And also, I whacked the fuck out of my eye earlier today. <laughs> so I was drilling uh, one of the holes, and I, had, I was really I was I was in it. I was uh, I was involved with this uh, the drilling of this hole, and the drill caught and just whacked me in the face and. There's nothing I could do about it. I felt like I'd get punched. But anyway, that's how my day is starting. So uh, that being said, I think I'm gonna go operate a miter saw. And despite my rapidly swelling face, we managed to drill all of the holes through the furring strips and through the van support ribs. Once they were all drilled, we removed the furring strips to prep for plus nuts. We're gonna be securing the l track and the walls to the walls of the van using plus nuts. And so we wanted to try out a couple of different tools uh, to make this job easier. I think we've got around 400 spots in the van that we need to put plus nuts. So we wanted to try to make this a little bit easier. So the first tool that we're going to try out is uh, this Astro 1450 uh, manual tool. And then the second one is a pneumatic uh, air gun tool and I'll demonstrate how each of these work. I'm just gonna put the plus nut on and screw it into place just until it touches. Then we're gonna put that in the hole and then we're just going to squeeze this closed. And then we're just gonna repeat that process until it is all the way tight. Cool, and then you're just going to go until it's just tight uh, you don't want to muscle it too much. So now we're going to take this tool out, just back that bolt out. So now we're going to do the exact same thing with the pneumatic tool. And so this is connected to an air compressor. Um, it's currently set at about 90 PSI, uh, which is what's recommended in the instruction manual. So we're going to put the plus nut on the end of the gun. Tighten that up, put that into the hole. And then we're just going to press the button to go forward. And you can kind of hear when that gun stops. Since it's set to the correct PSI, it's not going to over tighten itself. Then we're gonna reverse it. And that one's done. So now you can see how all of these are 
set in there. Then our bolts are going to go through the L track, through the furring strips, and screw right into these plus nuts. We're gonna be using plus nuts in the walls wherever we can, but there are some spots like right here that just spans a pretty good distance that there's nothing back here to put a plus nut into. So in those spots, we're gonna be using T-nuts. So that'll go just on the back of the furring strip and the bolts will go through that instead of through a plus nut. Um, where we are doing plus nuts though, we do need to make the holes that we've already drilled a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna be drilling those holes out putting a little shot of paint in them for rust prevention and then setting the plus nuts. Now, as you saw from our demo, the pneumatic plus nut tool was 1000% faster so we just use that tool to install all of our plus nuts. So Steph is in there working on the plus nuts and Chad is drilling some more of the holes I am in here, finishing up the furring strips for all of our mounting hardware. So what that means on my end is we're taking our plus nuts and I am countersinking on the back of the board where there's that little flange so that it sits nice and flush across there once it's mounted on the wall. And on the other ones with the spots we can't get a plus nut through the metal, I'm putting a T-nut, and that T-nut simply gets smashed in there with a hammer. The other thing I'm doing here is any spot that this piece of wood butts up to another piece of wood, like a vertical here, I'm gonna put pocket holes in this end of the wood, just by using this Craig pocket hole jig. And that is going to get all of this tied together in the van wall. And it's going to be probably the most secure thing that I've potentially ever built. So I'm gonna to get to work on all of this and try to catch up with them in the van. We have all of the T-nuts and plus nuts put into their proper spots. And now the next step is going to be to put the furring strips back on the wall with the L-Track attached, and we're gonna use these black bolts to secure that to the wall there. So morning of Thursday, day four, uh, we have all of our L-Track installed, L-Track and Furring Strip. We wrapped that, that up yesterday and wow, what a long day yesterday was. So about quitting time yesterday, I was kind of tired and frustrated at a problem that we were uh, having and ultimately just taking too long. And the team told me to quit being lazy and we freaking rallied and we got some fajitas and some beer and we worked until like 9.30 last night. So we're all pretty tired this morning, but uh, Chad and Stephanie are working on the panels uh, that are actually going to be mounted up to the furring strips in the L-Track as we speak, and they're waiting on me to, uh, to start cutting, so I'm going to get to work.
day 865 of walls. Uh, no, day five of walls. So yesterday we got all of the wall panels cut and fit. So they are in their proper places. The only thing that we didn't get done on the wall panels yesterday, cutting out the, the spaces for the windows. So that's what Nate is working on right now. Um, he's also working on getting the window jams ready to go. Then what I'm doing is going through and putting all of the screw holes into the wall panels where they're going to live. So we're actually not going to upholster these walls. What we're gonna do is just sand these really nice and leave them natural. And then we're going to put a furniture polish finish on them. So this one is completely done. It's been sanded, it's been polished. Uh, it has all of the screw holes. It is completely ready to go on the wall. So I'm gonna keep working through all of this. The next thing to work on is the two wall panels that are surrounding the windows. And before we actually cut those holes out or get those mounted up, we need to install our window jams that span the distance from the window to the wall. These are actually made by Satsang Vanworks, which is the sponsor of this week's video. So special thanks to Satsang Vanworks for making an awesome product that kind of solves a problem as well as for sponsoring this video. We heard of these whenever we did our Arctic Turn windows because they make these window jams specifically for the Arctic Turn windows. So this gets mounted to the spacer that we've already installed whenever we did the windows. The wall panel gets over the top of that and then the window blind for the Arctic Turn windows mounts to the front of this window jam with our bug screen and our blackout curtains on that. But this needs to be mounted with furring strips on the top and the bottom. The other issue that we're going to run into, the transit body is not parallel to the interior panels. So this is actually going to be tapered a bit. So once we secure this to the window and this to the furring strips, it's going to sit like this, a little bit off kilter like so. So once we get this in there, we're gonna to have to mark this line and then we're going to have to cut that out. The jam will taper, but the front will sit flush with the front of the wall so that our window blinds look nice and neat. That's kind of confusing and a hard concept for me to grasp. So we're just going to do it, figure it out, and show you the end product. We repeated that same process to the other window as well. Now it's time to work on our middle panels, which will sit flush against those window jams. We traced out the window from the exterior of the van and then cut out the hole with a jigsaw. Wow. And it was a perfect fit. So day six, we said we were gonna get finished in five days and that was lofty, we knew that, but it just didn't happen. So we worked a little bit over the weekend. We got the entire driver's side wall completely wrapped up. Today, we are going to do the ceiling, as much of it as we can. We have to make our cutouts for our nomadic air conditioner and our max air fan and our puck lights. And that is the plan for the day. So let's get started. The process here is the same as the walls. We mounted our furring strips and L-Track with plus nuts where we could, and T-nuts everywhere else. The ceiling L-Track has fewer connection points to the van support ribs than the walls, but we won't be hanging hammocks, seats, or anything like that from the ceiling. The ceiling L-Track will be used in conjunction with the wall L-Track to hang cabinets from, which this will work perfectly for and will be plenty strong. This is the last day of walls and ceilings um, for part one of this video. There's gonna be a part two, which we'll talk about here in a bit, but I wanted to show you what we accomplished yesterday. So we finished up all the furring strips and the L-Track across the ceiling. So we've got long piece of L-Track uh, front to back, 
and then a shorter piece side to side right down the middle and airplane noises. Okay, so <laughs> the panels are gonna fit on the ceiling just the same way as they were on the walls. And that's what we're going to work on today is the panels to fit here and here. Up here, Grace had the idea to actually capture this front furring strip in between this little lip right here and the roof on each side. And that was able to span the distance so that this angle isn't quite as severe. And we're able to put our panels up there and then also up here that'll go down into the headliner and trim this out really, really nicely. And this is all pretty secure for what we are going to be asking for it to do. So we have both of the panels cut for the middle section of the ceiling with our pneumatic air conditioner hole cut and our max air fan hole cut. We just took measurements and, uh, and cut those out. And now we need to cut holes for all of the puck lights that we have. Now we have five pairs of puck lights. We've got 100 inches of space to work with, which means that each pair is going to be 25 inches apart. So we're taking our measurements and then cutting our hole with a two and a quarter inch hole saw for ours. And if you are cutting thin wood like this, run a hole saw in reverse and it may take a little bit longer, but it's gonna make a cleaner hole. So I'm gonna get started on this and we'll check back in once they're installed. Once our tin holes were cut, Steph sanded and finished the ceiling panels. We brought the panels into the van, pulled out the wires, wired and set our puck lights and screwed our panel in place. Before we installed the next panel, we had to swap out our nomadic air conditioner bolts for some shorter ones so that they didn't come down so far and interfere with the ceiling panel. Next, it was time to finish wiring our nomadic air conditioner. We screwed the control panel to the cover, attached it to the faceplate, and attached that whole assembly to the air conditioner body. Next, we tackled the Max Air Fan interior trim ring. We measured how much was needed to be removed, and then cut it off with a jigsaw, then sanded the edges, and placed it in the ceiling with the screws that came with the Max Air fan. Now this is the part in the build where we drilled and cut out the holes for our USB, 12 volt, and 120 volt outlets. For the USB and 12 volt outlets, we simply used a hole saw to cut the hole, connecting the wiring exactly as we showed back in episode 13 and 14 of this series, and attached the cover and outlet to the wall. For the 120 volt outlets, we had to add an additional one and a half inch furring strip behind the panel, which we added with pocket screws. The outlet simply attaches to the furring strip with the teeth on the side of the box. And then the outlet gets wired just like we showed back in episode 18 of this series. Then we measured and cut the outlet opening in the panel reinstall the panel, and put on the faceplate. So three weeks have passed and we are finished with Open Roads Fest and are wrapping up all of our halfway finished projects. Now before Open Roads Fest, we finished up the driver's side and half of the ceiling. And we went to Open Roads Fest, finished up a few little things, and now we've finished up the ceiling and Steph is now currently putting the final touches on the passenger side. So here's a recap of what we've been working on for the last week. With this side, it went a lot faster the second time around since we already kind of knew what we were doing. We measured and cut the furring strips and Steph temporarily mounted them in place using our cobalt bits to make pilot holes as necessary. Then we cut down the L-Track to their proper lengths and temporarily mounted the L-Track to drill the holes through the L-Track to mark our plus nut locations. And then we took down the L-Track and Chad enlarged the holes for the plus nuts. 
And then we sprayed all the holes with Rust-Oleum to prevent rust and installed all the plus nuts. And then we countersunk the back of the fairing strips for the plus nut lips and remounted the fairing strips in l tracks for good. And then we tacked the Satsang window jam into place and mounted fairing strips around it. And then we traced the wall taper onto the window jam, cut the window jam to fit the taper, and reinstalled the window jam. And then we mounted our fairing strips for our 120 volt outlets. Next, we dry fit our ceiling panels and cut our wall panels to fit. And then we traced our window cutout from the outside of the van and cut the window hole to match. And then we sanded, finished, and remounted our wall panels and hung the Arctic Turn blinds over the window. And lastly, we installed our USB outlets, 120 volt outlets, and Anderson ports for cabinet lighting and power. And we are super happy with how this turned out. The black on birch look was everything we were hoping for, and the l track is going to give us near infinite places to mount cabinets, beds, shelves, and pretty much anything else to the walls. The switched and constant power connectors for cabinet power and lighting are also great, and you'll see much more of these as we get into our cabinetry in upcoming episodes. The switches, fuse panel, and Victron Touch 70 GX ended up looking incredibly clean mounted right above the sliding door for easy access. And lastly, our Arctic Turn windows framed by our Satsang Vanworks window jams brings tons of natural light into the space but still gives us the option for having bug screens or blacking the space out for privacy or sleeping. Now we still need to tackle the doors, trim, and other problem areas, but those will come later as we need to step away from the walls for a minute for all of our sanity and move on to some other projects like power and plumbing. And these are coming up next, so stay tuned. Hey everybody, it's Nate from Explorers.life. We teach people how to build DIY campers. In this video, we are showing you start to finish how we installed this complete DIY electrical system in our Ford Transit camper van. Now this video is going to cover wiring the battery bank, building the enclosure, wiring the battery heater, the Lynx shunt and Lynx distributor, rooftop solar, ground deploy solar, the MultiPlus inverter charger, the chassis ground, 24 volt air conditioning, dual 12 volt fuse blocks, wiring shore power, alternator charging, wiring the Serbo GX and Touch 70, securing the batteries to the van, and system programming and testing. Now, if at any point in time you want to skip to a specific section of the video, we've put timestamps in the video timeline below so you can do just that. Now, two things before we get started. First, there are a ton of resources that accompany this video like wiring diagrams, parts lists, plans, 3D models, and all kinds of other fun stuff that you'll want to check out the video description for. And secondly, this video is kicking off the expansion of shop.explorers.life that we launched last year. In the past, we've pushed everybody to Amazon to buy the parts necessary to build these systems, but unfortunately, we didn't have any control over quality or them keeping items in stock. So we have brought all of that in-house, and Steph has been hard at work sourcing the parts and components for the system you're seeing today, and a few new systems that we've just launched for larger systems, smaller systems, and systems for 30 amp and 50 amp OEM RVs. Now, enough with the sales pitch. Let's get started. To start this project, we needed to wire our two 12 volt Battleborn GC3 batteries together to make a 24 volt battery bank. Now these batteries are the backbone of this system, providing 6.8 kilowatt hours of power storage, which is 270 amp hours at 24 volts or 540 amp hours at 12 volts. Now these batteries are also self-heating since we travel for snow skiing and live up in the mountains of Colorado, where temps as low as negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit are typical in the winter. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. Two heated 12 volt, 270 amp hour Battleborn GC3 lithium iron phosphate batteries. The Explorers Life two battery, one aught 24 volt battery bank wiring kit, which includes wire, wire lugs, 
heat shrink, and we also need the terminal fuse and terminal fuse holder from our 24 volt one aught Lynx distributor wiring kit. Let's start wiring. To make a 24 volt battery bank from two 12 volt batteries, we need to wire the positive from one battery to the negative terminal of the other battery. And to do this, I flipped one of the batteries upside down so that the positive and negative terminals were near each other. These Battleborn batteries can be mounted in any orientation, which is a huge perk for giving us mounting flexibility in these systems. With the batteries in position, I could unscrew the terminal covers. Now these batteries are internally heated so that they continue to function during extreme cold temperatures, but we still have to wire them up externally, and to do that, we need to access the heater screw terminal, which is under this mounting foot. Once we have access to the heater screw terminal, we need to make the heater wire. So, I crimped a ring terminal onto our small gauge wire, secured the ring terminal in place to the heater screw, and then replaced the battery mounting foot. Now it was time to make the battery interconnect wire to make these two 12 volt battle barn batteries into a 24 volt battery bank. So, I cut, stripped, crimped, and heat shrinked a one aught by 5 16 inch wire lug onto each end of a short piece of wire and put three quarter inch heat shrink on each end. Then I sanded and cleaned the lugs and cleaned the battery terminals with alcohol to get rid of any manufacturing oil, dirt, or grime. Next, I bolted the lugs directly to the battery terminals with the hardware included with the batteries. Now, it's super important to make sure that there's nothing between the lugs and the battery terminals like heat shrink or washers. And then tighten that to spec with a half inch wrench and socket. And here's how the battery terminal connection should look. The lug should be directly in contact with the battery terminal with washers on each side. And lastly, we can replace the battery terminal covers. Now that our batteries are wired together, it's time to mount these two batteries to their base. And that's coming up next. Now that our two 12 volt Battleborn batteries are wired together into a 24 volt battery bank, we need to mount the batteries to a base so that they stay put during travel. I measured out a piece of birch plywood to fit the bottom of the batteries and cut it to fit. Next I made the tongue part of our tongue and groove joint that would eventually fit into our 8020 base. I simply ran the wood across the table saw until I had a protrusion that would fit nicely into the slot of the 8020 and be flush on the bottom. A router and router table would have been much easier and cleaner here, but alas, I don't have a router table yet. So the table saw and chisel method worked good enough for who it's for. Next I marked and drilled the holes for the battery mounting feet. I sanded and finished the wood with paste wax. And then we secured the batteries to the wood with number 10 by two inch long machine screws and stop nuts. With these screws in place, our Battleborn batteries are now firmly attached to the base and effectively each other. With the batteries firmly mounted to the base, we can now move on to building the 8020 enclosure that will secure the batteries to the body of the van and protect the rest of the components. And that's coming up next. Now that we've secured the batteries to the platform, it's time to start building our aluminum extrusion enclosure. Now, it's also worth noting that I use the term 8020 and aluminum extrusion pretty interchangeably in this video. Aluminum extrusion is just the general name for this type of material, and 8020 is a brand name. Now we need to flip our batteries over so that they are right side up, but first we need to make the base of the aluminum extrusion enclosure to slip it into place. Our enclosure started with a plan. Steph and I spent a few days brainstorming what the enclosure would look like and how it would fit into the future layout of the van, and we came up with this design in SketchUp. Now, if you want this SketchUp file, be sure to check out that info in the pinned comment below this video. With the plan in place, we ordered the aluminum extrusion. We ordered our aluminum extrusion from T-Nuts because they have pretty quick turnaround and they will also pre-cut and machine the pieces for us, which saves a lot of time, effort, and wasted material for minimal cost. It's super nice to have the material show up at our door, 95% of the way finished, and all we have to do is make a few strategic access holes and bolt it together. To bolt the extrusion together, we had T-nuts tap threads in the ends and then counterbore access holes in adjacent ends, and the pieces simply bolt together like so. 
This method is super strong, but maybe even more importantly, it keeps everything very square and flush with each other. There are a few places though that we had to drill our own access holes. In some places, the bolts needed to be halfway down the extrusion, so we had to do that ourselves. We used a drill press for this, but you can absolutely just use a hand drill for this as long as you can accurately drill straight up and down. With the aluminum extrusion base completed, we slid the base around the wood platform and then tightened it into place. Now that the battery base is complete, we can go ahead and flip the whole assembly over and wire the other side of the battery heater while we still have access to it. And that's coming up next. Now that the battery bank is secured to the base of the enclosure, it's time to wire the other battery heater circuit before we lose easy access to the terminal screw. I took the positive battery terminal cover and the mounting foot off of the battery to gain access to the screw terminal for the heater of this battery. I grabbed the other end of the heater wire that I attached to the other battery and crimped a ring terminal onto it. Next I made a short piece of wire with a number 8 ring terminal on one side and a 5 16 inch terminal on the other side. I put the two number 8 ring terminals in place and tightened them to an appropriate torque. The other end of this short wire goes to the positive battery terminal. Now is also a good time to install the terminal fuse that comes with our Lynx distributor wiring kit. I put the bolt that comes with the batteries through the battery terminal, fuse holder, and small 5 16 inch ring terminal and tighten to spec. Now I'm going to put the positive terminal cover back in place. It's important to keep the negative battery terminal cover in place the entire time during this step because touching the positive and negative terminals at the same time with my wrench or ratchet would cause a lot of heat very quickly. Now that the battery heating circuit is complete, we can continue building the aluminum extrusion enclosure and that's coming up next. Now that we have the battery heating circuit complete, we can reinstall the mounting foot and continue building the aluminum extrusion enclosure. Building the rest of the aluminum extrusion enclosure was more of the same concept for building the base. We just used our SketchUp file to go in a systematic method for attaching all of the extrusions into place. Once we got to this piece on the front of the enclosure, it was time to secure the tops of the batteries to the extrusion. Battleborn makes brackets for the GC3 batteries and we're attaching those brackets to the aluminum extrusion with one inch long quarter by 20 carriage bolts and stop nuts. The other ends of the brackets get secured to the batteries with the hardware included with the brackets. For the lid support piece, we slid T-nuts into the end of the extrusion, which the hinges would eventually bolt to. The T-nuts we used could have actually been dropped in from the top as we found out later, but it goes in from the end as well. Next, we built the lid in much of the same way we built the rest of the enclosure. Now this process involves a ton of putting pieces together and taking them apart to make it all fit. It's a bit of a tedious process, but persistence and patience pays off here. We found it best to build all of the 8020 first to make sure that everything bolts together properly before making the panels. Now we are using clear acrylic panels for this enclosure because we plan on taking it to camper van shows and we'll be using this system as a teaching tool. If we weren't using it for that purpose, we could really use any other type of sheet goods like colored acrylic or even plywood. The panels simply slide into place in most places, but in a few spots, the panels needed to be notched out for clearance. Now this is my first time working with acrylic and it actually handled similar to wood in most regards. I pretty much just used normal woodworking tools here. The acrylic was more brittle than wood and it threw a lot more melted plastic shrapnel when cutting it, but I didn't have to upgrade to a plastic specific blade or anything like that. Once the panels were made, we could attach the lid. We put the lid in place, dropped our T-nuts into the top piece of extrusion, and bolted the hinges together. To keep the lid closed, we're using these black chest latches. 
For these, we marked the location of the holes, drilled the holes, and tapped threads into them, and then screwed the latches to the enclosure. The last thing we wanted to do was add some gas struts to keep the lid open and to slow the lid down as it closed. Unfortunately, I bought the wrong size of gas strut, and my gas strut mounting design just didn't really work, so this enclosure is not getting gas struts for now. And I'll have to come up with another solution later, but I'll be sure to put the updated solution in the pinned comment below this video once I figure it out. Now that the enclosure is all built, we can set it aside for a bit and install the rest of the components on the wall of the van, and that's coming up next. Now that the enclosure is built and our battery bank is wired, we can move on to wiring all of the Victron components, starting with the Link Shunt and Link's Distributor. The Link Shunt is a measuring device that measures the amperage leaving or going back into the battery bank. Think of this like the fuel gauge for your battery bank. The Link's Distributor is a system of positive and negative bus bars with fuse holders for the positive bus bars. This is the absolute best way to get nice and organized fused wire runs with minimal electrical connections into a system. Now here's a rundown of these two products and how to install them. These products come with covers that can be removed to access their internal components. Let's start with the Link Shunt, which has a space for an ANL fuse, which protects the Link's distributor, and acts as a backup to the terminal fuse that we installed on the battery bank and a shunt, which is actually the measuring device that I mentioned earlier. The Lynx distributor has a positive bus bar, a negative bus bar, four fuse holders per Lynx distributor, little breakaway separators that we don't need, and wire separators that snap into place or out of the way as necessary. A second Lynx distributor can simply be added to the first Lynx distributor if additional few slots are needed, which in this video we will indeed need the additional spots. So I can remove the hardware, clean the electrical points of contact with alcohol, put the second Lynx distributor in place, and reattach and retorque the hardware. The Lynx shunt mounts to the first Lynx distributor in the exact same method. Clean the points of contact, remove the hardware, put it in place, put the hardware back in place, and tighten it down. The Link shunt powers the lights inside of the Link's distributors with the data cables provided with the Link's distributors. They simply attach to their respective spots in each device. These cables are a bit too long, so I'm just coiling them up and out of the way a bit so they don't hang down out of the Link system so far. Now we can put our fuse in place in the Lynx distributor by removing the hardware, cleaning the fuse, dropping the fuse into place, and replacing and retorquing the hardware. The fuse should be directly in contact with the Lynx shunt with no washers or anything in between. Now it's ready to mount to the wall. Now that our Link shunt and both Lynx distributors are all connected to each other and mounted to the wall, it's time to wire our first solar charge controller into the system. And that's coming up next. Now that I mounted the Lynx distributor to the wall, I'm going to show you how to wire the first solar charge controller in the system to the Lynx distributor. This charge controller is responsible for taking the 580 watt solar array on the roof of this van that operates at a bit over 40 volts and regulating that voltage down to the 29 volts that it takes to charge a 24 volt battery bank. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. The Victron Smart Solar MPPT-130, the Explorus Life MPPT-130 wiring kit, which includes wire, ferrules, wire lugs, heat shrink, a mega fuse, and mounting screws. The Victron Smart Solar MPPT-130 Solar Charge Controller has six terminals we will be using. Battery positive, battery negative, solar array negative, solar array positive, an equipment ground screw, and the VE Direct port 
for system communications with the Serbo GX. Now let's start wiring. We first want to temporarily mount the charge controller to the wall so that we can take our measurements for our wires, which involves securing the charge controller with two number 14 screws in the pilot holes that we pre-drilled. Next, we needed to make our wires. To make our positive wire, we will cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink a six gauge by five sixteenths inch wire lug onto one end of our red six gauge wire, and then measure, cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink a six gauge ferrule onto the other side. To make our negative wire, we are doing the exact same thing, just with a black wire and black heat shrink. I crimped a six gauge ferrule onto one end, in a 6 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug onto the other, both with half inch black heat shrink. Lastly, to make our equipment ground wire, I crimped a 6 gauge by quarter inch wire lug onto one side of the wire and a 6 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug onto the other end, both with half inch black heat shrink. Now we can wire the charge controller to the Lynx distributor. I started with the equipment ground wire because the screw is on the side of the charge controller and it's kind of hard to get to, requiring the removal of the charge controller from the wall. I remove the equipment ground screw, place the serrated washer, lug, washer, and lock washer in place, and then secured all of that with the equipment ground screw. The other end of this will get attached to the MultiPlus equipment ground stud later in this video, so I'm just going to leave it hanging for now. Next, we can clean off our positive ferrule with a bit of alcohol and put it into the positive battery terminal of the MPPT, tighten to spec, and then clean the negative ferrule and put it into the negative battery terminal and tighten that to spec. Lastly, I'll ensure that there is no insulation between the ferrule and the terminal. Now that I've connected the wires to the charge controller, we can connect the battery positive and negative wires to the Lynx distributor. I'm going to pull the wire separator out of the way for now, and then I'm going to loosen and remove the nuts, lock washers, and washers from the furthest rightmost terminals of the Lynx distributor with a 13 millimeter deep well socket. Next, I will clean the electrical points of contact with the bit of sandpaper and alcohol as appropriate and put the negative lug on the negative bus bar stud in the Lynx distributor. It's important to ensure no insulation is interfering between the lug and bus bar at this point. Then I will replace the washer, lock washer, and nut on the stud, tighten it to the manufacturer's torque spec, and replace the wire separator. Next, I will clean my electrical points of contact on the positive wire and fuse, put my mega fuse in place, put the positive lug in place on the bottom stud of the fuse holder, and then replace the washers, lock washers, and nuts on the bus bar and fuse holder and tighten to spec. Now that the charge controller for our roof-mounted solar array is connected to the Lynx distributor, now we can wire the charge controller to our solar isolator. I already put 10 gauge ferrules and 3 8 inch heat shrink from the Explorus Life solar array wiring kit on these wires coming from the solar isolator ahead of time since they are pretty short and hard to work with once the charge controller is in place. The red wire goes into the PV positive terminal and the black wire goes into the negative PV terminal, and both get tightened to spec. It's crucial to ensure that the ferrule's insulation is out of the way and is not interfering with the connection here. Now that I have the first charge controller installed, it's time to move on and install the second charge controller for our ground deploy solar array, which is coming up next. Now that I've installed the first charge controller of this system for the rooftop solar array, I'm going to show you how to wire a second charge controller into the same system for our ground deploy solar array. This charge controller is for a ground deploy solar array that we can place away from the van for supplemental charging while parked at camp. 
This charge controller can handle a solar array of up to a massive 1700 watts of solar panels. It can handle an array voltage of up to 250 volts and regulate that down to the 29 volts that it takes to charge a 24 volt battery bank. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the install. The Victron Smart Solar MPPT 25060 and the Explorers Life MPPT 25060 wiring kit, which includes wire, ferrules, wire lugs, heat shrink, a mega fuse, and mounting screws. The Victron Smart Solar MPPT 25060 solar charge controller has six terminals that we'll be using battery positive battery negative, solar array negative, solar array positive, an equipment ground screw, and the VE direct port for system communications with the Servo GX. Let's start wiring. We first want to temporarily mount the charge controller to the wall so that we can take the measurements for our wires, which simply involves securing the charge controller with two number 14 screws in the pilot holes that we pre-drilled. Next, we need to make our wires. We measured our 2 gauge positive wire and then crimped a 2 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug onto one side and a 2 gauge ferrule on the other side. Each get 3 quarter inch heat shrink. For the negative wire, I'll do the exact same thing. I crimped on a 2 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug onto one side and a 2 gauge ferrule on the other both with 3 quarter inch heat shrink. For the equipment ground wire, this one gets a 2 gauge by 5 16 inch lug on one side and a 2 gauge by quarter inch lug on the other, both with 3 quarter inch heat shrink. Now that I've made the wires, I can wire the charge controller to the Lynx distributor. I started with the equipment ground wire because the screw is on the side of the charge controller and is hard to get to, requiring removal of the charge controller. Then I remove the equipment ground screw and then place the serrated washer, lug, washer, and lock washer in place and secured all of that with the equipment ground screw. The other end of this will get attached to the MultiPlus equipment ground stud later in this video, so I'm just going to leave it hanging for now. Next, we can clean off our positive ferrule with a bit of alcohol and put it into the positive battery terminal. And then clean the negative ferrule, put it into the negative battery terminal, and then tighten that to spec. Lastly, I'll ensure that there is no insulation between the ferrule and the terminal. Now it's time to connect the battery positive and negative wires to the Lynx distributor. I'm going to pull the wire separator out of the way, loosen and remove the nuts, lock washers, and washers from the Lynx distributor, Clean the electrical points of contact with some alcohol. Put the negative lug on the negative bus bar stud in the Lynx distributor. Ensure that there's no insulation between the lug and bus bar. Replace the washer, lock washer, and nut on the stud. Tighten the nut to the manufacturer spec, and then replace the wire separator. For the positive wire, I'm going to Clean my electrical points of contact on the positive wire and fuse. Put my mega fuse in place. Put the positive lug in place on the bottom stud of the fuse holder. Replace the washers, lock washers, and nuts on the bus bar and fuse holder. And then tighten to spec. Now that I have the charge controller for our ground mounted solar array wired to the Lynx distributor, I can connect the wires from the solar isolator. Now I already put the 10 gauge ferrules and quarter inch heat shrink on these wires from the solar isolator ahead of time since they are pretty short and hard to work with once the charge controller is in place. The red wire goes into the PV positive terminal and the black wire goes into the negative PV terminal and both get tightened to spec. It's vital to ensure that the ferrules insulation is out of the way and is not interfering with the connection here. 
Now that I have the second charge controller installed in the system, it's time to move on to wiring the Victron MultiPlus inverter charger, which is coming up next. Now that I have both solar charge controllers wired to the Lynx distributor, it's time to move on down the line of blue boxes and wire our Victron MultiPlus inverter charger to the Lynx distributor. The Victron MultiPlus will allow us to do three different things in this system. Charge our 24 volt batteries from 120 volt shore power, power our 120 volt outlets from shore power, and power our 120 volt outlets from our 24 volt battery bank. For this section of the build, we are using these parts. The Victron MultiPlus 24 volt 3K inverter charger, and the Explorus Life 24 volt MultiPlus 3K wiring kit, which includes wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, a mega fuse, and MultiPlus mounting hardware. The Victron MultiPlus has 10 terminals that we will be using in this build. Positive and negative battery inputs, hot, neutral, and ground AC inputs from shore power, hot, neutral, and ground AC outputs to the 120 volt breaker box, an equipment ground terminal, and the VE bus terminal for communications with the Servo GX. Let's get started. I fastened the MultiPlus mounting plate to the wall with the five flathead screws that come with the MultiPlus wiring kit. The MultiPlus simply rests on the mounting plate with the lip on the back and hangs there. The bottom gets screwed to the wall as well, but we will do that later once we're certain that we don't have to move the MultiPlus. With the MultiPlus mounted to the wall, I removed the front cover so that we could access all of the electrical connections. I measured the 1-aught wire for both the positive and negative connections and crimped a 1-aught by 5 16 inch wire lug onto each end with 3 quarter inch heat shrink. Next it was time to move back over to the MultiPlus and remove the nut, lock washer, and washer from one of the studs on each of the positive and the negative terminals. After cleaning the connections, I put the black wire on the negative terminal and the red wire on the positive terminal, and then fasten both in place with the washer, lock washer, and nut, and tightened it to an appropriate torque. The equipment ground wire goes underneath the MultiPlus on the stud at the very back corner. This stud is also where we land the equipment ground wires for the solar charge controllers. After removing the hardware from the MultiPlus equipment ground stud, I replaced the serrated washer, one OT lug, two gauge lug from the MPPT 25060, six gauge lug from the MPPT 130, washer, lock washer, and nut, and then tightened to an appropriate torque. Next is time to connect the equipment ground wire to the Lynx distributor. I loosen the nut, lock washer, and washer, put the equipment ground lug in place on the negative bus bar of the Lynx distributor, and then replace the washer, lock washer, and nut, and then tightened it to spec. Next is connecting the MultiPlus positive and negative wires from the MultiPlus to the Lynx distributor. I remove the nuts, washers, and lock washers from the negative bus bar and positive fuse holder in the Lynx distributor. And then I clean my wire lugs with a bit of sandpaper and alcohol. Then I put my negative wire lug in place on the negative bus bar and replace the washer, lock washer, and nut and then tighten to spec. And then I replace the wire separator. Next I remove the little red ring terminal from the stud that goes to the Lynx distributor computer board. Drop my mega fuse in place, put the PCB ring terminal back in place, put my positive wire lug in place directly on top of the fuse, and then replace the washers, lock washers, and nuts and then tightened it to spec. Now that the DC side of the Victron MultiPlus is all wired up, we still need to wire the AC input and AC output for the MultiPlus, but I'm going to keep going with the DC wiring of the system and get everything connected to the Lynx distributor. 
let's move on to wiring the chassis ground. Now that I have wired the MultiPlus to the Lynx distributor, it's time to wire the chassis ground. For this part of the install, we're using the one aught variety of the Explorers Life chassis ground wiring kit, which includes wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, a nut, bolt, washer, lock washer, and serrated washer. Before we installed the walls, we wired the chassis ground connection to the van's body. We used one of the body support ribs for this. This connection is as simple as drilling a 5 16 inch hole in the support rib and then bolting our 1 aught by 5 16 inch wire lug to the body support rib with the serrated washer between the lug and rib. And the washer, lock washer, and nut on the other side of the rib, and then tightening until snug. Since this was pretty hard to see back in that dark and tight corner, here's how that looks on a tabletop demonstration. The serrated washer is in between the lug and body panel, and then the washer, lock washer, and nut are on top of that, all bolted together nice and tight. The serrated washer cuts through the van's paint, giving a good metal-to-metal -metal connection. If you feel this is not enough of a connection, feel free to sand away some paint at your discretion. Back to real time now, with the walls already installed. I already crimped on a one aught by 5 16 inch wire lug onto this end of the chassis ground wire and fed it through the wall. This chassis ground wire gets attached to the center stud on the negative bus bar of the Lynx distributor. I pulled the negative connection for the Lynx distributor PCB out of the way, put the lug directly on the negative bus bar, replaced the ring terminal for the PCB, and the washer, lock washer, and nut directly on top of that, and all tightened to spec. Now that we have wired the chassis ground connection, it's time to wire our 24 volt pneumatic air conditioner, which is coming up next. Now that we have installed our chassis ground, it's time to wire our 24 volt pneumatic air conditioner to the Lynx distributor. The pneumatic 24 volt air conditioner is the air conditioner that we installed back in episode 21 of this build series, so most of the wiring is already completed. We connected the two gauge wires to the air conditioner and the lugs we already crimped onto the ends for bench testing the unit. We already ran those wires through the walls and now we just need to connect those to the Lynx distributor. I removed the hardware from the negative bus bar of the Lynx distributor and then put the negative wire lug in place and replaced the washer, lock washer, and nut on top and tightened it to an appropriate torque. Next, I removed the nut, lock washer, and washer from the positive bus bar and bottom stud of the fuse holder of the Lynx distributor and I put my mega fuse in place and then I put my positive wire lug on the bottom stud on top of the fuse and then I replaced the washers, lock washers, and nuts and tightened them to an appropriate torque. Now that I have the air conditioner wired, it's time to move on to wiring our 12 volt fuse blocks, which is coming up next. Now that I have wired the air conditioner, it's time to wire our 12 volt fuse blocks for our small loads like lights, fans, USB outlets, and such. I'm gonna break this section into two parts, installing the Victron Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter, and installing our dual fuse blocks. The Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter is responsible for lowering the 24 volt battery bank voltage to 12 volts to provide up to 70 amps of power to all of our lights, fans, USB outlets, and other small 12 volt loads around the van. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. The Victron Orion 24 volt to 12 volt 70 amp converter, two 12 volt fuse panels, and the Explorus Life Orion 2412 70 amp converter wiring kit, which includes wire, wire lugs, insulated ferrules, heat shrink, a mega fuse, and mounting hardware. Plus the Explorus Life secondary fuse block add-on wiring kit, which includes wire, insulated ferrules, and additional mounting hardware. The Orion 2412 70 amp converter has three different terminals that we will be using. The positive input terminal, 
the positive output terminal, and the negative terminal. The 12 volt fuse panels that we are using have three different terminal areas. Two six gauge positive connections, a negative bus bar, positive terminals for the branch circuits, and the blade fuse slots on the front. Now let's start wiring. Before we installed the walls, we ran the positive and negative 6 gauge wire from our Victron Orion 24 to 12 volt wiring kit from the electrical enclosure area up to where the first fuse block would live. I stubbed those wires out of the wall and put 6 gauge by quarter inch wire lugs with half inch heat shrink on each. I also made some short 6 gauge wires that would go from the Lynx distributor to the Orion terminals with a 6 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug and half inch heat shrink on one side and a 6 gauge by quarter inch wire lug and half inch heat shrink on the other side. Getting started, I secured the Orion to the wall with the screws included in the Orion 2412 wiring kit. Then I removed the nuts, washers, and lock washers from the side of the Orion and set them aside. Then I made sure that this little wire bridge was in place. The Orion will not function without this in place, so it's important that it's there. Next, I put the lugs that go to the 12 volt fuse block on the negative and 12 volt positive output studs of the Orion. And then after that, I removed the nuts, lock washers, and washers from the three studs of the Lynx distributor. And then I attached the short negative wire from the negative stud of the Orion to the negative bus bar on the Lynx distributor. Next, I put the washers, lock washers, and nuts back on the negative stud of the Orion and the Lynx distributor and tightened the spec and finally put the wire separator back in place. After that, I put the mega fuse in place on the fuse holder on the positive bus bar and then put my positive wire in place between the fuse holder of the Lynx distributor and the 24 volt input of the Orion converter. Then I put my washers, lock washers, and nuts back on the Lynx distributor and tightened the spec. And then replaced the washers, lock washers, and nuts back on the Orion and tightened those to spec. Now that the Orion converter has been installed, I can move on downstream and wire the 12 volt fuse blocks. Now we are wiring two separate 12 volt fuse panels here, one on the driver's side of the van and one on the passenger side. Both of them are powered from the same Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter. And here's how to wire the first one. We already ran the six gauge wires from the electrical enclosure up here to the fuse panel before we installed the walls. So we pulled those out stripped back some insulation, and crimped six gauge insulated ferrules onto each wire. There are two positive terminals on the back of the 12 volt fuse block. We're connecting the positive wire from the Orion converter into one of these terminals, and then connecting the wire that goes to the second fuse block to the other terminal. Which one goes to which does not matter as they are both connected internally. The negative wire from the Orion goes to any of these spots on the negative bus bar. The negative wire to the second 12 volt fuse block goes to any remaining spots on the negative bus bar. Connecting all the branch circuits is just a matter of stripping back the insulation on each positive and negative wire and putting them into their proper places on the fuse block. The negatives go to any spaces on the negative bus bar. The positives go to any spaces on the positive terminals on the other side. Wiring the second fuse block is nearly the same as the first, with the positive wire coming out from the first fuse block going to one of these positive terminals on the back of the fuse block. It doesn't matter which one though. And the negative wire goes to one of the spaces on the negative bus bar. Which one we choose here also does not matter. And same as the previous fuse block. All of the positive wires go to their positive terminals and negatives go to the negative bus bar.
Now I can fasten both of the 12 volt fuse blocks with the screws included in the 12 volt fuse panel wiring kits. And we can insert the appropriately sized blade fuses in the front of their respective circuits on the back. Now is also a good time to label the circuits so we know which fuse goes to which circuit. Now that the Victron Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter has been installed and wired to our 12 volt fuse panels, it's time to wire our 120 volt distribution panel. And that's coming up next. Now that I have the 12 volt fuse blocks wired up, it's time to wire our 120 volt AC distribution panel so that our MultiPlus inverter charger can send power to our breaker box and our breaker box can send power to our 120 volt outlets. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation a 120 volt AC distribution panel, and the Explorus Life 120 volt AC distribution panel wiring kit, which includes wire, insulated ferrules, a 50 amp main breaker, heat shrink, a cable gland, and mounting hardware. We are also using two 20 amp tandem breakers. The 120 volt AC distribution panel here has three different electrical areas that we are focusing on a negative bus bar, a ground bus bar, and the positive terminals that are in the bottoms of each breaker. Now let's start wiring. Before we install the walls, we ran the 6-3 wire behind the walls that went from the Victron MultiPlus to the 120 volt AC distribution panel. I stubbed those wires out of the wall, stripped off the ends, and put the 6 gauge insulated ferrules on each wire. I was able to get the outer insulation of the 6-3 wire into the gland of the MultiPlus, but the way I got it in there, I don't necessarily recommend it, so I'm not going to show you how I did it. Instead, I'm going to refer you back to the 30 minute and 22 second mark in the last full install video I did to show you how I recommend making that work. The link to that video is in the pinned comment below. The black, white, and green wires go into the line neutral, and ground terminals of AC output number one, and then tightened to an appropriate torque with a Phillips head screwdriver. Now moving up to the 120 volt AC distribution panel. There are knockouts on the back of the 120 volt AC distribution panel for our wire gland, but where we are installing this panel, there wasn't enough room behind it, so I drilled a new hole in the side and installed my wire gland there. Next, I fed all of my wires through. 6-3 from the side and 12-3 through the back. Then I securely mounted the AC distribution panel to the wall. Next, I stripped back the outer sheath from all 12-3 wires going to our outlets and loosely grouped all black, white, and green wires to prepare for wiring. Wiring this box is really pretty simple. All of the green wires go to the bus bar in the back of the box. So, I stripped off a bit of insulation from each wire, crimped on ferrules, loosened the screws on the ground bus bar, and then put the wires into the bus bar, and then tighten the screws. All of the white wires go to the bus bar in the front of the box in the exact same fashion. For the incoming 6-3 wires, they also go to their respective green and white bus bars with ferrules on each. The black wires attach to the breakers, and the breakers simply attach to the bottom rail of the breaker box and tilt up so that the metal spline goes into the back of the breaker. Make sure that you put your main incoming breaker and branch circuit outgoing breakers on the same side of the breaker box because, as you'll notice, there is a left side bus bar and a right side bus bar, and the two are not connected. I loosened the screw at the bottom of the breaker, stripped the insulation back, crimped on a 6 gauge insulated ferrule, inserted the wire into the 50 amp breaker, 
and tighten the screw. And the black wires from the 12-3 go into their own spaces on their own breakers, or tandem breakers in our case. And sometimes it is easier to remove the breakers to see what you're doing here. Please note how all breakers are on the same side of the box. The breakers must all be on the same side of the box for them to work. Also, don't forget to put the threaded ring on top of the gland, otherwise you have to undo things like I did here. The little metal clip that's taped to the inside of the breaker box gets screwed to the top of the box, which holds the main breaker in place. Now I can cut out the breaker knockouts, attach the lid to the breaker box, and label our circuits. Now that I have installed our 120 volt distribution panel, it's time to move on to wiring shore power, which is coming up next. Now that I've wired our 120 volt distribution panel, it's time to wire for shore power. Shore power will allow us to power our 120 volt outlets and charge our batteries directly from shore power at a campground. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. The Explorus Life 30 amp shore power wiring kit, which includes wire, a 30 amp shore power inlet, ferrules, and mounting hardware. We're also using a 30 amp shore power cord and a 15 to 30 amp power adapter plug. The Tin 3 wire coming out of the wall comes from the shore power inlet we installed back in episode number 5 of this series, which I'll link to in the video description below. I stubbed the Tin 3 wire out of the wall and stripped back the outer sheath and insulation. I also already put the 10 gauge insulated ferrules from the Explorers Life shore power wiring kit onto each of the ends. I fed the Tin 3 wire up into the MultiPlus and put the black, white, and green wires into the line neutral, and ground terminals of the AC input. Then I tighten them to an appropriate torque with a Phillips head screwdriver. Now that we are sure that we don't need to move this inverter, we can place the screws under the MultiPlus to hold it firmly in place. Now that I've wired the system for shore power, let's move on to alternator charging. Now that shore power is installed, let's talk about alternator charging. And here's the bad news. Unfortunately, we aren't going to cover alternator charging in this video, and here's why. We want really fast alternator charging capabilities, and we plan on using the 100 amp Victron Buck Boost to accomplish this. But supply chain issues have made it so that those aren't available to us, but more importantly to all of you until December, and we weren't going to hold up this project until then because of that. Rest assured though, alternator charging will absolutely happen soon and it will get its own dedicated video. We've even planned ahead and that alternator charging source already has a spot dedicated to it in the Lynx distributor, as well as a spot on the wall. Now, let's move on to wiring the Servo GX. Now that we've talked about alternator charging, it's time to wire our Servo GX. The Servo GX is responsible for everything to do with system monitoring, which will tell us our battery state of charge, charging wattages, discharging wattages, and a thousand other things that I can't fit into this eight second section summary. Here are the parts we're using for this part of the installation. The Victron Servo GX, the Victron Touch 70 touchscreen monitor, the Touch 70 wall mount, the Explorus Life Servo GX monitoring wiring kit, which includes VE direct data cables, RJ45 UTP data cables, and mounting hardware. And we're also using a third-party HDMI extension cable. The Servo GX has five different terminals that we're using in this video. VE Direct ports, VE Bus ports, VE CAN ports, an HDMI port, and a power input. Let's start wiring. The first connection would be to send power to the Servo GX. We are connecting the power wires that come with the Servo GX to the empty far right studs of the Lynx distributor. I remove the nut, lock washer, and washer, and place the ring terminal for the red wire on the positive bus bar and the black wire on the negative bus bar, and then re-secure the washers, lock washers, and nuts. For the rest of the connections, if you've ever wired up a desktop computer, the Servo GX is very similar. 
just a lot of data cables going from the Servo GX to these other blue boxes that we've already installed. Here's the rundown of the connections. An RJ45 UTP cable from a VE bus port on the Servo GX to either of the VE bus ports on the MultiPlus inverter charger. A VE Direct cable from a VE Direct port on the Servo GX to the VE Direct port on the MPPT 25060. A VE Direct cable from a VE Direct port on the Servo GX to the VE Direct port on the MPPT 130. VE CAN terminators in the first VE CAN port on the Link shunt and in the second VE CAN port of the Servo GX. An RJ45 UTP cable to the second VE CAN port on the Link shunt to the first VE CAN port on the Servo GX. And the final connection is the HDMI connection for the Touch 70 GX monitor we have mounted above the slider door. But let's talk about that connection right now. The Victron Touch 70 GX has a wire pre-installed onto the back of it that contains both an HDMI cord and a USB cord. The HDMI wire transmits touchscreen data and the visual signal, and the USB cord sends power to the monitor from a USB outlet. This cord is about 5 feet long and would normally plug into the HDMI and USB ports of the Servo GX, which is easy enough, right? Here's our problem. Our preferred mounting location is about 15 feet away. After a talk with Victron, here's the not Victron approved, but should work in most cases, hack to make it work. Installing a USB extension and HDMI seems like the obvious solution, but the power sent via USB is not powerful enough to overcome the voltage drop of a longer USB cable, so that won't work. But what will work is connecting a high quality HDMI extension cable from the Touch 70 to the Servo GX, and then adding a dedicated USB outlet near where the Touch 70 GX monitor will be installed so that the USB outlet can just plug in without an additional extension. Before we ran the walls, I ran the HDMI extension cable, which I plugged into the Servo GX. I connected the other end to the Touch 70 HDMI cable. For the USB outlet, I wired a USB outlet to our 12 volt fuse block that's above the door and plugged the Touch 70 into that. I tucked all that up nice and neat-ish behind the wall, uh, which is not the most elegant solution, but it's good enough for who it's for, and only myself and the six people still watching this video will ever know about it. Thanks for sticking around, by the way. While we are up here at the Touch 70, we can go ahead and mount it. We mounted the Touch 70 wall mount to the wall with the included screws, and then snapped the Touch 70 to the wall mount. Now, if you decide to do the HDMI extension hack, I strongly recommend bench testing this before burying all the wires to verify that the HDMI extension wire chosen does work since this is not a Victron approved kind of thing and any issues with the Touch 70 will likely stem from the use of the extension. With the Servo GX and Touch 70 GX all wired up, we can mount the Servo GX in place on the wall and do a little wire management. Now that I've wired the Servo GX, everything on the wall is finally complete. Now we can move our battery bank enclosure in place and secure it to the van, which is coming up next. With everything on the wall completely wired together, it was time to move the batteries and enclosure into place. Now the batteries only weigh a total of 180 pounds combined, so they were actually pretty manageable to move around. The enclosure was held in place with L-Track bolts through the L-Track that we installed back in episode number 27 of this build series. Now with the enclosure in place, it's time to move on to wiring the battery bank to the link shunt, and that's coming up next. Now that the enclosure is secured to the van, it's time to wire our Battleborn batteries to the rest of the system through the link shunt. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. The Explorers Life one aught Lynx Distributor Wiring Kit for the Lynx Shunt, which includes 
wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, a terminal fuse and fuse holder, a master disconnect switch, two bolt assemblies, a 300 amp ANL fuse, and mounting hardware. Now for this, I have made three wires. A negative wire with a 1 aught by 5 16 inch lug on both ends, and two positive wires, each with a 1 aught by 5 16 inch lug on one end, and a 1 aught by 3 8 inch lug on the other end. All of this gets 3 quarter inch heat shrink. Now I'm going to start on the link shunt side of things and bolt the 5 16 inch lugs of a positive and the negative wire to the terminals of the link shunt. Now since this is the main electrical point of the system, it's important to make sure that the lugs are clean and that there's no heat shrink between the lug and terminal. The black wire goes to the bottom negative bus bar of the link shunt and secured in place with a washer, lock washer, and nut and tightened to an appropriate torque. And the red wire goes to the top positive bus bar of the link shunt and secured in place with a washer, lock washer, and nut and tightened to an appropriate torque. The other end of the negative wire goes all the way back to the negative terminal of our battery bank. I'll remove the terminal cover, secure the negative wire lug to the negative battery terminal, and then replace the terminal cover. The other end of the positive wire with the 3 8 inch lug goes to the switch. Now, it doesn't matter which stud of the switch you attach this to. It does say input and output on the back of the switch, but that doesn't really matter, especially since the input and outputs of the switch could change depending on if the system is charging or discharging. The other positive wire gets attached to the other side of the switch with the 3 8 inch lug and then tightened to spec. Now is a great time to verify that the master disconnect switch is set to off. The other end of that positive wire goes to the terminal fuse that we installed way back at the start of this video. Now before we turn the system on, let's go ahead and secure the switch in place with a machine screw and lock nut. Now this is a bit of an atypical way of mounting this switch, but I'm just kind of trying it out to see if I like it. And it's super nice because it does keep the terminals covered. Now that the link shunt is wired to our Battleborn battery bank, it's time to wire our solar isolator. And that's coming up next. Now that the link shunt is wired to our Battleborn battery bank through our master disconnect switch, it's time to wire our solar isolator so that we can disconnect the solar arrays as needed for system maintenance. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. This section of the project uses the final few remaining pieces from the Explorus Life Solar Array Wiring Kit, which are the solar isolator, wire glands, and mounting hardware. The solar isolator we are using has eight screw terminals inside of it, and each one is connected top to bottom when the solar isolator is turned to on. This means that this isolator can handle two separate solar arrays, disconnecting both the positive and negative wires from each simultaneously. I remove the caps from the tops and bottoms of the isolator and then replace them with the wire entry glands. Now first I mounted the solar isolator by putting machine screws through the front of the inside of the isolator box and through the panel and secured it on the backside with a washer and nylock nut. Now there are four pairs of solar wire sticking out of the wall here. Two pairs of them are going to each of the solar charge controllers that we've already wired up in this video, and the remaining two are coming from the solar arrays. One from the roof solar array, and one from the port on the side of the van for an auxiliary ground deploy array. For the wires coming from the roof solar array, we covered that in extreme depth back in episode number 25 of this build, so you'll want to check that out as we're now picking up exactly where that left off in that video. And our rooftop solar array wires have been disconnected prior to working on these wires. For the ground deploy array, before we installed the walls, we installed this DC power port into the side of the van. Installation here was similar to our shore power port. We taped off and drilled a hole, wired the connector with the red wire to pin 1 and the black wire to pin 2, 
added a zip tie for strain relief, fed the wires through the hole, and secured the port in place with bolts, washers, lock washers, and nylock nuts. Now we'll show the ground deploy array and wiring in action later, but back to the isolator wiring for now. Now I ran the wires coming from the two solar arrays into one end of the isolator and the wires going to the charge controllers on the other end. For us, the left two terminals are for the ground deploy array and the MPPT-25060, and the right two terminals are for the roof array and the MPPT-130. Now this is a bit hard to see in this video since all of these wires are the same size and colors, but just refer to the wiring diagram for this system for additional clarification if needed. I stripped the insulation back on each of these wires and put them into their appropriate terminals on top and bottom. Now in this isolator, each pole is simply connected top to bottom with the isolator turned on, so lining the proper wires up top to bottom is all that's necessary here. Next I can put the solar isolator cover in place and make sure that the isolator is turned off. At this point, I could reconnect the MC4 connectors for the rooftop solar array. Now that everything in this system is completely wired up, we can turn the system on and make sure that it works. Now after spending a fair amount of time quadruple checking that all of my positive wires are connected to positive terminals and negative wires are connected to negative terminals, it's time for the most anxiety inducing part of the entire install, connecting battery power. And it works. Now is a great time to go around and flip some lights and check some outlets and make sure that everything works as expected. Now that everything works as expected, it's time to program the system, and that's coming up next. Now that the system is up and running, we need to program the system so that our Victron equipment delivers the proper voltages to our batteries based on Battleborn's recommended parameters. To program the smart solar charge controllers, we have to use the Victron Connect app and select the charge controller that we're wanting to program. We're starting with rooftop solar array, which is the 130. Once we are in the charge controller screen, I can then navigate to the device settings menu and change the name of the charge controller to something more memorable. From there, I can navigate to the battery charging settings. Now, instead of going over the settings line by line, I'm just going to put the settings that I'm using in the video description. And lastly, I'll use this charge controller to set up the VE Smart network and then it's time to move over to the other charge controller. So back out to the main Victron Connect screen. Select the next charge controller, which in our case is the 25060. Change the name to something more memorable. Change the battery charging settings. And then join the VE network that we set up with the first charge controller. Now the MultiPlus comes from Battleborn with the settings already correct for their batteries, but in the event that you need to access the settings, you'll need to plug an RJ45 cable into the VE bus port of the MultiPlus. Plug the other end into a Victron MK3 USB adapter, plug in a USB cord, USB adapter, and then into your phone or laptop. From there, we can access the MultiPlus similar to the MPPTs. For the settings, Victron only wants trained professionals accessing this menu, so if you aren't a trained professional, just skip forward 20 seconds or so so you can't see the password that I'm putting in right now. Now same story as before, I'll leave Battleborn's recommended settings in the video description below. Lastly is the Link Shunt, and this one we actually program over at the Touch70GX. Navigate to the Link Shunt settings page and then put in the proper charging settings. Now the Serbo GX and the Touch 70 GX are incredibly, incredibly detailed and it's sort of like asking how do you use a computer. There's a lot more to the system but we're not going to talk about it in this video. The user manuals are incredibly detailed and have a ton of information, so start there, but we'll be covering more of these systems in future videos. 
Now that the system has been programmed, let's test the system. Now you've already seen the puck lights turn on, but let's dive into system testing just a bit more. I pull the van out into the sun to see how our solar panels are charging, and it's really overcast today, unfortunately, so we aren't seeing great performance, but we are still seeing about 106 watts coming in from our 580 watt solar array, which is expected for the weather conditions that we have. Power is coming from the sun to our solar panels and then to our MPPT-130 charge controller at about 36 volts. The charge controller is converting those 36 volts down to 26.2 volts to charge our 24 volt battery bank at a rate of 3.9 amps. We can also see this power coming into our system on our Touch 70 display. Now let's set up our ground deploy solar array. I have this wire I've made with the other end of the two pin DC connector I showed earlier in this video, and that's on one end, and on the other end is MC4 connectors. It's 30 foot long and is simply red and black 10 gauge solar wire inside a wire loom with heat shrink on the ends of the loom to make it look a little nicer and keep the wires protected. I've set four 100 watt solar panels out in the sun and connected them all in series, which means connecting the positive and negative wires of neighboring panels together and then connecting the ends to our ground deploy solar wire. Now I'll turn my solar isolator off and the other end of that wire goes into the auxiliary solar port we've installed on the side of the van. With the panels connected, we can then turn them right side up and turn the solar isolator to on, and they should start to charge. Power is coming from the sun to our ground deploy solar panels uh, to our MPPT-25060 charge controller at about 80 volts. The charge controller is converting that 80-ish volts down to 26 volts to charge our 24 volt battery bank at a rate of, unfortunately, only one amp on this nice and cloudy day. We can also see this power coming into the system on our Touch 70 display. While we're outside charging things, let's go ahead and plug into shore power. I'm going to use my 30 amp to 15 amp adapter to plug my 30 amp shore power cord into a standard 15 amp household outlet since I don't have a full 30 amp shore power connection here at our shop just yet. The other end goes into our 30 amp shore power inlet on the side of the van. Now with the MultiPlus set to on, we can see that we are indeed charging from shore power. 120 volt shore power is coming into the van and going through the Victron MultiPlus inverter charger which is converting that 120 volt AC power to 26 volts DC to charge our 24 volt battery bank. Now let's go ahead and turn the MultiPlus off and disconnect from shore power for now. Now with the MultiPlus set to on and all of our 120 volt breakers in the on position, we can plug something into one of our 120 volt outlets. Now since we're disconnected from shore power, our Touch 70 is showing our battery bank sending 24 volt power out to our inverter charger, and the inverter function is converting that 24 volt DC power to 120 volt AC power and sending it through the breaker box to our 120 volt outlets. Next, let's test Power Assist. Power Assist adds power from the battery bank to an underperforming shore power connection. I've set our shore power input current limit to only pull 7.5 amps from shore power since I've got other things on that circuit we're plugged into. This tells our MultiPlus to pull no more than 7.5 amps to power our devices and charge our battery bank from shore power. Now I'm going to plug in this space heater and turn it on high. I can see that the space heater is pulling a little over 1200 watts from the system. 7.5 amps, or 834 watts of that, is coming from shore power, and the remaining of that is actually coming from our batteries. Power Assist is why we use 10 gauge wire for shore power and 6 gauge wire for the MultiPlus to breaker box connection. Shore power can provide 30 amps from a 30 amp shore power pedestal, and then Power Assist can add the rated wattage of the inverter to that, which is another 20-ish amps at 120 volts. Now I'll turn off the heaters and disconnect from shore power. Next up is our small 12 volt loads. Now we already saw our 12 volt loads power our puck lights in the ceiling, so we know that they're working, uh, but now we can check the Touch 70 to see how much power they're drawing when I turn the switch off and on. 
24 volt power is coming from our battery bank and the Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter is converting that 24 volt power down to 12 volts and sending it to both of our 12 volt fuse blocks to power these things like our lights and our max air fan. Next, let's check our 24 volt DC pneumatic air conditioner. Our 24 volt battery bank is sending 24 volt DC power directly to the air conditioner through the Lynx distributor and it's working perfectly. We can now check that on our Touch 70 to see that when we turn the air conditioner on, the power usage does indeed jump up to show the air conditioner being powered. Since our electrical system has already been installed in an enclosure in our van and we are retroactively adding alternator charging, I've made a backer board from 3 quarter inch ply that I'm going to use to mount everything to and then mount this in the enclosure so it's easier for all of you to see what I'm working on. I've also cut, drilled, bent, and painted a bracket to mount my second Orion over the first Orion since my lateral space is incredibly limited. I'm going to go ahead and mount my first Orion to the board. I'm going to mount the other Orion to the bracket with nuts and bolts. And then I'm going to mount the bracket to the backer board so the screw terminals can still be accessed. Then I'm going to tape the remote jumper that was in each of the Orion boxes to the top of the Orion so we don't lose it since it's easy to lose and the Orion won't function without it. Next I'm going to mount my junction studs to the board. And I'm going to mount my Victron smart shunt to the board. And we will be making our wires as noted from the wiring diagram on our product page for this kit, which I'll link to in the video description. For each one, I'll cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink a lug onto the wire as appropriate. And then I'll cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink a ferrule onto the other end as appropriate. Now I have specific videos for crimping lugs and ferrules onto wires that I'll leave in the video description below and you'll end up with something like this. And now is a good time to go ahead and clean the lugs and ferrules to make a nice clean electrical surface. I'm gonna put my MRBF fuse holder on the input junction stud, and then the two gauge wire coming from the vehicle start battery on top of that and secure it in place. And then I'm going to put the other MRBF fuse holder on the output junction stud. And the two gauge wire going to the Lynx distributor on top of that and secure it in place. Next I'm going to put the MRBF fuses on each of the MRBF fuse holder studs and then run the 6 gauge wire to each of the Orions from each of the fuses. Input to engine start battery stud and outputs to Lynx distributor studs.
For the negative wiring on the smart shunt, the battery minus side will be connected to the Lynx distributor and the remaining junction stud here will be connected to the wire going to the engine start battery. Now the load minus of the smart shunt will go to the negative output of each Orion and the engine battery negative junction stud is going to go to the negative input of each Orion. Now I can go ahead and connect the VE direct cable to the smart shunt. This would have been way easier if I had done this earlier. And I can put the power wire on the smart shunt as well, and I'm just going to attach it right here. Now I can double check that all the terminals are nice and tight and there are no washers or heat shrink interfering with any of the electrical connections and make sure that all of our lugs actually have heat shrink. Now we can move this into the van, secure it to the wall, and connect it to the Lynx distributor. Negative to the negative bus bar, mega fuse on the fuse holder on the positive bus bar, and then the positive wire to the bottom stud of the fuse holder. And put the hardware back in place and tighten it down. Now I'll connect the VE Direct cable coming from the smart shunt to the Servo GX. Now if you want to see how the rest of this system is wired, we have a full install video which I'll link to in the video description. Now, on to the starter battery connection. I just made the connections to our starting batteries and starting battery connection is going to be incredibly dependent on what vehicle you have. We have a 2021 Ford Transit with dual alternators and dual starting batteries. And after looking through all of the manuals and questionable information online, uh, we decided that the best way to connect the negative wire is gonna to be to this stud on top of the negative battery terminal of our starting battery bank. And then the positive wire is going to connect to the 175 amp uh, CCP connection on the side of the seat pedestal over here. Now there's a fuse inside of this box that's protecting this CCP stud over on this side, which is why we don't have a breaker or external fuse over here because it's protected from the fuse block inside. Now, if you're trying to connect up this same system on a Sprinter or a ProMaster or some Expedition truck or motorhome or whatever, there's usually some pretty good information out there about where to connect this stuff, but realistically, unless the vehicle manufacturer makes a specific recommendation, going to the vehicle starting battery with a fuse protecting the wire going to the Orion is going to be your best bet. Now that everything is connected, we can program our components with the Victron Connect app. I'm going to select one of the Orions, update the firmware, change the settings, download the settings, update the firmware on the second Orion, upload the settings from the first Orion to the second Orion, and our Orions are programmed. And for the smart shunt, I updated the firmware and set it as a DC energy meter instead of a battery monitor so that it can tell our Servo GX 
how much power our Orions are contributing to the system. And I'll put a cheat sheet to the settings I use to program our 24 volt Battleborn battery bank in the blog post for this video, as well as a cheat sheet for those of you with 12 volt battery banks. Since the Orions are now programmed, we can put our remote input bridge plug into each of the Orions so they'll be able to start charging once the engine turns on. Now with everything hooked up and programmed, we're going to take a look at the Touch 70 GX that's reading the data from our Servo GX to see what that power looks like. So we're up here at the Touch 70 GX that's getting its information from the Servo GX back in the back with everything connected and programmed. Here we can see that we're drawing 23 watts of DC power to power our overhead lights. And then we have a 22 watt AC load coming out of our inverter. And that's being shown as a negative 75 watt uh, calculation coming out of the battery bank. Now I'm going to turn the engine on and let you see what happens. And now we can see that the, uh, we have a negative reading here on DC power, which that's kind of a weird way to show that, uh, but it means negative DC power is actually pushing DC power back into the battery bank, which that's our alternator. So we can click into menu here. We can scroll till we find the smart shunt, which is in line between our dual Orions and our Lynx distributor. And we can see that our dual Orions is charging about Oh, just shy of 600 watts, which is expected for uh, our nearly full battery bank. Go ahead and click into that. Click into the device. Change our name to alternator instead of smart shunt, so it makes a little more sense on our screen. And now we can see that alternator is listed right up here at the top. Now on our pages section of the Touch 70, there's apparently going to be a firmware update that is going to be able to display an alternator charging source when using a DC meter like this, but it's not available just yet, but I'll update the pin comment when that's available. So that's how this is looking. And on the Victron Connect app, uh, we're also seeing that updated nearly 600 watts of charging power. That's pretty consistent with what we're seeing over there. Installing swivel seats into a camper van conversion is potentially the easiest DIY project that you can do that also has the biggest effect of turning a cargo van into a camper. This project should only take you about an hour and a half and requires only the most basic of hand tools. Welcome to Explorers.life. My name is Nate and I teach people how to build DIY campers. Let's get started. The swivels we are using are Scop Emma, Scopey Ma, Scopey Ma, swivels from the Swivel Shop, which I'll leave a link to in the video description below. Now let's get into the boxes. There's a driver side swivel and a passenger side swivel and each is labeled on the sticker on top and comes with its own hardware. The swivels measure approximately 18 and a half inches by 16 and a half inches, weigh a shade over 32 pounds each, and are less than one inch thick, which means that they will add less than one inch to the sitting height of the seat. The levers that unlock the seats are on the front and push to the side to release the lock. Now let's get to work. We're gonna start with a passenger seat. Initially working up under the front of the seat, I grabbed a 7mm nut driver and loosened the screw on the most prominent electrical connection. Once that was loose, then I could pull the clip away for the wiring harness for the seat. There is also a retaining clip on the wiring harness that can be dislodged by simply pulling down. Now in a previous project I cut the zip tie on this as I didn't know it could just be pulled down, but it is what it is. Next was time to remove the bolts on the seat. There are simply four bolts to remove, one on each end of both of the seat rims. These are removed with a 10 millimeter socket. I remove the bolts at the front of the seat rails and set those aside as they would not be reused. I slid the seat forward. I remove the bolts at the rear of the seat rails and then remove the seat from the van, taking special care to make sure that the wiring harness was not caught on anything. 
To install the swivel, I put the passenger side swivel into place and pulled the wiring harness through the center of the swivel. Then I pulled the red lever to the side to slightly swivel the top part of the base out of the way. Then I gathered the four flathead machine screws from the swivel hardware kit. Then used a 5mm hex bit to fasten the swivel to the seat pedestal. Next, I could put the seat back into place and align the holes, and attach the seat rails to the swivel using the included bolt, washer, and nut. The child seat latch bar prevents the swivels from going all the way around, so that needs to be removed. This can be removed with a hacksaw, which took me about six minutes or so, or it can be removed with a multi-tool, which takes about 60 seconds, or probably less if the blade was actually sharp. Reciprocating saws, jigsaws, or pretty much anything else would work here. Just maybe refrain from using anything that throws sparks like a grinder, or a Dremel tool or anything like that, but you do you. Once that was out of the way, I could sand down the rough spots and paint with a dab of Rust-Oleum. Now the factory seat rails also hit the door while turning. Now this just seems like a it is what it is kind of thing due to the geometry of the factory seat. And if you wanted to trim this up a bit so it didn't hit, you could probably cut the backs off of the seat rails, but I'm a bit hesitant to cut OEM seat rails, so for now, we'll just be opening the door slightly, swiveling the seat, and then closing the door easy peasy. But you've got options here on your own install. To finish the installation, we're just going to tighten up all of the remaining bolts and nuts. Turn the chair around, and slide it back so we can access the final two bolts. Then reconnect the electrical connection on the front of the seat and fasten it in place with the screw we disconnected at the start of the video. And lastly, reconnect the retaining clip if you didn't break it like I did. And the passenger seat is now finished, so let's move on to the driver's seat. Now the process here is very similar to the passenger seat, except for the wiring harness, but let's just rip through this process quickly and we'll slow it down to show you anything new. We remove the electrical connection, the factory bolts, and the seat. And when we put the swivel in place, we found out that the electrical harness was too chunky to fit, so we had to make a modification here. Now Far Out Ride has a great fix for this in their blog post about this installation, and we're just going to mirror that. We made a mark in the plastic cover in the middle of the swivel. Took a nut driver and removed the bar across the length of the seat pedestal. Removed the plastic battery cover. Used a step bit to drill a hole in the battery cover on the mark that we made previously. And then used a box knife to cut a slit from the hole to the back of the cover. Pulled the wire through the slit into the new hole. Replaced the metal bar and hardware. Replaced the swivel and pulled the wiring harness through. Swiveled it slightly to get the top part out of the way. Inserted the new hardware. Replaced the seat. Inserted the new hardware to attach the swivel to the seat rails and secured them with the bolts, washers, and nuts from the swivel seat kit and tightened with an impact driver and wrench. Lastly, we reattached the electrical connection and tightened it back up. And that's it. About three hours of work, including all of the camera stuff that we had to do to make this video, and we had the swivels installed. Now it took a minute to figure out the best position to have the seats in to get them to swivel, but the main takeaway here is that if you're over six foot tall, swiveling while sitting in the seat probably isn't going to work. The main gripe we had about the swivels in our old Sprinter was that it added too much height to our seats. 
Now me, being six foot two, wasn't much of an issue, but Steph also isn't really short at five foot seven, and the increased height actually made it so that her feet didn't even touch the floor when we were driving. These swivels are less than an inch tall, so that is a non-issue this time around, which is incredibly welcome. Great. <laughs> we don't always want to be caught out in the middle of nowhere in our camper with no cell signal, so we are going to install a WeBoost, and we're gonna show you how to do it. Welcome to Explorers.life. This is a lemon, this is a lime. <laughs> My name is Nate, this is Steph. We teach people how to build DIY campers. Let's get started. So this is the WeBoost Drive Reach RV cell phone booster. So let's see what's in the box. The exterior antenna. The interior antenna. The cell booster. Wire from the exterior antenna to the booster. And then various mounting hardware and things like that. So we're right here above the slider door where our kind of control panel is, if you will. We're going to be mounting the actual booster right here. And that means that we need to run this wire that goes to the external antenna up through the ceiling uh, to the back of the van where we're going to be mounting the external antenna to the roof rack. So we have our wire run for the exterior antenna. I uh, just got it running through the ceiling and then through this little cavity right here in the rear support rib of the van. And this is going to go up onto the roof to the exterior antenna. Uh, there was about, I don't know, 10 feet of extra wire or so, and so it's kind of coiled up throughout the length of this cross member. Uh, we're just gonna leave this hanging for now, and this is going to be coming up through the roof later in the video. So put these ceiling panels back on, and then start working up uh, towards the actual booster. And actually, before we put the ceiling panels up, uh, we need to drill the hole in the ceiling panel where this wire comes out of the ceiling and goes into the booster that's going to be mounted right here. So I'm going to go do that. Now that the ceiling is back up and the wire is through the roof, the next thing we're going to do is actually mount the booster to the wall. So there's this little clip plate thing on the back of the Wii Boost that just comes off. Set this aside for a second. And then the plate uh, has two spots for number 10 screws. I'm just gonna use number 10 by half inch wood screws there. And it's also got Velcro backing on there. Um, so we don't really have anything that'll stick to Velcro. So I'm actually going to peel this off, uh, mount it up there, get the Wii Boost clipped into place, and get our wire connected to the exterior antenna port on the booster. Now the cell booster is attached to the wall and is also attached to the wire going back to the uh, exterior antenna. Now would be the interior antenna. So we've got the interior antenna and the wire that would go from the booster to the interior antenna. Now what I'm gonna try right now is I'm actually just going to simply connect the interior antenna directly to the booster. Now, I was talking to Chad this morning and he was uh, saying that they had errors whenever they did this and tried to set it up. But I'm gonna try and give it a shot and then if this doesn't work, then I'm going to use the wire that comes with the WeBoost uh, install kit. And then I'm going to run this up by the headliner and move it somewhere else. But I'm going to leave this as is right now. We'll check back once everything is completely hooked up. The next step is going to be connecting power from the 12 volt fuse block to the WeBoost signal booster. So we have access to the back of our 12 volt fuse panel at this point. Got our power wire plugged into here. And now the WeBoost that we bought, it only comes with an AC to DC adapter here. And so it takes 120 volt AC and converts it down into 12 volt DC. And what they have a actual DC uh, outlet that would replace this, but ultimately this is a 12 volt fuse block. And so what we are going to do is cut this here. It's going to have two wires inside of it and then connect it up to the positive and negative terminals on the back of the 12 volt fuse block. If you're uncomfortable with that, maybe consider getting the actual uh, approved wiring kit, but this is what we're doing. So we need to be able to get this wire to the back of our 12 volt fuse block. And since this is on the outside of the panel here on the booster, we need to get this wire into the wall somehow. Not really sure how we're going to do that, but we're about to figure it out and just keep on moving. 
Uh, it's pretty highly specific to our particular build, so we're just gonna mess with it until we figure it out. So there are not two wires in here, uh, unfortunately. So what we have going on here is there is one wire right here with a bunch of smaller wires around it. All these smaller wires are the negative wires and the positive wire is inside of this. Now that's kind of annoying um, and I would probably recommend going ahead and getting the DC to DC wiring kit for uh, you know if you guys are trying to follow this follow along with this. But I'm going to do it a different way and uh, we're gonna make it work and still have it like be nice and safe and everything like that. So I'm gonna do it, show you how to do it. So we've made pretty much two wires. So I took the wires that were around the outside of the sheath and I put them in black heat shrink here. This is going to go to the negative uh, bus bar on the back of our fuse block. And then this white wire is our positive wire that's going to go to one of the fuse connections on the back of the 12 volt fuse block. And it's going to get a fuse right inside of here. And we'll fuse it at five amps. And this part of the install is wrapped up for now. Now I've got this little dangly antenna. So like I said, we're gonna test and see if this actually works in this location. And if it does, uh, I got a little angle bracket from another project that we had going on that I'm going to end up just mounting right here so we can have the antenna just right here, nice and neat. So the next thing we're going to do is move outside of the van and mount the exterior antenna. We are about to install the exterior antenna, but I wanted to do that on this tabletop. Uh, that was just, a little easier to manage all the parts and stuff like that, get it assembled before you actually crawl up on the ladder. In the WeBoost box for the exterior antenna, we got two pieces of hardware here and various extensions and stuff to get the antenna up to the level that it needs to be, which is as high as possible, but we didn't want it looking like an RC car, so we're not using this one. And since we're not using that one, we probably don't need the spring adapter thing either. Now this one here is for if we we're mounting it to like the side of a ladder or something round, uh, which that's not what we're doing. So we actually don't need that mount either, but did want to use this um, to get it a little higher up and give us a little more wiggle room with uh, this cable. So we're going to use these three items from the WeBoost box. And then we also picked up this bracket from the local hardware store, but Unaka Gearco actually has a better bracket that I like better, but I actually didn't see it until this morning. So uh, I'll leave a link to that one in the video description. You can check it out. So we're gonna put this together. And now that this is assembled, we'll just kind of scoot it to the side just a little bit. And we're going to uh, prepare the roof entry gland. So this is a C-View cable seal. And it just comes apart like this. A little gasket on the bottom. And then this little part right here in the top. And we actually have to drill a hole through this to the appropriate size so that this wire can go through. Okay, and this is installed. 
Got some actually pretty good instructions here if you just take the time to read them, uh, unlike what I did the first time. So this just goes around the wire, that little slit right there, and then it fits up nice and neat into the bottom or the top of the cap. All of this fits down through the roof, like so, and then when we tighten this piece to this piece, it squishes that grommet together to tighten to a waterproof seal around this. So now that this is all assembled, we can take it up to the roof, drill our hole, grip the hole, and mount this in place. We started by tracing a hole below the antenna, and then made our initial hole with a small drill bit, and then used a step bit to make the hole bigger. And then we vacuumed up the mess. Next, we wiped the space with Windex, and then treated the exposed metal with Rust-Oleum paint. Then we put some sealant around the bottom of the gasket of the roof entry gland, and then screwed down the roof entry gland. Next, we removed the 8020 cover off the back of the roof rack and slid in a T-nut. Then we replaced the 8020 cover, put Loctite on the bolt, and then tighten down the antenna to the 8020. And then we fed the wire through the gland and pulled the wire through from the inside. And then inserted the gasket into the gland and then tightened down the cover of the roof entry gland. And now that this is sealed up nice and tight, uh, this is the wire that comes through here. And this is a wire that goes up to the cell booster up front. I can just take this little red cap off, discard it, and then connect these together, and then stuff these back up in that same cavity where we were working earlier. The exterior antenna is all mounted up and we move back up here to uh, get it all set up. It has an app uh, to actually install it. So I'm just gonna walk through this process. I haven't done it yet. So we're just gonna see what it gives us. Install my booster, drive reach RV, mount outside antenna and route cable. Connect. Okay, we've done all of that. Booster off test. Let's test the speed of your current cell signal. Complete each of the steps below, then tap start. We'll compare it to your boosted speed soon. Grant location permission while using the app. Disconnect the booster from power. Park in a weak signal location. Um, we're in our shop right now. Our signal's not like bad. It's not probably not great anyway because it's a metal building. So we'll say that's fine. Park outside and not next to a building. Well, we're not going to do that. So we're just gonna say that we did and see what happens. Test current cell signal. It's got 90, negative 94 dBm. Okay, booster on test. Connect the booster to power. Park in a weak signal location. We're in the exact same spot. Park, yep, we didn't move. Got green and red going on. Check signal. Waiting for booster to power on. Negative 116 dBm. Result, let's try that again. Okay, check that all connections are tight. So we're not getting much of a result right now, and I'm thinking it's probably due to one of two things. So one, uh, this is too close to this unit. So I'm going to connect the wire that we showed earlier, and then uh, we're going to move this further away, just string it over here along the top of the dash, repeat the test, and see if that does anything. Same thing. So this didn't matter much. So my next thought is we have pretty good cell signal right here. Uh, we're in a building, so we're already like kind of disobeying two of the startup rules. So we're going to go um, probably tomorrow uh, to a spot where we know that there's uh, less cell signal and we're gonna test this again. So we'll be back. We just drove to the top of Rabbit Ears Pass about 30 minutes outside of town and to a spot that we knew that we didn't have cell signal. And currently we've got one bar of cell signal 
and the Wii Boost is unhooked. Um, the power is not on. And I got on tech support with WeBoost because we were having issues with their app not really picking up much of anything. And WeBoost actually said they have some glitches with their app and to download the Network Cell Info Lite app and it's uh, more consistent. And so we have a reading currently of negative 123 dBm. And we're going to go ahead and plug that in, plug the WeBoost in, and you should be able to see that number climb. Cool. And it looks like it's evened out at negative 112. So an obvious uh, difference from when it's unplugged to when it's plugged. So pretty cool. Um, so now we're going to do a test where we're going to bring this antenna back over here and see if we're actually going to be able to mount this to the wall underneath the booster. Now I move the antenna over here and we're still at that negative 120 dBm rating. Go ahead and plug this in and see what happens. And it looks like this has leveled off at actually negative 99, negative 98. So even a little bit better than over there. So that's pretty cool. So that means that I am going to be mounting it right here. So we're going to take this back to the shop and install our bracket to get this mounted here. And that's pretty much going to wrap up this project. This is not my fault. This is not the part that they did. None of my shit's leaking. In this video, we're going to show you how we built this modular plumbing enclosure for our Ford Transit camper van build. We're going to cover everything from the tank, to the plumbing, to the enclosure, to the testing, and even the small details on how to connect everything to the van. My name is Nate. Welcome to Explorers.life. Let's get started. Here's some information about the tank that we're using. This build revolves around the 25 gallon over the wheel well water tank that we got from Titan Vans. It has four threaded inserts on each end to attach the tank to the van and two threaded water inlets on each end for connecting water fill and overflow. We needed to build a frame around the enclosure to attach our plumbing and pumps. We made this out of three quarter inch birch plywood that we measured, cut, and drilled to fit. We drilled pocket holes with our Craig jig, sanded with 220 grit sandpaper, glued it together with pocket screws, and finished it with paste wax. Lastly, we slid the frame into place and bolted it to the threaded inserts of the tank. Next up was plumbing. We used PEX tubing and crimp connectors for most of the plumbing for the system. All threads got Teflon tape and we used tons of T's and L's to get the water where it needed to go. We attached the water pump and accumulator to the pipe coming from the lower water output of the tank and attached that to the frame. Then we connected flexible tubing from the tank to the T coming from the water inlet and to the pump. A tip here is to use a heat gun to make the tubing flexible enough to squeeze over the connectors. We used hose clamps to attach the flexible tubing to the connectors and attach the flexible tubing to the top of the tank for the overflow. We clamped the cold water PEX tubing going to the front of the tank and the hot water return to the frame on the tank. We put plugs in places where we did not need output pipes, and we used a washing machine outlet box for our future sink connection. 
We made some flexible tubes for the hot water heater, for the sink connections, and for the shower at the back of the tank, as well as the water inlet. Now it was time for the first test. We rolled the tank into the shop and connected a water hose to the water fill inlet. We did find one little leak that was quickly fixed by just tightening the connection. We tested the overflow and checked around for other leaks. We temporarily connected power to the pump and tested water pressure with the shower. With everything testing good to go, it was time to make the aluminum extrusion frame enclosure. We used by slot aluminum extrusion, ordered pre-cut and tapped, so that all we had to do was assemble with button head screws in the ends just like we did on our electrical enclosure. Next we needed to attach the tank to the aluminum extrusion. We attached the aluminum extrusion to the tank and did this with just some metal angle that we cut and drilled to fit. We used the bolts to attach to the tank and roll in T-nuts for the extrusion side of the brackets. We attached the tank to the enclosure in four different spots. Next we needed to make some aluminum extrusion blocks for the panels. We needed to find a way to mount some panels to the outside of the enclosure so that it looked nice and neat, and here's how we did that. We cut some 5 8 inch lengths of extrusion, drilled access holes about a quarter inch from one end, and then tapped that in with a quarter by 20 thread tap. and attached them to the enclosure frame with roll-in T-nuts and tested it out. And then we made about 24 more of those and just attached them all evenly spaced out around where we were going to be putting the panels for the enclosure. Next was time to install the water inlet. We drilled our hole from the inside of the van with a hole saw and then drilled a hole with a long bit so that everything lined up and drilled our hole in the outside and cleaned, prepped, and painted the exposed metal. The inlet attaches with stainless screws, so we pre-drilled the metal and made a wood backer ring for the screws to have something to bite into. We put the inlet into place and tightened it down. And then lastly, we attached the PEX tubing to the water fill. Next was time to install the water gauge. We drilled a hole for our gauge and marked the holes for the screws. We were careful not to drop any plastic inside here. And then we put the gauge in the hole and screwed it down. Next we needed to wire the gauge. Now there are two wires on the gauge that need to run over to our Serbo GX, so we ran two 16 gauge wires from where the plumbing enclosure would live 
over to our electrical enclosure. With everything finished behind the wall, we put the wall panel back on and cramped a male threaded fitting onto the water inlet. Next was time to make the wood panels for the enclosure. For this we used quarter inch birch and cut it to fit with a circular saw. We made cutouts for the shower, the pump switch, and the sink fill. And then we drilled holes to attach panels to the mounting brackets that we made earlier. Gray sanded them with 220 grit sandpaper on an orbital sander and buffed them with paste wax to finish. Next was wiring for the water pump and the gauge. We attached the wiring to the frame of the tank. Two wires, positive and negative, for the water pump and the two signal wires for the gauge. We stripped off the insulation for all four wires at the back of the enclosure and connected the positive and negative to the pump with lever nuts and then put lever nuts on the signal wires that would eventually connect to the signal wires that we just ran through the wall to the Servo GX. At the front of the enclosure, we crimped on some spade connectors for the positive wire where the switch was going to go to turn our water pump off and on. And then we connected Anderson connectors to the positive and negative wires that would connect to the Anderson ports that we installed in the walls throughout the van for powering the unit. And lastly, we connected the two signal wires to the gauge with lever nuts. And here's where we are as of now. For the back of the enclosure, we actually planned on installing this nice hatch so that we could easily access our drain valve. Unfortunately, the hatch was hitting the rear door jam of the van and it didn't fit. You win some, you lose some. But Steph suggested some thumb screws for the entire back panel, which will probably look better anyway, but still give quick access. Next, we needed to attach the shower. We put the front panel in place and then attached our shower to the panel. We heated up the tube so it was a bit more flexible and connected our flexible tubes to the shower. Next we needed to attach the sink connections. We put the front panel in place and attached the washing machine outlet that would actually be connecting to the sink in our upcoming kitchen module build. And attach the flexible hoses to the sink fill. We slid the water heater into place and attached it with straps that go around the bottom of the enclosure. We use straps here because this particular heater needs to be removed for winterization, which we can do pretty easily by removing the front panel of the enclosure. Next we needed to drill the drain holes. We drilled our drain holes in the back for the system drain and up front for the hot water heater pressure relief valve. Before we slid the enclosure and tank into place, we put a bit of leftover Thinsula insulation over the wheel well, since wheel wells can get extremely cold, and that particular space will be impossible to heat, much like a wall cavity. Next, we made some brackets that would attach the aluminum extrusion to the L-track on the wall and move the enclosure into place and bolted it down. Then we made some brackets that connected the aluminum extrusion to the floor of the van. This means that the tank is connected to the enclosure in four places, and the enclosure is connected to the body of the van in four places. This ain't going nowhere.
Next, we connected the drain tube. We slid the flexible tubing up from the bottom of the van and connected it with a hose clamp. And then we connected the hot water heater pressure relief valve. We slid flexible tubing into the front drain hole that comes from the hot water heater pressure relief valve that we connected after hours and off camera as that connection needed an additional trip to Ace Hardware. And then we wired the switch for the water pump. Now this is simply a single pole, single throw switch wired the exact same way as we wired the switch for the puck lights in our van. And then we connected the Anderson ports to power the water pump. We attached the Anderson connectors for the pump to the Anderson ports in the walls. This camera angle was impossible to get, but as a refresher, this is what we were connecting to. These are just a nice clean way to get wires from inside of the walls to the outside of the walls with a removable connection. And time for our final test. Lastly, we connected flexible tubing to our water inlet and then connected a water hose to the outside for the final test. This is not my fault. This is not the part that they did. None of my shit's leaking. Ultimately, there were no leaks on the inside of this enclosure, and the shower just needs an additional o ring that fell off, apparently. Lastly, we needed to connect the signal wires from the gauge to the signal wires that go through the wall to the Servo GX. Now I'm not going to cover programming of the tank gauge in this video as it's pretty specific to our electrical system, but let me know in the comments below if you want me to make a short video showing you how to do that. A few months ago, we added one of these tank level sensors to the freshwater tank in our DIY camper van conversion, but we didn't show how to program it. It's a pretty simple device that works by changing the sensor values based on this little floaty part to tell you whether the tank is full or empty. So let's get started. Here's how to wire it. Push the wires from the tank sensor into two of the Servo GX terminal blocks, lining them up top to bottom like so. The polarity does not matter for these. Push the terminal block into the tank sensor port and touch the GX touch screen to bring up the menu. Press the menu button, press settings, scroll all the way to the bottom and click on IO for inputs and outputs. Click on analog inputs, and we connected our tank sensors to tank level input number one on the Servo GX as noted by the numbers on the top of the unit. So we're going to turn on tank level input number one. Go back to settings levels, Scroll up and click on display and language. Toggle the show tank overview setting to on. Press the back button twice. And now you should be able to see your newly connected tank sensor. Click on the new tank sensor. Click setup. And change your settings to whatever is appropriate for your setup. I'm gonna say this is for a freshwater tank. And I want it to be measured in US gallons. Now our Titan Vans over the wheel well tank is 20 gallons. And for the standard, change that to whatever resistance is listed on the spec sheet for your sending unit. Now, if you aren't sure what the standard should be, or it doesn't say in the manual or whatever, you can click custom, scroll down to sensor value, move the float to the full position or all the way up and note the number next to the sensor value and put that number in the sensor value when full setting. Scroll back down to the sensor value Move the float to the empty position and note the number next to the sensor valve and put that number in the sensor valve when empty setting. Now, if you have a tank that's shaped like a cone or something like that, for whatever reason, uh, where if the float valve is at 
but that doesn't necessarily mean you have 50% of your water left. You can actually set a custom shape telling the Servo GX that, for example, if the sensor is at 75%, that means I have 56% water left. And if the sensor's at 50%, I have 27% water left. And if the sensor's at 25%, I have 9% water left. And there's calculators and geometry nerds who I'm sure would love to help you with that if you have a weird shaped tank like that. And lastly, we could set up a low level alarm that will give us an alert on the home screen if our tank falls below, for example, 5% for more than five seconds. Now that's all set up, we can back out to the home page by hitting the pages button. Scroll to the left and we can see our tank levels. Now, if we move the float, the level on the screen responds accordingly. If we move the sensor all the way to the bottom, we get an audible alarm that our tank has fallen below 5% for five seconds. And if you're installing a float valve like this in a wastewater tank and wanted the opposite to happen when the tank level is full, there's also a high level alarm in the sensor setup menu we were previously in. And that's really all there is to it. You can add up to four of these sensors to one Servo GX to monitor all kinds of tanks, really. I really want to add a sensor to the gray water tank in our camper van conversion so that I can keep an eye on when it's getting full. Now I didn't run wires for a resistive float valve, so I'm just going to do it wirelessly and I'll show you how you can do it too. Now before we get started, the sensors that we're using are designed to be used with freshwater tanks and not gray water tanks, but I'm curious and I just want to try it out and they're not that expensive anyway. So the disclaimer here is your mileage may vary and this video can be used for freshwater tanks just as easily and I'll update the pinned comment below for my actual experience as a gray water tank sensor once I get to use it for a bit. Now let's get started. I'm going to be using this Mopeka Pro water tank sensor. It gets mounted to the bottom of the tank and uses ultrasonic waves to determine when the tank is full and empty. There's some pretty specific instructions included with the device for mounting it, but our super small tank makes it kind of tough to follow those exactly. So we're just doing the best we can. And instead of using their included snap ring, like you probably should, I'm just going to scuff and clean the bottom of the tank. Put the included sonic grease on the little black pad on the sensor as per their instructions and use some quick setting epoxy to hold it in place. Good enough for who it's for. Now, on to programming. First, we need to download the Mopeka Tank Check app and open it up. And hold the sync button on the sensor until it shows up on the phone. Now this uses your phone's Bluetooth, so make sure that's turned on as well. Click on the sensor that just showed up in the app, and it's showing that our tank is low, which is true because it's both empty and uh, upside down. Now, if you're wanting to just view your tank stats and get alarms just from the app, stay tuned. But if you don't really care about that and just want to be able to view this information on your Servo GX, skip ahead to this timestamp in the video. We can change our device name here, then change our tank height here. Now this should not necessarily be the actual tank height, but more so how high above the sensor should the water be when you want the sensor to read 100% full, which in our case is about 11 inches before the tank is dangerously full. We want the sensor to take a reading every three and a half seconds. And I'm going to turn the notifications off because since this tank is a gray water tank, I want the alarms when the tank gets nearly full versus nearly empty, which is currently not an option on this app. Now, let's fill up the tank and watch the app. And the tank is now full, the bubbles have stopped interfering with the signal, and the app seems to be working as expected. Now let's move on to syncing this sensor up to our Victron Servo GX. We're gonna to navigate to our settings menu, Scroll down and click on I.O. for inputs and outputs and click on Bluetooth sensors. And if that's not there, you probably just need to update your Servo GX firmware. Toggle enable to on 
and the sensor should show up down here in just a few seconds and we can click to toggle it to active. Press back twice, scroll up and click display and language and make sure that show tanks overview is on for showing tank info on the main screen. Press back twice to access the device list and click on the fuel tank so we can program proper settings. Ignore everything on this page for now, just scroll down and click on setup. I'm going to change my fluid type from fuel to wastewater, change my volume units to US gallons, and then I can notice that my sensor value is 27.2 centimeters when the tank is full. So I'm going to tap on sensor value when full and change that to the same value. And when we drain the tank, we can change the sensor value when empty to match whatever the sensor value at that time says, but it should be at or near zero. Lastly, I'll scroll up to capacity and change this to seven gallons to match my tank size. Now I'll navigate to my main page, scroll over, and I can see that my sensor is matched up with my gauge. Now I will say that there are some inconsistencies between the Servo GX and the Mopika app, but I suspect the Servo GX is actually more accurate since we're telling the Servo GX what empty and full is based on the sensor readings as opposed to a tape measure reading. And since the servo is reading 7% when the tank is actually empty, we're going to navigate back to the settings menu, notice that the sensor value is 2.6, and then change the sensor value while empty to 2.6 to match. Now I know that the actual sensor is about an inch above the actual bottom of the tank, which will skew that empty number, but ultimately, I don't really care if my gray water tank is at 5% versus 15%. I realistically just care about when it's almost full. Now at the time of filming this video, there are no options to have high level and low level tank alarms set through the Servo GX for these particular sensors. But I have brought it up to Victron and if it's feasible, they're usually pretty quick to add that functionality in a simple firmware update and I'll update the pinned comment or video description to let you know if that gets added. I wanted a way to get notifications on my phone for when the water tank in our van was in danger of freezing or when the temperature was approaching too hot to leave our dog inside while we were out for a bit. And to do that, I'm going to use the RuviTag Bluetooth sensors synced to my Victron Servo GX to relay that info to the Victron VRM portal so I can get notifications anywhere I have internet signal. It's really easy to set this up, and here's what I did. I'm going to tap the screen, tap the menu button, tap the settings button, scroll down and tap Bluetooth, and just make sure that that's enabled, which it is by default. Back out and scroll down and then tap IO for inputs and outputs. Then tap Bluetooth sensors. And if this option isn't available, I would just need to update the firmware on my Servo GX to make sure it shows up. Enable Bluetooth sensors. And then I can open the Ruby tag package and just remove the plastic pull tab from the Ruby tag so it starts transmitting its temperature info. There's already a battery inside. The Ruby tag should show up right here in just a few seconds and I just want to make sure that it's enabled. And I'm also going to label this particular Ruby tag with this specific number and where I'm going to install it just to help me keep them straight. and then press back three times to get back to the device list. Then tap generic temperature sensor, which is our Ruby tag. Tap device. Then scroll down and tap device name, and I'm gonna change mine to plumbing enclosure. Tap back twice, and now we can see the temperature data right on the devices list. Now this is usually set to Celsius from default, but I've already changed it to Fahrenheit, but if you need to change it, here's how to do it. Tap settings, scroll down and tap display and language, 
scroll down and tap units, and then tap temperature to change it to Fahrenheit or Celsius or whatever you like. And then tap back twice to get back to the device list to see the temperature is indeed in Fahrenheit like we want. Now that everything is set up here on the Servo GX, it should also be populating on the Victron VRM portal. Now, if you're following along with me, uh, trying to do this on your own system, I'm going to assume that you already have VRM portal set up and running at this point. Now, I want to use the VRM portal to set up these alarms to let me know when the Ruby tag temp sensor falls outside of the parameters I set it to. I need to do this through the VRM portal for remote access since if we're in the van, we likely already know approximately what temperature it is, and we need to be able to get these alerts for when we're away from the van. I'm gonna open up the VRM app on my phone, and you can do this through the VRM portal website on your computer. And we can already see the Ruby tag data right there in our dashboard. Next, bring up the menu and tap settings, and then alarm rules, and then add new alarm rules. Select the temperature sensor, tap next, set the parameter to temperature, next again, and then add your parameters. Now since I want to be notified when my plumbing enclosure is at risk of freezing, I'm going to set this alarm to turn on at zero degrees and to reset or turn off at two degrees. Now these alarms have to be programmed in Celsius at this time, uh, regardless of what unit the rest of your system is set to. Now, I don't really care about high temperatures in this case, so I'm going to set both of these to really high, say 100 degrees. Tap next. And I would like the alarm to happen as quickly as possible, which is 60 seconds after the temp falls to my desired set point from the previous page of freezing. And now I'm going to go take the Ruby tag and toss it in the freezer to test it. And as the temperature drops to freezing, we get an alarm right there on my phone. And as long as both the Servo GX and my phone are connected to an internet signal in some fashion, this is going to work. Now for the other Ruby tag, I'm going to place it just somewhere in the normal living space of the van. And I'm going to program it so that I get an alert anytime the interior of the van climbs above, say, 90 degrees. So we know when our dog is nice and safe for when we have to leave her alone for a few minutes. And the process of programming additional Ruby tags is the exact same as we just showed, maybe with just different you know, temperature parameters. So I'm not gonna show it again. Now there is a Ruby tag app where you can check out the status of your Ruby tags while you're within Bluetooth range. Now, I can't really think of a reason that would be super useful, except for maybe sticking one like outside of the van somewhere so I could know what the outside temp is, but you know, feel free to play around with it if you like. In this video, I'll be showing you how we built the upper cabinets in our Ford Transit. We're gonna cover the design, the construction, the mounting, and even the lighting. Welcome to Explorers.life. My name is Nate, and I teach people how to build DIY campers. Let's get started. We built our cabinets in SketchUp so we knew exactly what everything would look like and what size all of our cuts would need to be. We use the Open Cut List SketchUp plugin to export a cut list so that we could use as much of the sheet of plywood as possible with minimal excess. For this build, we are using 4x8 sheets of half-inch birch. We printed our cut list for quick reference, and then we measured and marked our cuts. We made our initial cuts using a circular saw with a makeshift DIY track saw guide kind of thing. And then once the pieces were more manageable, we switched over to a table saw and used a crosscut sled for some more of the smaller pieces. To keep track, we used the labels from the cut list so we knew which cuts were which. And we ended up with an IKEA-esque assortment of rectangles. Since the walls and ceilings of the van are curved, we made a foam template for our upper cabinet verticals. We traced the foam onto our verticals and made our cuts. Next, Steph prepared all of the rear braces with pocket holes using our Craig jig. And finally, it's time to start assembling. 
We glued each piece with tight bond wood glue before we clamped it together and then used Craig screws to secure our horizontal braces to our cabinet verticals. Then we attached our second horizontal brace to the verticals using a spacer so that we could make sure that our braces were completely even and parallel. Next, we flipped our upper cabinet over and prepared it for our shelf bottom. For the shelf bottoms, we used quarter inch birch here. And once it was lined up, we used finishing nails and a nail gun to secure it in place. And after a quick dry fit, it was time to assemble the next two shelves using the exact same method. And just like that, our upper cabinets are ready for finishing and edge banding. We cleaned up the edges using a router and a flush trim bit, and then Steph sanded the edges that would be getting edge banding. Now this edge banding is just really thin, half inch wide wood veneer that has heat activated adhesive on the back. We clamped the edge banding in place and used an iron to melt the adhesive. And then we used a chisel for a clean edge on the ends. We put edge banding on any of the visible and unsightly edges. Next, we trimmed off the excess material using a chisel. And then filled in any holes with wood filler. And after letting that dry, we sanded the cabinets and Grace finished them off with paste wax. Next, it was time to make brackets to attach the cabinet to the L-track of the van. For this, we used two inch by eighth inch and one and a half inch by one sixteenth inch aluminum angle. With the drill press, we made holes to fit the L-track hardware. The cabinet will sit on the one and a half by one sixteenth inch angle. And then the two smaller pieces up top of 2 inch by 1 8 inch angle will attach to the ceiling L track. The top angle will attach to the cabinet itself with quarter inch bolts. We prepared the angle for painting by sanding and wiping it down with alcohol. To match the theme of the van, we spray painted the angle black. Next, it was time to prepare the angle to attach to the cabinet by drilling equally spaced holes across the bottom. Now we're using rivets to secure the angle to the cabinet bottom, 
which just insert through the angle and through the wood, and then I used a rivet gun to fasten them together. And lastly, I attach the smaller brackets to the top. For the indirect lighting, we're using these black LED strip light tracks with a diffuser for our cabinet lighting. We cut them to link and countersunk our screw holes so the strip would fit flush. And then it was time to wire. We opened the LED strip light L connectors with a knife, paying special attention to which one is positive and negative. And then we loosen the terminal screws on our solderless LED connectors and inserted the L connector and tightened the screws with the world's smallest screwdriver. Now on the other end, we inserted our positive wire and our negative wire and tighten them down, paying special attention to which side of the L connector was positive and negative. Now those two wires got quarter inch wire loom and heat shrink to clean them up since they would be visible. I cut the factory barrel connector off on the LED light strip by cutting on the cut mark, and then inserted it under the pins of the L connector, paying special attention to positive and negative on both the L connector and the light strip, and then snap the connector shut. We cut the LED strip to length by cutting on the cut mark and then wiped down the track with alcohol. Now these LED strips have an adhesive on the back and we just stuck it down to the track. We secured the wires for the lights down with some temporarily uh, white clips that we switched out for black ones later on and installed the diffuser. For the lights that will go on the bottom, we did the exact same process. And then we drilled a hole for the wire to feed up through the bottom of the cabinet. Then we prepared those wires for our Anderson plug. We attached the Anderson pins to our positive and negative wires. and then inserted them into the Anderson connector housing.
Those wires also got wire loom and heat shrink. Now all those wires from the LED strips were connected to the wires for the Anderson port with lever nuts, positive to positive and negative to negative. We brought the cabinet into the van and began to attach it to the ceiling and the wall L-Track. We tightened down all of the L-Track hardware and plugged our lights into the Anderson port that is connected to the switch on the wall that switches half of our upper Anderson connectors on and off. Now for the remaining upper cabinets, we did the exact same method and are super happy with the results. And that pretty much wraps up this project. We are super happy with how these cabinets turned out. They are strong, but also incredibly lightweight. And for actual storage, we are just using these cloth storage cubes so that we can take them out, rummage through them, and then put them back as we need. The diffused and indirect lighting gives a great feel to the camper when we're just hanging out. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. In this video, I'm going to show you how we built this storage module for our DIY camper van conversion. Let's get started. I think we should just keep this cabinet really simple. I mean, realistically, it only has to hold a couple of uh, packing cubes since Peak Design is sponsoring this video. Peak Design? Like the camera bag company? Uh, yeah, well, sort of. They also have a bunch of ultralight packing cubes and phone cases and camera mounts, camera accessories, and a bunch of other really cool packing accessories. But the cabinet will have space for camera cubes, right? Oh, yeah, we can do that, that's fine. And a USB charging hub. Oh yeah, that's that's a good idea too, I guess. And an outlet on the side. But there's already one in this. Seat. And lights underneath. I mean, I guess that makes sense since the toilet Oh, cabinet. and it also needs to be that modern industrial look like the rest of the van. Let's just get started. For this build, we made a cut list in SketchUp and labels to keep track of the pieces. We cut our larger pieces of half inch birch with a circular saw and then cut our smaller pieces with the table saw. Once our pieces were cut, Steph made all of the pocket holes that we needed with our Craig jig. While Steph drilled, we glued the bottom to the large side panels. And then we clamped and secured everything with Craig screws. Using the same method, we glued, clamped, and screwed the back supports and top rails. Next, it was time to make the drawer for the Peak Design storage module. To secure the drawer bottom, we glued and used finishing nails rather than screws to secure it all together. The glue bonds all the wood together and the finished nails hold it in place so that the glue can dry. And then we used the same method for the toe kick base. We measured and then screwed that to the module base. And just like that, we are ready for edge banding and finishing. We cleaned up the edges using a router and a flush trim bit. For the visible edges, we added edge banding. This edge banding is just really thin, half inch wide wood veneer that has heat activated adhesive on the back. We used an iron to melt the adhesive and then a small roller to press it down. We sanded off any rough edges and then repeated that process with our drawer faces and shelf. Next, we sanded all the pieces with 220 grit sandpaper and a random orbital sander, and then finished with paste wax by rubbing it on, letting it dry for a half hour or so, and then buffing it off. Next, it was time to add our drawer. We flipped over our module and used a spacer to position our top drawer slide and secured the slides with screws. And then repeated the same process on the other side, using a spacer rather than measuring makes it easier to get the slides perfectly straight and equal on each side. 
Next, it's time to secure the slide to the drawer itself. We placed a spacer between the top of the drawer and the top of the cabinet and screwed the slides to the drawer. With the top drawer in place, we flipped the module back over and it was time to attach the drawer face. We clamped the drawer face in place using five business cards on each side as a spacer. And then temporarily screwed our drawer to the face as well as a pilot hole for the latch. We used a hole saw on our drill press and made a hole on the drawer face for the latch and then did the same on the drawer itself using a slightly larger hole saw. And then we attached the face to the drawer. We used some marine slam latches and secured them from the back with screws. And then put the drawer back in its place. Then we put some glue onto our latch catch and attached it to the drawer frame. This latch stopper is what the latch clips onto when the drawer is closed. Now that our drawers are complete, it's time to add our shelf pin holes. For this module, we're gonna have one drawer and one shelf. We used our Craig shelf pin jig to perfectly space out our shelf pin holes. The pin and clamp kept it in place as we drilled, making sure not to drill all the way through the side panel. Our pins will sit in this hole. Unfortunately, due to some inconsistencies in the wood, we punched through twice. But we're able to remove the knots, glue, clamp, sand, and our panels looked good as new-ish. Next, we drilled our hole for the 120 volt outlet on the side of the module. With this outlet, we'll have easy access to charge our laptops from the driver's seat without cords dangling across the van. Next, we're attaching a cable chain for our USB charging hub wires that will be coming from inside the drawer. We shorten the chain by removing some of the middle links and just replacing the end. Then we threaded our USB cable through the chain and attached it to the back rail and bottom of the drawer. Now we can open and close the drawer without a mess of cables dangling down. We drilled a hole through the bottom of the drawer and threaded the cable through. Next, we screwed on our USB block mount and attached our USB block. Now we can charge camera batteries inside of the drawer without making a mess. Next, we drilled a hole on the side of the module and added a grommet so that we could pass wires back and forth through the cabinets as needed. To keep all of our Peak Design pouches from flying out while driving the van, we are attaching some perforated metal angle to the front of the module that we spray painted black off camera. We attach those with screws, and then we placed our Peak Design cubes into the module to see how high we needed to place the shelf. And then we inserted the shelf and secured it to the pins with screws. And then we tied some heavy duty bungee cords across and melted the ends with a hot knife. For our under cabinet lighting, we attached our track to the underside of the cabinet and secured it with countersunk screws. We open the LED strip light L connectors with a knife, and then we inserted the strip under the pins of the L connector, paying special attention to the positive and negative. And then we open the other side of the L connector with a knife and loosen the terminal screws on our solderless LED connectors and inserted the L connector and tighten the screws. And then we inserted our positive wire and our negative wire and tightened them down. Next, we exposed the adhesive on the back of the strip and attached it to the track. And added our diffuser. Then we drilled a hole in the base of the module and ran our wires through. These wires will eventually get connected to the switched Anderson ports behind our bathroom module and then we clamped down our wires so nothing would dangle down. 
We needed to extend the length of our USB charging hub wire, so we added butt splice connectors and more positive and negative wire. Then to clean it up, we added some heat shrink and wire loom. The rest of the wiring would be done once the module is actually placed in the van. Next, it was time to attach the brackets that will secure the cabinet to the L-Track on the wall and the floor of the van. We made these off camera, but they are simply two inch by two inch by eighth inch aluminum angle, cut to size, drilled for our L-Track hardware, and spray painted black. We glued, clamped, and screw these brackets to the module on the back support and on the toe kick base. Then we brought the module into the van. We had L-Track hardware installed on the wall and the floor, and we just moved our cabinet into place so they would attach to those brackets. We added a washer and a bolt and tightened it down to the L-Track. Now the module is safely secured to the L-Track in four different places. For our countertops, we are using one and a quarter inch thick butcher block. We cut it down to size with a circular saw, sanded it down with 220 grit sandpaper, and added two coats of Danish oil to the top to finish and buffed it off once dry. Then we attached our butcher block countertop to the cabinet using one and a quarter inch long screws. We are super happy with how this turned out and how flush it sits with our bathroom countertop. Now that the cabinet is installed, here's how we wired it. We have our 120 volt outlet on the side of the cabinet going into the van wall outlet right here. This is the Anderson connector that is switched from above the sliding door and it's connected to both of the lower LED light strips on both of these cabinets. And this one going to the lower Anderson connector is constant, going out to our toilet fan, as well as our USB hub wires that we extended earlier. And with that, our Peak Design camera storage module is all wrapped up. The ability to have the camera cube in the upper drawer is a much better solution than the egg crate foam that we had in our old Sprinter. The USB charging hub makes it easy to constantly have camera batteries charged and at the ready without having chargers laying around on all the countertops. The open shelves underneath decrease weight over drawers and doors and make it fast and easy to access our Peak Design packing cubes and pouches. The outlet on the side is great for being able to plug laptops in to our house electrical system while we're working in the front seats. And lastly, the LED light strip underneath gives a nice indirect glow to the inside of the van. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. In this video, I'll be showing you how we built the toilet cabinet in our Ford Transit camper conversion. We're going to cover the design, the construction, the mounting, and even the lighting. Welcome to Explorers.life. My name is Nate, and I teach people how to build DIY campers. Let's get started. We built our cabinet in SketchUp so that we knew exactly where everything would go and what it would look like and what size all of our cuts would need to be. We used the Open Cut List SketchUp plugin to export a cut list so that we could use as much of the sheet of plywood as possible with minimal excess. For this build, we made a cut list in SketchUp and labels to keep track of the pieces. We cut our larger pieces of half inch birch with a circular saw and then cut our smaller pieces with the table saw. And we're left with a bunch of rectangles. Now once our pieces were cut, Steph made all the pocket holes we needed with our Craig jig. While Steph drilled, we glued the bathroom module bottom to the large side panels. We clamped and screwed everything together with Craig screws. Next, it was time to add the top rails and back support. Using the same method, we glued 
clamped and screwed the back support and top rails. Next it was time to make the drawers for the bathroom module. For the drawer bottoms, we used half inch birch for the toilet drawer and quarter inch for the two upper drawers. To secure the drawer bottom, we glued and used finishing nails rather than screws to secure it all together. The glue bonds all the wood together and the finish nails just hold it in place so that the glue can dry. Then we did the exact same thing with the other two drawers. Next, our toe kick bases magically appeared. And then we measured and secured that to the module base. We then added another back support the one that will secure the module to the L-Track of the van. And then we prepared our drawer face frames by gluing and nailing two pieces of half-inch birch plywood together. And those will be added to the cabinet later on. And just like that, we are ready for edge banding and finishing. We cleaned up the edges using a router and a flush trim bit. Now for the visible edges, we added edge banding. This edge banding is just really thin, half inch wide wood veneer that has heat activated adhesive on the back. We used an iron to melt the adhesive and then a small roller to press it down. And then used a chisel for a clean edge on the ends. And then repeated that process with all of our drawer faces. Next, we sanded all the pieces with 220 grit sandpaper and a random orbital sander. And then finished with paste wax by rubbing it on, letting it dry for a half hour or so, and then buffing it off. Next, it was time to add our drawer slides. We flipped our module over and used a spacer to position our top drawer slide. And secured the slides with screws. And then we added another spacer for our next drawer and secured that with screws as well. And then repeated the same process on the other side using a spacer rather than measuring makes it easier to get the slides perfectly straight and equal on either side. Next is time to secure the slides to the drawers themselves. We placed the spacers between the top of the drawer and the top of the cabinet and screwed the slides to the drawer. Then we placed more spacers and secured the next drawer.
With the top drawers in place, we flip the module back over and place the much heavier duty slides for the bottom drawer, which will have the toilet secured to that. We drilled pilot holes and sunk in some number 14 screws. We made sure this was as secure as possible so that it would hold full body weight when we sit down. And then we attached those drawer face frames that we made earlier to the module, spaced as planned in the original 3D model. Next, it was time to attach the drawer faces. We clamped the drawer face in place using a couple business cards on each side as a spacer. Then we drilled our holes to attach the drawer to the face, as well as a pilot hole for the latch. Using a hole saw on our drill press, we made a hole on the drawer face for the latch. and then did the same on the drawer itself using a slightly bigger hole saw. Then we attached the face to the drawer and put it in place. We used some marine slam latches and secured them from the back with screws. We put some glue onto our latch catch and attached it to the drawer frame. And this latch stopper is what the latch clips onto when the drawer is closed. Now for the larger drawer face, we did a very similar process. The main difference is that we added two latches up top on either side for some added support. Now that our drawers are complete, it's time to add our cabinet lighting. We attached our track to the underside of the cabinet and secured it with countersunk screws. We're using an LED strip with a black diffuser for this. We cut our LED strip to length at the cut mark on the strip and it was time to wire. We open the LED strip light L connector with a knife, paying special attention to which one is positive and negative. And then we loosen the terminal screw on our solderless LED connectors and inserted the L connector and tightened the screws. And then we inserted the strip under the pins of the L connector, paying special attention to positive and negative. We prepared our wires with quarter inch wire loom and heat shrink, and then inserted our positive wire and negative wire and tightened them down. paying special attention here to which side of the L connector was positive and negative. We put heat shrink on one end and prepared the other end to eventually be put into the lever nuts that will go to the van wall.
Next, we prepared our other wires for the Anderson pins. These wires also got quarter inch wire loom and heat shrink. We crimped our Anderson pins to our positive and negative wires. And inserted them into the Anderson connector housing. Next, we exposed the adhesive on the back of the strip and attached it to the track. Then added our diffuser to the strip. We clamped down our wires to the module so that they wouldn't hang down and were nice and secure. The rest of the wiring would get done once the module is placed into the van. Next we drilled a hole in the side of this module and added a grommet. This will allow us to pass wires between this cabinet and the Peak Designs cabinet that we'll be installing right next to this one. Next it was time to attach the brackets that will secure the cabinet to the L-track on the wall and the floor of the van. We made these off camera, but they are simply 2 inch by 2 inch by 8 inch aluminum angle, cut to size, and drilled for our L-track hardware, and spray painted black. We glued, clamped, and screwed these brackets to the module on the back support and on the toe kick base. Now we're using one and a quarter inch thick butcher block for our countertops in the van. We cut it down to size with a circular saw, sanded it down, and added Danish oil to the top to finish. After waiting about 15 minutes, we added another coat and buffed it off once dry. Next we brought the module into the van. We had L-Track hardware installed on the walls and floor and moved our cabinet into place so they would attach to our brackets. The module is secured to L-Track in four places. With the module secured in place, it was time to test the weight capacity of the toilet side. And it didn't break, thank goodness. Now that the module was installed, we attached the wires from the LED strip to the wires for the Anderson port using lever nuts, positive to positive and negative to negative, and then plugged it in. Then we attached our butcher block countertop to the cabinet just using screws. Then we put our toilet in place, making sure that we had enough room to spin the poop agitator. We removed the liquids tank and the solids tank and screwed the toilet to the module in four places. We put our charcoal filter in place and then replaced the tanks. And then we crimped on an Anderson plug to the wires that comes with the toilet that would power the vent fan and connected that to the bottom of the toilet and the constantly on 12 volt Anderson port in the wall. And our toilet is good to go. 
Our top drawers are perfect for storing smaller toiletries in our Peak Design bags and packing cubes. Now a quick test to see if our lights work and that pretty much wraps up this project. We are super happy with the results, how strong our drawers are, and how the module looks in the space. In this video, I'm gonna show you how we built this kitchen module in our DIY transit camper van conversion. Let's get started. For this build, we made a model and cut list in SketchUp and labels to keep track of the pieces. We cut our larger pieces of half inch birch with a circular saw and then cut our smaller pieces with the table saw and we're left with a bunch of rectangles. Once our pieces were cut, Steph made all the pocket holes we needed with our Craig pocket hole jig. While Steph drilled, we glued the module bottom to the large side panels. And then we clamped and secured everything with the Craig pocket hole screws. Using the same method, we glued, clamped, and screwed the rest of the top rails and drawer supports for the kitchen module. Next, we slid in our refrigerator so that we could measure where our trim pieces would need to go. Then we attached those with glue and finish nails. Next, we attached the cabinet base with glue and Craig screws, and then started on our drawers. Now this drawer specifically will have a space cut out for our sink drain. And then we made the rest of our drawers and even one specifically for a trash bin. And just like that, we are ready for edge banding and finishing. For finishing the edges of our plywood, we used half inch wide edge banding that has heat activated adhesive on the back. Next, we sanded all the pieces with 220 grit sandpaper and an orbital sander. And then we finished with paste wax by rubbing it on, letting it dry for a half hour or so, and then buffing it off. Next, it was time to add our drawers. We flipped over our module and used a spacer to position our top drawer slide and secured the slide with screws. And then just repeated the same process on the other side. Using a spacer rather than measuring makes it easier to get the slides perfectly straight and equal on either side. And then we use the same method for all the other drawer slides in the rest of the module. Next, it's time to secure the slides to the drawers themselves. We place spacers between the bottom of the drawer and the bottom of the cabinet and screwed the slides to the drawer. And then we added our drawer face frame with glue and finishing nails. And then use the same method for the next drawer and the next face frame. Now with the first couple of drawers in place, we flipped the module over and added our top drawer. Next, we added our false drawer faces with finishing nails before adding our drawer faces to the actual drawers using five business cards here as a spacer. For the other top drawer face, it will simply tilt out with a sponge tray since the sink will be right behind it. We added our hinges and our drawer face, but it was making some contact to the face, so we used the table saw to add a beveled edge. With all the drawers all wrapped up, we're now ready to move on to our latches. We used a spacer here, so the height of our latches were the same on each drawer. And then we drilled our pilot holes and used a hole saw, making sure to only cut through the drawer itself. And then used a smaller hole saw for the drawer face on the other side. Now we're using the same marine latches as the rest of the cabinets in the van, and they simply attach with screws from the back. And then we glued and screwed our latch catch in place so that the latch has something to grab onto. And before we wrapped up for the day, we added a grommet to pass wires through the side of the cabinet, and now we can add our under cabinet lighting. We loosened the screws on the solderless LED connectors, stripped back some insulation on the wires, and inserted our positive and negative wire, and tightened down the screws. And then we added some heat shrink and wire loom to clean up the wires. 
Next, we fed the wires through a hole in the bottom of the cabinet. We loosened the other two screws on the connector and inserted our LED strip, paying special attention to positive and negative. We removed the adhesive and stuck the strip down to our lighting track and added some clamps to keep the wire in place. Now we're gonna have lights on all sides of this kitchen module, so we used L connectors at the corners. And then we stuck our diffuser down and used a roller to put it in place. The lights will be powered by the lower switched Anderson port inside the plumbing enclosure. So we crimped on some Anderson pins to the other side of the positive and negative wires. And then we put those pins into the housing, which are now ready to be plugged into our switched Anderson port in the van. Next, we started making our back panel for the module with an opening and door to slide the gray water tank in and out as needed. We sanded, added paste wax, and then glued the panel in place and added finished nails to hold as the glue dried. We used a rivet gun to attach the hinges that will allow the back door to swing open and closed. And then we added a marine latch in the same way as all the others on the module. Now there was a bit of a gap between the latch and the panel, so we just added a spacer here for the latch to grab onto. At this point, we also used a hole saw and a Dremel to attach a vent to the side of the module for the fridge. We're using a one and a quarter inch thick butcher block for our countertops in the van. We cut it to size with a circular saw and started making our cutouts for the sink and the induction stove using a circular saw and jigsaw. And we use the sink cutout to make a cutting board to place inside the sink when we're not using it for a bit of extra countertop space. And then we sanded everything down and added two coats of Danish oil to finish and buff it off once dry. While the Danish oil dried, we rolled up some plumber's putty into this cool snake shape, wrapped it around the drain, and installed it in our sink. And tightened it down from the back, then removed the excess putty. We added our sink trap on the bottom and then added our hoses and connectors to drain our sink water into our seven gallon gray water tank. And then we attached our faucet to the sink. Next, it was time to attach the brackets that will secure the cabinet to the L-Track on the floor of the van. We made these off camera, but they are simply two inch by two inch by eighth inch aluminum angle, cut to size, drilled for our L-Track hardware, and spray painted black. We also have one for a little higher up for the wall L-Track. We are using a DC powered isotherm refrigerator for this build, but the wires were a bit short, so we needed to extend them. For that, we simply added some butt splice connectors to our positive and negative wire and added additional wire. And then we added some wire loom and heat shrink to clean it up. And then added lever nuts at the ends to be connected later to our constant on Anderson port. We wanted to install a 120 volt outlet in this module for kitchen appliances and for the passenger seat when it's turned around, but needed to make sure that it would fit above the fridge and below the top drawer as we only had millimeters to spare. After checking our measurements, we made our pilot hole and used a hole saw for the cutout. We secured the 120 volt outlet and reinstalled our fridge vent below. And then we put our fridge back in place and secured it to our trim pieces with screws. With the Danish oil dried and the countertops buffed, we attached our sink to the butcher block. The sink comes with mounting hardware and simply tightens down onto the underside of the cabinet. We tightened those down and then moved the countertop very gracefully onto the kitchen module probably should have asked for help here. Once in place, we used our angled drill bit to drive in four screws in the front and a long driver for the screws in the back.
We put the module into the van and slid it into place, securing the brackets to our L-Track hardware. And then we added some super glue to our induction cooktop to keep it from bouncing around and placed it on the countertop. We pushed the wire from the induction cooktop and 120 volt outlets through our grommets along with our wires for the refrigerator and under cabinet lights. This Anderson connector goes to the switched Anderson port for the under cabinet lights. These get constant power, which are powering the fridge, which gets spliced into this Anderson connector that's going to our water pump, and then our 120 volt plugs go into this 120 volt outlet. The Anderson port is way down at the bottom and impossible to see, so you'll just have to take my word for it that they're connected. Next, we connected our sink to our plumbing enclosure, and then we slid in our seven gallon gray water tank and secured it with a bungee, and connected it to the sink drain. And just like that, our kitchen module is all wrapped up. For a van, we have an absolutely massive sink, a clean looking induction cooktop powered by our house battery bank, a sleek 2.3 cubic foot DC powered refrigerator from Isotherm, and all kinds of storage space for pans, silverware, cooking utensils, and a nice and easy way to access our gray water tank from the outside of the van. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. In this video, we're gonna be making this platform bed for our transit camper van conversion. Let's get started. We wanted to be sure that our bikes would fit in the space below the bed when it's installed. So we measured the top of my seat on the bike to see how much space our bikes needed. With that measurement, we measured and marked where all of our brackets needed to go. Then we started cutting. We're using Unistrut for this build because it seemed easier to work with than 8020 when building a simple platform like we are, and it'll look better and be stronger than wood, and we haven't used it in this build, so we thought it would be fun to show something new. We cut our Unistrut using an angle grinder and then tried it with a reciprocating saw, which ended up being faster, and then used a file to clean up the edges. We had to make some additional cuts in the Unistrut for clearance and we're ready to test fit our middle supports with the front and back rails. Next, we laid out our frame and started to make our gusset plates to connect the middles to the ends. We're using 16 gauge steel for these plates. We used a bandsaw to cut everything to size and a file to clean up the edges. Each gusset plate needed four holes, so we're gonna use our drill press for this. Next, we sprayed our Unistrut and gusset plates with some matte black spray paint. After two coats on all sides, we were ready to connect the plates to the Unistrut. To connect the Unistrut to the gusset plates, we're using bolts, lock washers, washers, and spring nuts. We inserted our spring nuts into the Unistrut by pushing it down, twisting it, and moving it into place to line up with the gusset plate holes. And then we added our bolts, lock washers, and washers, and screwed them into the spring nut. And then repeated this process five more times. Everything will get tightened down fully once it's all assembled in the van. Next, we mounted our L brackets that will hold up the Unistrut to the L track on the wall of the van using our L track hardware and tighten these down all the way in four places. And then we placed our front Unistrut on the brackets and then moved to the back of the van and rotated the Unistrut into place. We moved our middle strut into the van, slid a spring nut into the underside of the back strut, and then used a bolt lock washer, and washer to secure it to the spring nut. And repeated that on the other side as well. Again, these will all get tightened fully once everything is installed. We attached the bolts at the back of the middle strut and then repeated this process with the left and right struts as things got progressively tighter in the van. And now our Unistrut base is complete.
To prevent our pillows from falling into the abyss between the doors and the bed, we are adding a headboard. It will be supported by two large L brackets, which we secured to the Unistrut with bolts. The headboard will be made of one inch square tubing, which we cut to size with our reciprocating saw. Next, we made more gusset plates out of the 16 gauge metal so we could attach to the tubing without any welding. We squared up our corners and marked for our holes. We made some pilot holes and then moved over to the drill press to create our larger holes in both the plates and the square tubing. Before the final install in the van, we're going to spray paint everything matte black to match the modern industrial design in the van. Next, we're making the wooden part of the headboard using two pieces of half inch birch plywood to make a sturdy one inch thick headboard with the pretty sides of the plywood facing out since both sides would be visible. We cut them to size, added some wood glue, spread it around, removed the excess glue, and clamped it together overnight. The next morning, we unclamped our death trap of a glue up and routed the edges. We purposefully oversized one of the planks so that we could use a flush trim bit in our router and get the cleanest edge. We laid all of our headboard pieces out on the table to see where our threaded inserts needed to go, and then we drilled our pilot holes, and then with a tape marker for depth, added our larger holes. We added some super glue, and then put our threaded inserts into place and repeated this process on both sides of the headboard to make sure it would be secure. To finish the headboard, we sanded with 120 grit sandpaper and finished with paste wax. While the paste wax dried, we did our final assembly of the square tubing for the headboard. We attached two gusset plates in each corner and secured those with bolts, washers, and nuts. Next, we attached the square tubing to the L brackets that would secure the headboard to the Unistrut in the van. We also used bolts, washers, and nuts here. With the birch piece dried and buffed, we set it into place in the square tubing. Now that we know everything fits and lines up, we're going to go back and back out all of our bolts and add some Loctite and tighten everything down. With everything assembled, it was time to finally install the headboard in the van. We put our headboard into place and using spring nuts and bolts, secured the headboard to the bed frame. Next, it was time to install our bed slats. We got these from Amazon and they just come in two sets. We unfolded them and then decided we'd like to fasten them to the middle strut to prevent any sliding around while we're driving the van. With the slats clamped into place, we drilled a hole through the bottom of the center of the slat, added a T-nut to the top of the slat, and used a long bolt to pull it into the slat and down into place, and then replaced that bolt with a shorter one. We did this multiple times down the center of a handful of the slats until we felt it was secure enough to not slide around. With our slats in place, it was time to move on to our side shelves. We're adding side shelves on each side of the van that will lay flush against the bottom of the Unistrut bed frame. These shelves will give us a place to put down our phones and water bottles and will prevent anything from falling under the bed on either side. We're using quarter inch birch for this. We cut, sanded, and paste wax our side shelves. And to support the shelves, we're gonna be using five inch long flat brackets with spring nuts and bolts to secure it to the Unistrut. Then we moved our shelves into place. And secured it to the brackets with bolts. And finally, it was time to install our mattress. We ordered our mattress from Tachta. It arrives in a compact box with the mattress rolled up inside. The mattress is lightweight and was pretty easy to bring into the van with just one person. We started cutting the plastic with scissors and rolled it out into place. Once we cut a hole and released the vacuum seal, the mattress started to inflate pretty much instantly. We removed all the plastic and let the mattress fully inflate overnight. 
While this finishes fluffing, here are some details about this mattress. This is a six inch thick, three layer, full size Utopia mattress from Tochta. Tochta mattresses can be completely customized, not only the thickness and size of the mattress, but you can also add custom notches, cuts, and angles right in their online mattress builder. They also make hinge mattresses for those of you who want some kind of fold up or adjustable bed. Special thanks to Tochta for sponsoring this video, and now back to the build. And just like that, we are all wrapped up with this project. We are super happy with how it turned out. We have a ton of space below the bed to fit our mountain bikes as well as easy access to our upper cabinets and light switches in the rear of the van. Having the cross breeze from our Arctic turn windows will be great in the summer and we are so happy to be wrapping up this transit build. We are pretty good at wiring electrical systems and actually kind of decent at woodworking and we've even done some welding on some fences and some stuff like that. But I can't sew. And Steph's not much better at sewing than I am. When we asked my mom who can sew to make bug nets for our old sprinter, that was actually the first time I ever heard her cuss. Sewing is hard. And sewing netting is apparently really hard. So for this build, we got some pre-made bug netting from the bug wall, and we are going to be showing you how we installed them ourselves. Let's get started. And with watching that 15 minute video in two times speed, we're now pretty much experts. And another great thing about the uh, bug netting and stuff like that is whenever I get drunk and try to like veneer the sides of these C panels back here and it looks like absolute garbage, this is going to cover that up. So that's an added perk. Let's put this up there. Yeah, that's right. So this is going to sit up here pretty much just like this. And the top of this Velcro is going to line up at the bottom of the weather stripping. We're going to get this positioned and then clamp it in place. Now this is centered up and pretty level. We're just going to back the weather stripping off. Underneath the weather stripping, there's a bunch of like grease and stuff. We just needed to wipe that off. And it comes with some 3M double-sided foam tape that we have to pinch, put our uh, fabric in there and then put our weather stripping back up. So now the weather stripping is down, the tape is up. Uh, we're going to put this up, pinch it over this piece of metal right here, and then the thick clips that are included with the kit, we're just gonna put the thick clips on over the bug wall to hold it in place. So just make sure that everything is really well lined up before you start clamping things down because these clamps are a little bit difficult to get back off, but you can get them back off if you need to. Perfect. With all of the clips on the top and everything secured nice and tight and level, uh, it's time to put the weather stripping back on. There's a little bit of metal in the weather stripping, kind of open and closed. And it's important to squish all this back together uh, whenever you take the weather stripping off of the pinch weld up there so that it still holds everything nice and tight. So we're gonna do that all the way across and then start putting this weather stripping back in place. With the weather stripping back on the top and everything looking perfect, I might say, we're going to start working down the sides in the exact same manner. And with that all wrapped up, we are going to just trim off the excess up here and then we'll be done. This is all wrapped up and it looks really awesome. This, uh, this part right here is actually kind of like padded or insulated or something like that. So it's really nice. Like there is no way I could have ever sewn something uh, that's this quality. So I definitely think it's worth the kind of high price tag. The uh, panels right here, they just kind of accordion 
up and get out of the way so you can get your bikes and gear out of the back. It also has a bed flap that attaches back here and gets tucked up underneath the mattress to keep bugs from flying up and getting under your pillows. It also has a weather flap to keep rain from coming in here if you need to have the back doors open, getting the bikes out, and it just velcros up in place and zips down the side. And these can also roll up and out of the way. And this also has an interior privacy screen that gets, just gets Velcroed at the top and can also roll up and out of the way. And this is all wrapped up and we're gonna move around to the other side and do the sliding door cover. So we are going to be working on the sliding side door now and uh, the instructions, we already watched those and the process seems pretty much the same. Let's get started. We've got thin clips, thick clips, and tape, just like the back. Now with our tape in place, we can get the side door cover uh, also in place, just kind of centered up, the same as we did on the back door. This spot right here is super tight because our flooring actually comes all the way out and is smashed up against the weather stripping. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is get a pry tool and just kind of smash it back behind the weather stripping because there's no way to actually pull this weather stripping out. And this side is all wrapped up. This side was a little more finicky than the back, mainly because of the way that we did our floor, but if you didn't do the floor like we did it, you wouldn't have that problem. <laughs> so we're really happy with how these work. You know, it's magnetic here, so you can just like kind of walk through and then it snaps back together. That's pretty cool. These roll up entirely and get out of the way so that if you're in an area where there's really not bugs, uh, you don't have to have these in the way. And they're really, really durable. There's no way I could have sewn anything like this. The netting is pretty thick as is the fabric around the side. So I think it's gonna last as long as anything else in the van. In this video, I'm gonna show you how we mounted our mountain bikes inside of our camper van. Let's get started. We grab measurements inside the van so that we could mount our steel that's gonna be holding the fork mounts to the L-Track. We drilled some holes where the L-Track is going to bolt to the steel, and then we drilled some holes where the bike mounts are going to go into the steel. We tapped those holes with a thread tap so that we could actually bolt the bike mounts directly to the steel instead of having nuts or something like that on the bottom of the steel to make this whole thing super low profile. The actual fork mounts we're using are these through axle fork mounts from Unaka Gear Company. And these are simply going to just use machine screws and screw to those threaded holes that we just made. Underneath these nylon inserts here, you can just poke that out like so. And that shows the screw holes where we can put our machine screws there. And then we can just thread this machine screw directly into that tapped hole. Now these mounts are incredibly low profile. They're just a shade over a half inch from the bottom to the middle of the through axle, which actually makes some problems, which I'll show in just a second, but it comes with some spacers to overcome the problem.
So with this through axle mount on the bike, you can actually see that my brake caliper, the bottom part of it, is actually hitting the table before the mount can actually sit flush on the table. Now this is gonna be the case on most mountain bikes, I would venture to guess, and that's why the spacers are there. We can just take our spacers and put them underneath the bike mount. And so it fits flush. And I can actually just use the half inch spacer that comes with it, even though there's also a quarter inch. Uh, but you know, it's real close now. I'd say only probably an eighth of an inch. So just to be safe, I'm gonna go ahead and use both of the spacers for our application here. Now with our spacers figured out, we can go ahead and attach the mount to the flat bar that we already drilled. Uh, and we're going to be painting this later, but I always like making sure that things are actually gonna fit before I paint. With both of the bike mounts mounted, uh, we're gonna go put them in the van and uh, make sure that our holes for our L-Track fit. I think that fits perfectly. We've got a couple inches underneath our bed, so that's super nice. I didn't bolt anything down, but ultimately I can see that it's going to work when it's bolted down. So I'm gonna take this apart, disassemble everything, and paint the metal so it looks a little nicer. Now while I'm painting the steel, I just wanted to say that the way that I mounted it, I mean, you don't have to do it like that. The key point is just use number 10 flathead screws. So if you wanted to drill into wood, you know, number 10 wood screw is gonna fit just fine. If you want to use a number 10 machine screw into some 8020 or something like that, that's another great option too. Ultimately, there's all kinds of different ways that you can mount this, and I just wanted to do it the most low profile way that I could manage. So we're going to let the paint dry overnight, and then we're going to reassemble and permanently affix it in the van. So we let our bars dry overnight, and they look super nice. Uh, now it's time for final assembly to get them mounted in the van. This time, when we put the screws for the mounts in, we're going to use some uh, red Loctite to permanently mount them in place. And that wraps up this project. But here's a few more details about kind of the fitment of the bikes. So my bike is a large frame and it's sitting at 33 inches tall or so. The bottom of the bed is at 35 and a half or so. So we've got quite a bit of room in here. If we wanted to lower the bed just a little bit, we probably could. Probably not gonna do that though. It's nice to have a little bit of extra space. The caliper down here is about three quarters of an inch above the actual floor of the van. So we probably could have done without the spacers, but I like to have a little bit of room there in case I get a different bike or something like that. And I found that the simplest and easiest way for storing the front tires is simply to voile strap them to the side of the bike frame. And I'm really happy with this mounting method. It's really, really strong, it's easily removable, and it's really fast with these Unaka through axle bike mounts. We're gonna put all of this stuff onto that van to take it from this to this. So let's get started. Before we get started under the van, we need to take a measurement of our current ride height. On our driver rear, we're at 31 and an eighth, and our passenger rear, we're at 31 and three eighths. So that makes sense because our fuel tank is on this side of the van, only a quarter inch of difference, so not a huge deal. We're gonna check back after we install the rear to see actually how much lift we ended up with. We're gonna start on the rear of the van, so we need to jack it up so that the suspension can hang free. Now, if you had a hitch, uh, it'd be a great spot to jack up from, but since I don't have one, I'm gonna use two floor jacks and jack from where the hitch would attach on the frame under the van, and then we'll put our jack stands in place. 
Now that the tires are up off of the ground on our jacks, um, the back of the van is actually like nearly two feet off the ground, way too tall for my jack stands. So I'm going to take the tires and wheels off. Then we're going to lower the van onto the jack stands with a couple of spacers so the van is not supported only by the jacks while I'm going to be working under. Now, since we're only supported by the jacks, it's pretty important to stay out from underneath the van at this point. With the wheels and tires off, it's time to start unbolting things. Now you're looking at this from the back of the van and here is the rear shock. Uh, we need to undo the rear shock bolt, which is right here. Put a 18 millimeter wrench on this side, 15 millimeter socket on this side. With the shock disconnected, we're still looking at it from the same angle here. We're going to disconnect the axle housing from the leaf springs by unbolting the U-bolts that come up from the axle housing over the top of these leaf springs We're using a 21 millimeter socket on these two bolts up here and same on the back. We've removed the U-bolts and lowered the axle housing with the jack that came with the transit, made it nice and controlled the lower. And now it's time to move the new leaf pack into place. And to prepare for that, we need to clamp these two together so they don't move whenever we remove this nut with a 15 millimeter socket. With the center pin from the pre-existing leaf springs removed, it's time to get the Van Compass leaf pack prepared to put on the springs. And to do that, we just need to remove this nut and remove these two bolts. And the Van Compass leaf pack is simply gonna go in between the axle housing and the factory leaf springs. I had to lower the axle all the way to the ground, so I just picked it up and put a piece of wood under it and then moved the jack out of the way from under the axle. I had to do that because there wasn't enough clearance between the top of the axle and the factory leaf springs to get this into place. But once we did that, I grabbed Steph and she came down and helped me put the hardware pack in as I lifted up the leaf springs. She put these into place so it kind of holds everything together. And then we've also got these clamps and some other clamps that we're gonna to use to preload this spring so it's all squished together and rotate everything so it's nice and lined up. And then we'll be able to tighten our center pin and the hardware on the ends. Now our new leaf pack has been secured to the factory leaf springs, front, back, and in the middle. Next, I need to lift the axle housing back up so that this pin goes into the hole in the top of the axle housing. And then I can drop the new U-bolts that came with the leaf pack into the same holes that we took the old U-bolts out of. The leaf pack is completely installed. And the next step, if you are only doing a leaf pack, which really know why you would, uh, would be to put the wheel back on. But we are going to continue on and putting on a new shock. But the shock mounts on these Ford Transits, these guys right down here, actually hang down lower than the very center of the axle housing, the differential housing. And that kind of sucks for ground clearance. So Van Compass has this bracket that just fits in here and it only goes in there one way. You'll kind of see how it goes. And we put that in there and then we actually cut off the bottom part of this bracket so that we have more crown clearance. So to do that, I do need to get this shock out of the way, which is good because it's going in the trash anyhow. So this just goes in there literally one way. There's, if you put it in wrong, the holes don't line up. So just bloop like that. I put that in there like that. Then we're gonna mark our cut lines. And with the bottom of the shock mount cut off, sanded down, and painted so it's not going to rust, we can just put the bracket in place. Just put it 
here like this. Put a washer onto our big bolt. Put the bolt in just about an eighth of an inch. Put this spacer thing on the bolt inside of the bracket. And push the bolt through and put a washer and nut on the other side. And then we have this other smaller bolt. We're gonna put the bolt and the washer through the back and then the washer and the nut on the other side. And now we can tighten all this up. Now that the high clearance shock mount is all finished up, it's time to move on to the shocks. And we're gonna be installing these super fancy and high performance shocks that have adjustments. And I'm going to do my best to explain what the actual adjustments do. And although I'm gonna do my best, Van Compass has a really good video that shows some illustrations of what happens on the inside of the shock whenever you make these adjustments. The first adjustment is the actual overall shock tuning. So we've got soft and performance. And you change these by simply rotating the shaft and 360 degrees in whichever direction that you're looking for. Uh, performance is gonna be for heavier vans and soft is gonna be for lighter vans, basically. It also has a cold function, which is in soft because the oil that's inside of here is not gonna flow as quickly uh, during cold weather. So if you're in cold weather like we are, might be something you can change, uh, you know, right before winter when you're changing into snow tires. And to change it, you would simply unbolt the bottom part and then rotate that 360 degrees, bolt it back up, you're good to go. The other setting is this dial right up here. So regardless of which one you set this one at, you have these two settings times all of these settings on here. So you've got one, two, and three. Setting number one is going to be the softest setting out of all of these up here. And that's gonna be for off-road, uh, forest roads, anything where you're going long distances on pretty rough roads at slower speeds. Shock number or shock setting number three here, it's gonna be for like highway settings, uh, highway, high wind. So basically I-80 across Wyoming, when you have like strong crosswinds, this is gonna lock up the, uh, the, the shock to its hardest setting. So you're not gonna get that sway back and forth. Now shock setting number two is going to be the middle setting, which is gonna be for like everyday driving. And then even in two, you have these tiny micro adjustments that you can adjust to you know, just feel however you want to be driving. So there's all kinds of different adjustments here that ultimately I'm probably gonna keep it pretty much right in the middle, two, and then like four or five on here. And then I'm gonna play with it over time to see how it goes. When we get on the interstate, probably just gonna bump it up to three. When we head up Buff Pass just outside of town, gonna to dial it back down to one. So we're gonna get these installed. Bolts here, bolts here. The um, are, these are labeled on which side they go on, so pay attention to that and should be good to go. Putting this shock in and ran into a little issue here with this piece of hardware from our leaf pack. This, uh, the threads on this side of the bolt, they're just real close to the shock and I think as the suspension moves up and down, it's just going to get too close to this uh, reservoir here that uh, too close for my comfort. So I'm going to take this and swap that around. I'll leave a note, you know, on the video back when we did this to maybe do that from the start, but that'll be a quick little fix. And the shock is now installed and we are good to go there. We're set on setting number two, four, um, just right in the middle for now. Now the uh, next thing to do is to replace or to add a spacer to the bump stop. Now I've already pulled the bump stop off and it was just a matter of going like this and it came off. So we're going to take this bolt off. 
put our spacer in. Put our bolt back in and then put our bump stop back on. And with the bump stop installed, that wraps up this side of the suspension upgrade here on the uh, driver rear of the van. Now, a lot of you may be wondering why I didn't put the shock boot onto the shock. And that's because it weighs like 500 grams. And that's, you know, people are just always griping at me in the comment section below about how much things weigh. So I thought by omitting that, that would be the best way I could possibly think of to decrease the weight of this van. And with all the suspension upgrades done on this side, I've actually already done it on the other side as well. Uh, we're not gonna show that on camera because the uh, process is the exact same. So if you needed to know how to do it on the other side, just back up in this video and it's the same process. And with everything wrapped up on the back of the van, we're going to move our jacks underneath our axle so we can get our axle housing up a little higher. And then we're going to put our new uh, wheels and bigger tires onto here and then move to the front of the van. With the back of the van all finished up, we move to the front of the van, jack the front of the van up, slid our jack stands in place, remove the wheel and tire, and then lowered the jack to where the van is sitting on the jack stands and not the jack. And now we're ready to start disassembling everything up front. And there's a lot of parts to disassemble, but we're just gonna take it in a step-by-step -step process, just like it's shown in the instruction manual. And so it's kind of uh, manageable. And we're gonna start with the tie rod end right over here. So we're taking this off. I'm gonna flip it upside down and thread it on a few times so we can knock our tie rod free. Move this out of the way, and then we can just put this back on for safekeeping so we don't lose it. With the tie rod disconnected, we can move this over here so we can access the two bolts that are on the back side of the brake caliper. They're pretty hard to see, but it's pretty obvious where the caliper attaches to the steering knuckle. There's two big 21 mil bolts. And with the brake caliper off, we're just going to zip tie it up and out of the way so it's not hanging by the brake hose. Next up is the sway bar in link right here. Just loosen this. We may have to lift this whole assembly up just a little bit and knock this free. Next, we need to disconnect both of these wires from the uh, strut support right over here. And this one going to the brake, there's a little lever. If you follow this all the way up, it's impossible to see. You have to go by feel, and it's at the top of the connection. Just pull it toward you, and then that connection just pops right out, just like so. This one here is, we're going to have to undo this here. And it's just a trim clip, so you're realistically just pushing in all of these sides until this whole thing comes free right here. And a trim pry tool on the back side actually worked really good for that. With all of the sensors disconnected from the strut, uh, it's time to remove the axle nut right here on the front. And this is a huge nut, uh, 36 millimeters, and the tricky part about this is uh, when you spin this, the whole axle or the whole hub moves here. And so uh, you need a way to hold the hub in place so it doesn't spin. And so I've got a piece of Unistrut just laying around that I'm going to put in between these, the wheel studs here. And then we can put that on here and then it's going to capture the hub so it doesn't move. Success.
And with this nut free, we just need to make sure the CV shaft can go back up in there like that. And if it can't, if it's kind of stuck a little bit, you can just put this back on there, get a few threads on there, and then whack it with a hammer. But we don't need to do that, fortunately. Next up is going to be removing this bolt right back here. That is connecting the steering uh, knuckle here to the bottom of the strut. Next is the lower ball joint nut right down here. Just loosen that up, 30 millimeter socket. And that's all we're doing for now because I'm gonna put a jack under here to help us get this steering knuckle out of this lower control arm. And now that we have a fair amount of pressure lifting up this lower control arm with all of that weight on that nut on the lower ball joint right there, um, we're going to whack this with a hammer uh, and I hope this comes free. Uh, that's, that's the plan, so um, hammer. Hey, it came loose. Oh my gosh. Now, since that did come loose with just whacking on it with a hammer, uh, that's great. That's, that's actually fantastic. I must be doing something right in life for that to happen. If that doesn't happen, um, you can use a pickle fork. Uh, that is an option, but it's, there's a possibility of damaging the boot there. Uh, the other option is to use um, fire. Um, if you heat up this lower section of the control arm, that's going to expand that metal just a little bit heat it up for a minute, two minutes or so, and then whack on it with a hammer, and then it should come loose. So if you, those are really the resources you get, uh, and just be persistent with it. You know, sometimes it's just a pain in the butt. The next step is going to actually be removing this whole steering knuckle and everything right in here. And a lot of things are going to sort of happen at one time. We're going to take a breaker bar, and put it in this little hole in the lower control arm and pry the lower control arm so it gets down and out of the way and then we can pull the lower ball joint up and out of the lower control arm. When we do that, we'll pull this out a little bit and then the steering knuckle will come down off of this strut right here. So lots of stuff happening at one point. And now that's back here, we need to wrestle the CV axle or the CV shaft out of here. We're gonna support all this with a jack because that's the only thing that's holding this from falling on my foot at the moment. So the CV shaft just came out of the back of the steering knuckle there, and we don't want this to come apart, so we're actually just going to secure it to the lower control arm, zip tie or voile strap or whatever you've got in your own shop, just like that. Now we can drop this entire assembly off of the strut. Now the strut assembly needs to come out. <laughs> the top of the strut assembly is actually up underneath the dash. There are three bolts that are holding this strut assembly to the van itself. And I cheated. I've actually already done this on the other side and they were very difficult to get to. Now on the driver's side here, they seem like they're better, but if they're not, we have this little right angle um, impact driver adapter bit. Thing. It's got flexi neck on it, and then also a series of U-joints. And so, realistically, there's just three bolts holding this. They're just in a very awkward and terrible spot. Let's go see if we can even see them. The spot we need to get to is actually underneath the floor liner, effectively right behind this cup holder, and it is impossible to see. So we're just going to pop up an illustration of where it should be. But if you just go where this cup holder is, pull this floor liner back and then feel up and around right there. That's where it is. There are three bolts on top of studs in a kind of triangular pattern. Whenever I get to pull this out, you'll get to see what it looks like, but I'm gonna start with a wrench and see what I can do. Well, you get down your fiddle and you get down your bow, kick off shoes and you throw on the floor. Success. Now I have one more nut to go on the top of this strut inside. But as soon as I undo that, this whole thing is going to fall down. 
Uh, Steph is over at her warehouse at the moment, so she can't help me. So um, I'm just going to put this piece of wood right here on top of this uh, CV shaft and give it ever slow so much pressure up just to hold this up in place so that it doesn't just come crashing down whenever I undo that last bolt. That's secure, I'm gonna go back inside, undo it for real. And we got it, back under. With the strut out of the van, we are just needing to remove this coil to replace it with the new coil from Van Compass. So we've got these coil compressors that we're just going to put on here to compress, and then we can remove this cap here on the top. Now, this can be pretty dangerous because these coils carry a lot of energy inside of them. So we're just gonna go slow, one side at a time, back and forth until this is compressed. We can loosen this, take it off, and then loosen our coil. And now we have some movement of the coil on the strut. And so now we can just remove the bolt on the end of the strut here to pull this out of the way. And then we can pull this piece out of the way. And now we can loosen our compressors here so the coil can return to its normal state. And here is our new coil that's going to go on in the same way that we just took the old coil off. And once this is compressed quite a bit, we can start reassembling the top of the strut here. We can put this piece into place and it'll just click into the top of this, the coil here, nice and tight like that. And the bottom of the coil here just needs to fit in this little groove that's on top of this part of the strut. Once we have that, we can start being able to see if the cap on the top is going to fit through. And it looks like we still need to compress a little bit so that we can get this nut into there. So we'll just keep going. Now we've got the strut cap on the top of it and the bolt in place, and now we need to tighten the bolt, but it's kind of weird, and let's talk about why. So if I were just to put a socket on here and tighten this up, this whole assembly is going to spin, and so we have to be able to hold the inside of that with an Allen key like that. See, this whole thing is going to spin. Um, but since this is recessed down in here, it's pretty much impossible to get a wrench in there uh, with any kind of good bite. And so the way that we're going to do that is we're going to put this socket over, bite down on it with some vice grips, stick our Allen key inside and get it into the thread, and then we can tighten this up. And this does need to be torqued to 41 foot-pounds, and realistically, I have no way to get an actual torque on this, so 41 pounds isn't a lot, so we're just gonna do our best. That should be good. And with this torqued down, we can loosen our coils. With all of this assembled, we actually need to use an angle grinder to cut these studs down just a little bit because the spacer that is going on top of the strut here, these studs are just too long and they would interfere with the top of the strut where we installed this, pulled this out of the van, remember from underneath the dash. So we just have to cut these down to 16 millimeters so that they don't interfere. And now we can put this spacer back onto the top of the strut, just like so. You can see that now these are cut down so they're not going to be sticking up uh, past the top of this spacer. 
Now on this spacer, it is important to notice the L on this one. So there's an L and an R spacer. L is for the driver's side and right is for the passenger side. So that's really important. These are directional as far as which one needs to be on which side. So don't miss that. The arrow on the front of these needs to be facing towards the front of the van. So once we get all this installed, it's important to pay attention to where the arrow is facing once we reinstall this. Now this whole thing can rotate once it's already bolted together. So you'll just have to grab on and twist as appropriate. Now we can put this on, put our washers and nuts on top of these studs and torque them to 30 foot pounds. Now the instructions say to go ahead and put this back into the van at this point and then put the steering knuckle on this. But like I hinted at earlier, I've already done the other side, so I'm picking up some tips and tricks and it was a pain in the butt doing it like that. So I'm going to get the steering knuckle and we're gonna put it onto the strut here on the tabletop and then lift everything up into place. I watched another YouTube video where the guy did it like that and it seemed easier, maybe, we're gonna see. I'm gonna do it like that and let you know which way was better. Put some anti-seize down in here. And then we could put the steering knuckle back onto the strut. And it's on there. Uh, that was pretty easy, but the trick will be getting this whole assembly into the van. And this only goes in there one way. This spline needs to go into this crack in the back of the steering knuckle. And also the bottom of the strut needs to be bottomed out on this lip right here of the steering knuckle. Now we're gonna put this bolt back into our steering knuckle right here with a bit of blue Loctite. And we're gonna torque it down to 76 foot pounds and then an additional half a turn. And now all of this is reassembled and we can take this and move it back under the van. Steph's here because she works here. <laughs> okay, no. So we're about to move this into the van. Uh, so I've got Steph here on standby uh, to operate the jack and help me hold this if necessary. But the super important part to know about this part is the hub is facing with the studs out like it's actually installed. And then remember our little engraving on the top here, that arrow needs to be facing forward and so we just rotate it to where it's facing forward. That way all this is going the right direction when we put this into the top of the van. So let's see if we can get this thing in there. And it's in there. Uh, I'm gonna go inside and see if I can start some of those bolts, uh, just one at a time and we'll kind of move this and wrestle it into place until we have all three of those bolts on inside the van. So I have one nut on the top of the stud in there, so it's holding tight from the top, but I can still kind of wiggle it around. Now is going to be a good time to go ahead and put our CV shaft into the back of the steering knuckle. And our CV shaft is in there. It's not fully in there, but it'll be better once we get this moved up a little further, put the jack back under and continue uh, wrestling this up into place until we have all three of our bolts on the studs up top. Now that the steering knuckle and the strut is secured to the top of the van, it can just hang there from those top bolts. And so we can go ahead and just lower the jack and get it out of the way. Because the next thing we need to do is reverse of what we did earlier and pry this uh, lower control arm down with our breaker bar here and put the lower control arm onto our lower ball joint stud down here, put the nut on, and then torque it down to like 180 foot pounds. Um, my uh, torque wrench only goes to 150 foot pounds, so we're just gonna do our best there. So there's 150, and then a little more for good measure. 
Now we're moving up here to the top of the sway bar in link and the part where it attaches to the strut right here. Now, since we put that spacer in here, this is too low to attach to this. And so Van Compass has this uh, relocation kit that simply bolts in place. Now there's two of these. There's one for the driver's side, one for the, for the passenger side, and they only go in on in one direction, uh, but they're not marked. So realistically, can't mess this up. This bent flange on the bottom goes underneath, and this bent flange on the side goes to the side of this. Pop that in place. Get our bolt that came with the relocation kit. Put it in the back. Put our washer in place. And then the bolt. And then tighten this to 76 foot pounds. Next, I need to connect this sway bar in link to the sway bar relocation bracket. Take this off where I put it for safekeeping earlier. And then it's still a little too low. So I've got the jack underneath the bottom of the steering knuckle. So I can just simply jack that up and into place. And then before we put the sway bar in link into the bracket, we had to put this spacer washer from the Van Compass kit onto that and then we can thread this through like so and then put on our nut and then tighten it with an allen key and a wrench 76 foot pounds there next up is all of the sensor wires that we disconnected right over in here for the wheel speed sensor this little guy here goes on the back of the strut there's a little clip back there and it simply pop, pops into place there And wheel speed sensor connection here. Push until it clicks and then push the little red piece down to lock it in place and secure it where you found it initially. And then the wire going to the brake caliper connects in the same fashion you disconnected it. And this is kind of tight. So I'm going to put the brake caliper on before putting this back into this bracket right over here. Next is putting the brake caliper back onto the brake here. So we're going to take our bolts out of the brake caliper that we put here for safekeeping, put a bit of Loctite on them, and then tighten them in the exact same way they came off. And then they have to be tightened down to like 203 foot pounds. And then this wire going to the brake caliper, uh, just put this in the side of the bracket over here where we found it initially, just like that. And now we can do our tie rod back on the steering knuckle. So rotate that around, take our nut off where we saved it for safekeeping earlier. Rotate the steering knuckle back around and then thread that up and through. A bit of Loctite. Thread it on and then torque it down to 59 foot pounds. And lastly is the axle nut right here, torqued to 250 foot pounds. There's 150 and then uh, I'll just pull as hard as I can. Ugh. And this is all assembled. And before we put the wheel and tire back on, you know, jack everything up, get the jack stands out of the way, it's very, very important to know that we're not done. This needs an alignment. Uh, you can't put on a lift kit and not get an alignment. So we're not gonna show that on video because, well, we don't have a way to do an alignment in our shop. It's usually something best left to professionals. Uh, just take it to an alignment shop, tire shop, local mechanic, 
any of them will be able to do it. Just be sure to call ahead because the transits are pretty tall and not every shop is capable of working on such a tall vehicle. So we're going to get an alignment after this is all wrapped up. But now let's jack this up, get it off the jack stands and get the new tires and wheels put on. So the tires that came on the van were these guys at 235, 65 R16. So they're a fair amount smaller, two inches in diameter or so, uh, and obviously much worse looking than the new guys. So these tires are Falcon Wild Peak ATs, and they are in the size of 245, 75, 16. Now with these, we actually didn't have to trim anything. You can go with a little bit bigger tire on here, but then you have to start doing some trimming of the bumper, trimming of the pinch welds, and the instructions for the Van Compass lift kit. It's got that information um, right here in the instructions. And the trimming is realistically going to happen once you get up to a 265, 75, 16, which is a little bit bigger than this, a little bit wider, a little bit taller. Now these are load range E tires, so they are very beefy for this heavy van. And you have to be careful not to get, you know, your tires not rated for the weight that it's going to be carrying. The other thing about this is we got this wheel and tire combo. Uh, these are method wheels. Uh, we got this whole combo from Tire Rack and we got them mounted, uh, balanced, and shipped to our door all like they are with lug nuts, just right from their website. We live in a small town in Northwest Colorado, getting wheels and tires bounded is, mounted is sometimes a lengthy process. So it was nice to just get this stuff shipped right to our door and we could just put it on without having to go to a tire shop to get that done for us. So super happy with how it looks, but as far as the actual lift goes, we took measurements before and after and I've already kind of went around and checked and Front sitting right at 34 inches to the bottom of the uh, wheel arch right there. And that's like four inches of lift. So two inches is coming from the lift kit itself, about two, two and a half. And then the remainder of that is coming from the bigger tires, which is actually giving us the added ground clearance. So we are super happy with how this looks. We're gonna pull it out into the sun and see how it looks. And while you're checking out how beautiful that looks, here are some tips for success. I mentioned the steering knuckle and installing it back on the strut either first or second, you know, once it's in the van versus on the tabletop. I don't think either way was easier than the other. And so maybe following the instructions is probably just the best answer there. The next thing is get an alignment. Getting an alignment is going to make sure that everything works properly and you're not just eating through your tires because they're rubbing on the pavement unnecessarily. The next thing is making sure that the strut spacers are facing the right direction. Remember that there is a left and a right for the driver and passenger side with the arrows needing to be facing the front of the van. All that is found pretty clearly in the instruction manual. It's also very important to have all of your tools at the ready from the instruction manual. The instruction manual does a really good job of laying out what parts and tools specifically you're going to need. So go through, take inventory of the tools you need and then the tools that you already have. That way when you're mid project, you're not having to make unnecessary runs to the hardware store. Now, is this a DIY friendly project? Yes, it is, but it is challenging. If you're a shade tree mechanic, can operate all of these tools, have a friend that could help you, all of that kind of stuff, this is easily something that you can do. It is challenging, but it's no more challenging than any other lift kit that I've installed. I'm not sure what I wanna say. <laughs> We're gonna put this flatline nudge bar onto the front of our Ford Transit so that we have a spot to put all of our auxiliary lighting. Let's get started. Now Flatline has a very detailed installation guide that you can download and print, uh, including all the tools which I've already gathered right over here. And most importantly, perhaps, as it says, it should only take 30 minutes to install. So uh, the timer starts now.
First, we need to remove the license plate. Next, I can remove the license plate mount right here with these three screws. And now since this is about to be covered up with our nudge bar, now's a good time to go ahead and give it a cleaning. Next, we can remove these two bolts right here on the front uh, 13 millimeter socket. Next, it's time to actually put the nudge bar on the van. We have these two plate spacers that we're going to need, these two washers, and these two hex head screws. I'm gonna put my washer onto my screw with a little dab of Loctite for both of them. So the nudge bar goes on top of these spacers and the little nub on this side of them goes into the bumper like so. Thread that through, nice and easy. Just get them started first and we'll tighten them in a second. And these don't have a torque spec, so we're just gonna tighten them until they're tight. Next up is the front plate. It's just going right under here. And to prepare for this, we need to undo these two bolts holding the splash guard on from the bottom with a 10 millimeter socket. And we're just gonna set these aside because we will be reinstalling them in a second. And now we can grab four of these quarter by 20, three quarter inch long uh, button head screws and attach the front plate to the front of the nudge bar, like so. We're just gonna get these finger tight for now until everything is started and then we'll tighten everything up afterwards. And with these still super loose, uh, we're going to go underneath and put these two screws for the splash guard back into place. That's gonna secure the bottom of this. Oh, those needed Loctite. Okay, take them back out. Put Loctite on them, put them back in. And next is to tighten these up, but I forgot to put Loctite on these too. So we'll go pull them out, put Loctite on them, and then tighten them all the way back up. And lastly, we can put our license plate back in place with the remaining two button head screws from the kit. Sweet. <laughs> and we did it, 29 minutes, including all the filming and lines that Grace made me redo for the sake of the video. Um, this was a super easy project. Literally, if you can operate a wrench and a screwdriver, uh, you can you can do this. So I think it looks great. It's gonna add a little bit of uh, protection for if we bounce off a small animal or something like that on the road. Hopefully we don't, but you know if we do. But more importantly, uh, the lights that are going to be going right up here. We're putting tons of lights for all of our back roads and forest road travels, and that'll be in an upcoming video. So be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. We needed a way to store all of this dirty stuff outside of the van. So we're going to install this flatline door platform to do just that. The instructions say it should only take about two hours to complete, so the timer starts now. We printed off the instructions for this door platform and it's honestly really, really good. Uh, it has all the package contents um, labeled in here, but they weren't labeled on here, so I went ahead and did some uh, labeling on these so that the process goes easier. I also laid out all the tools that I need uh, for this project that are listed in the instructions as well as I have a helper to help me hold the door. We're starting at our lower hinge. We need to put the passenger bottom hinge bracket on here. So we're going to be removing these three bolts, sliding this in place, and then replacing these bolts. But first, we're just going to make some marks here for alignment when we go to put this back in place. Now this is loose, pivot that away and put our bracket in place. Now this can fit on here two different ways, and, but the correct way is to where the angle of this bracket kind of follows the angle of the hinge. Now we can move this back over in place. Stiff if you can pull out a little bit, like so. 
and then we can bolt this back up. And with these in here kind of loose, we can make our adjustments to get our door lined back up to our alignment marks we made earlier. And tighten it up. And now this one's in place. Now we're going to take our passenger top hinge bracket and do the exact same thing on the top hinge. And our hinge brackets are in place. Now we can close this and make sure it closes uh, perfectly, just the same as before. Looks good. Next, we're gonna open the door and remove the inner door panel with some trim pry tools. And if you've never been back here before, we have, because we sprayed lizard skin on it, there's going to be a vapor barrier that you can just kind of peel away. So here is our template, and the way this lines up is this edge lines up with the edge of the door, and then this edge lines up right below the window where the sheet metal bends. And then this arch is immediately over the door handle. So I'm gonna get this in place and have Steph put my mark where that hole is. Start with a pilot hole. And then the 2764 drill bit here. Deburr it and then clean up our mess. And then a bit of paint on the exposed metal. And then we need to drill our inside mounting hole, so we'll open this back up. Now we've got our template, and it just lines up. Uh, there's really only one way it lines up with this hole, this hole, and this hole right here. So I'm going to line these up nice and perfect like that. And then this piece wraps up and over the top, and I'll have Steph mark our hole on the top. Now we'll drill our pilot hole on the mark and finish it off with the 2764 drill bit. And deburr, and then paint our exposed metal. We're at 3605, by the way. And we're gonna close this door to actually put the platform in place. Steph's gonna put the one inch bolts in through the hinges on the side, and we're gonna keep them loose for now so we can adjust as necessary later. And now we're between the van and the platform and we're going to put this inch and a half bolt through this bracket into the hole we drilled earlier. Now we need to put this thing that is called a thing. Now we need to put the door backer on the back side. This door backer bracket is going to go inside of here. And this part with the, uh, the rubber is going to go over the bolt that Steph just put on the outside of the door. This hole right here is going to line up underneath this hole that we drilled earlier. Biggest tip here is uh, put the person with the smaller hands on the inside. So we got that finished, uh, but it did take a little persistence since you're going through thick metal, the door, rubber, rubber, and then more thick metal. But uh, tight clearances made it a little tough. Uh, having somebody here to help was very useful. Now that the bracket is bolted to the door, as well as the platform on the back, we can bolt the bracket to this hole here. Now we can close the door, <laughs> yet again, and tighten all of these hinge brackets on the side. And the last bracket, the lower frame brace, is simply going to attach right here. And then when we tighten this, we're going to make sure this brace is pushed all the way up against the door on that neoprene pad on the back of the bracket. Just shy of an hour and a half and we are all finished up. It looks great. Uh, the thing I like the most about it is it's not a swing arm kind of situation where you have to open it first to open the door. 
you can just open the door and the platform comes with it. With the holes in here, it's pretty much infinitely customizable on what we want to put on it. Uh, you know, we could put our max tracks or roto packs or whatever we're going to do, but first and foremost, we're going to put a box onto this. Now this is two feet wide. We're gonna be using the box from Backwood Adventure Mods, uh, but any box is going to work. I think Alvans has a box that'll work. Flatline said that they're going to make a box that will work, it's just not out yet. Illumines, they have a box that is going to work. So we're gonna get the box put on here and then we can put all of our stuff in it. And we're all wrapped up here. The box is now fastened to the platform and a few notes about the actual process of that. Since this and this are different manufacturers, we did have to drill some holes in the back of this box to get these holes to, or to make new holes, to line up with the holes in the flatline platform. But that's not a big deal. And realistically, anything you're going to be attaching to this platform is probably going to need some kind of holes drilled or brackets or something like that. But it's a pretty easy process with how many holes there are. The other thing that's important is whenever this is opened all the way up, the side of the box can contact the slider of the van for the door. And we just have to be careful there for one, but also we're probably gonna make a rubber bumper of some kind so that we don't get any kind of damage on the van. We also wanted to make sure it was in this way uh, far enough so that the brake light could be seen. But we're pretty happy with the functionality and our ability to store all of our recovery gear that might get muddy or nasty, uh, fluids, all of our other stuff that's gonna be laying on the ground, like our power cord, our shore power cord, auxiliary solar wire, and then our water cord back here. And up top, we have a huge blank space that we'll probably end up putting our max tracks up here, or knockoff max tracks or whatever those are. And then our shovel right there, our Demos retractable shovel will land right there. Probably some eye bolts on the sides, uh, you know, just kind of came up with the idea like five minutes ago. Voile straps over the top, and that should work pretty good. So super happy with this. Very excited to have some outside storage. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Hey there, so I, bought way too many lights for this transit. And I don't have buyer's remorse necessarily uh, because they're really cool, but um, well, since I've got them, I just want to show all of you um, what they all do, kind of their capabilities and what we're going to use them for. So first and foremost is factory high and low beams. Uh, I didn't do anything to these, so those are just as factory. Uh, the next things up are these guys right down here uh, are the fog lights. Now I replaced the factory fog lights with a fog light bracket kit from uh, Van Parts Warehouse or Freedom Van Gogh. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. And it allows us to put two Diode Dynamics SS3 fog lights down there for honestly huge performance gains and we'll check those out here in a little bit now i was going to make a video teaching you how to install that thing but grant over at freedom van gogh already made a video and it was it was perfect and i'll just link to that in the video description below so you can go check that out to see how this was but it was a half evening project not a big deal now you're gonna have to deal with the poor lighting in the background here because a lighting review during the daytime just kind of defeats all purpose. So bear with me here. These two lights right here are diode dynamic 12 inch amber light bars. These are gonna be good for like snow, fog, anything like that. And up above those are the diode dynamic SS5 Sport driving lights. Now these are absurdly bright as you'll see here in a little bit and we'll have Grace put what specific models these all are up here uh, somewhere so you guys can see exactly what we're dealing with. And right up here and over here as it just gets darker and darker and our ISO is at 32,000 uh, are the SS3 lights as well. They're the same lights as our fog lights. These are just white and these are actually mounted on Van Compass, the 
same company who made our lift kit on our transit uh, they make some hood mounts for these ditch lights that are kind of pointed you know down and off to the side so that they can see any deer or moose or elk uh, that like to hide in the bar ditches before just jumping out at us while we're driving now we are going to test all of these oh hey that lighting is better let's just put that right there okay so before we test all of these and just kind of show you what we're dealing with here um, it's important to know that i'm not necessarily a rule follower and having all of these lights is against the law in a lot of areas and i don't <laughs> really care to be totally honest i know there's a bunch of people that are watching this video they're going to be like hey those lights are illegal in california's uh, uh mariposa county and it's like it's fine like i don't really care we're up in remote northwestern colorado and we see more elk than we do people which is realistically what I'm concerned about. So if you're one of those people who are watching my videos saying that, hey, all these lights are illegal, then I'm gonna put a link that, to a video that you're probably gonna be more interested in down in the video description below. Uh, it's gonna be something along the lines of like how to get better fuel mileage on your Toyota Prius or something like that. But anyway, for the rest of you that are gonna stick around with me that care about lighting performance, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, how these lights work. So I'm going to leave all of you right there and then, oh my gosh, off. I'm going to go into the cab and control them from there. So first and foremost is the SS3 fog lights at the bottom with our low beams. And then when I turn my fog lights off, here's what we're dealing with. Fog lights back on. And then when I switch to our factory high beams, the fog lights turn off just the same as pretty much any other vehicle on the road. I didn't rewire that or anything like that, but that's what we're dealing with. Low beams and fog lights. Now I would really never do this, but I could turn my fog lights off and then turn my amber fog bars on. And that's how it looks like. Now, if it were a snowy condition, I would be having these amber fog bars on as well as my amber fog lights as well. And that's how we would be running like that. Now, if we're traveling down some, you know, county road or something like that, where there are a bunch of deer in the ditches or something like that that I wanted to be able to see, we're going to kick on our ditch lights that are mounted to our van compass brackets right up top. And then lastly is our SS5 high beams that are <laughs> not safe for highway usage by any stretch of the imagination because they are just <laughs> absurdly bright. So let's turn all of these off now that we know what we're dealing with. And I'm gonna take all of you inside of the cab there so you can see like out of the windshield to see what we are seeing from a driver's point of view. Let's go. So I found a nice little dark forest road out here so we can test these lights without potentially blinding people coming in. So. These are just our factory low beams. And here are our factory high beams. Back to low beams. And then these are those dual SS3 fog lights at the bottom that we replaced our fog lights with um, at the bottom of the bumper. Now these lights that we used are actually street legal. So this is what we're running with all the time on our low beams. So our outside beams, inside beams are all fog lights and they light up very nicely. And in the winter, the important part is that we can see where those white lines or realistically where the edges of the pavement are whenever it's super snowy. Up here in Northwest Colorado, we get 500 inches of snow a year, you know, in the winter. And we need to see where the edges of the road are which is why these are so important when driving, even when we're not off-road. Now, if it's particularly snowy out, we're actually in blizzard conditions, we can hit our off-road snow button here. And these are our 12-inch amber um, bars that are mounted a little further up the bumper, but still low, so it's below our vision, so it's not gonna create much glare. Turn it off, 
and turn that back on. But these are still aimed below our cutoffs for our low beams. Now, if we're driving somewhere, we wanna keep an eye on the left and right ditches on the roads. These lights right here and these lights over here, the SS3s in white on our van compass brackets. Uh, that's what we're gonna turn on. So right here, ditch lights, and then those kick on. See, left and right beams, pretty spot patterns there. Turn those off, turn those on. Let me turn off our amber fogs as well as our bumper fogs and you can kind of see how those work there. Factory low beams and then the SS3 ditch lights on the van compass hood mount brackets there. And now if we are off road and have no chance basically of somebody coming the other direction, we can kick on those four SS5 uh, lights that are right in the middle of the bar and just really light up the place like so and there's a turn a little ways up this road and I can see all the way as far as my eyes can see um, to the end of that turn and these are incredibly bright and let's compare these lights with just our standard high beams so we'll turn off our SS5 high beams turn off our ditch lights these are our low beams I'll turn on my high beams. These are our factory high beams, SS5s, and ditch lights. So the, <laughs> it is almost comically brighter than factory. And yes, this would blind somebody on coming. So you wanna make sure to never have these on when somebody is coming in the opposite direction. But on that note, I have actually wired these so that I can say we are on off-road lighting, and then anytime our high beams are on, which they are right now, those lights will be on. And then if I turn my high beams off, those lights go away. So we've got standard low beams here, and then high beams with the SS5s and the ditch lights. And even if I turn on the fog lights right there, the same thing will happen. I've got my fog lights and my low beams, which all of this is still street legal. And then I can turn on all of this stuff so I can see any kind of moose or deer or elk that might be coming down the road. So I know it's kind of hard to get a good represent, wow, that is really, really bright. It's kind of hard to get a good representation of how far these lights actually throw light uh, specifically the SS5s. So I'm gonna fly a drone up in the air and kind of show how far these lights are throwing light. So here's what we're looking at. This is just our low beams. And here are our high beams. Here are the low beams with our fog light replacements. And then here are the 12 inch amber light bars. Next up, we'll kick on our ditch lights. And then lastly, here are the SS5 sport driving lights. So yes, <laughs> we installed way too many lights on this van, but honestly, this is probably the most well equipped in terms of lighting van that we've ever had. Even our old camper van that had the big light bar at the top um, wasn't this good. The light at the top, I felt like it threw a lot of glare and these don't because everything is below our line of vision. Now the SS5s, they do throw a bit of glare if you have some kind of reflector, but if you have a reflector, that means you're on the highway and you shouldn't be running those anyway. The fog lights at the bottom are by far my favorite upgrade uh, because it's something you can run without worry of, you know, kind of blinding somebody, which I do like to be considerate of others, as well as being able to see the edges of the road during a snowstorm. The ditch lights on those van compass mounts are also pretty awesome because a lot of the places that we grow, go will literally just have elk or deer 
hanging out in the bar ditch, ready to jump into the road, which is a terrible feeling. The SS5s are just that bonus whenever you're out in the middle of nowhere and just trying to cruise and see if anything is in the way of your driving. You can build a whole camper van. Before just can't fix that door, huh? <laughs> We've been building out this van for the last two years based on all the suggestions that our followers left us back in episode one of this build playlist. If you've been following along since episode one, we appreciate you sticking around for this whole build and we cannot wait to show you everything that we've put in this build. And if you're new here, welcome. And this is what we do on this channel. We teach people how to build DIY campers. So in addition to the suggestions that you guys gave back in episode one, uh, we also lived on the road full time from 2015 to 2019. So we gained a lot of experience and learned a lot of things that we're able to put that into the projects that we built in this van here. So it's time to show off what we've done. I'm gonna show y'all the outside and then we're gonna turn it over to Steph and she's gonna show you the inside. So, sure. Rude. <laughs> so on the outside of the van, uh, I guess we'll start the bottom and work our way up. Uh, down here, we've got two inch lift from Van Compass and then larger wheels and tires for these areas that we like to get to. This is an all wheel drive transit. So we do have a little bit better ground clearance now with the bigger wheels and tires. And we're gonna cruise around towards the front here for all of our lighting. Now we have this flat line nudge bar that gets mounted to the bumper. And on that we have an absurd amount of lighting that we've installed for various purposes. We've got our upgraded fog lights to amber fogs for snowy conditions and these guys for big driving lights, uh, off-road of course, because these are illegal. Um, and then these amber ones here for snowy conditions and then these up here for elk. This way. On this side, we have the other half of the lift kit uh, with the other two wheels and tires the same as on the other side. So we'll just keep going. Is that right, Steph? Okay, yeah. Up top, we have our uh, exterior scene lighting. Uh, we have these two lights. These are Light Force Rock 9, Rock 5, Rock something or another lights. But we've got two on this side, two on the back, and then two on the other side. And we've got them switched individually so that we can turn them off and on, you know, front, back, and side, not front. Uh, so we can kind of control them individually. Now on our Sprinter, we had some more high powered lights. Um, they were honestly, they were too bright. Um, these are really good for just working on stuff like right outside, but you can also just kind of chill outside and not just be just freaking blinded. Uh, these are a great like middle ground for that. We've also got our Arctic turn windows on the front and back, as well as one on the other side. And these open up for some great ventilation and airflow and they are acrylic dual pane windows. And so they actually do a pretty good job of staying insulated. We'll show you the window screens on the inside. So around back, back here is um, the garage area. Now it's, this is technically the inside, but um, you know, on the, it's easier to see on the outside. So in here, we've got our space for two mountain bikes and then all of our mountain bike gear storage. We've got our Unaka bike mounts right here so we can easily pull our bikes in and out. Tires just get Voile strapped to the bikes themselves. Uh, they're not strapped down at the moment, but whatever. Up here, we've got our helmet storage and uh, something we didn't show in any of our videos was how we were hanging our helmets. Um, it's just a hero clip. Um, we got a lot of questions about these the last event we went to and they just clip into Unistrut really nicely. Um, affiliate link in video description below. So they'll just hang on there like that. I uh, got storage on this side on top of our plumbing enclosure. So we got a 20, 20 gallon, 25, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. We have 2,020 gallons no. of water. No, 20 gallons. we have 20 gallons of water inside of this, as well as uh, our water pump, all of our you know, distribution, all that kind of stuff, as well as a electric water heater. Uh, I think it's a seven gallon water heater. No, I think it's a five gallon water heater. It's been a while. We'll watch the video and then uh, we'll put it up here whenever we figure it out. So we've also got a little spot for a shower attachment right here that can attach. 
we can hose ourselves off or uh, hose bikes off. So that's pretty nice. I'll show you where we keep the hose for that here in a second. And then over here on this side is our power system. So we've got two 270 amp hour Battleborn GC3 batteries down in here, uh, wired into a 24 volt battery bank with all the Victron components to make this van function at a high level electrically. This is kind of the bread and butter of our channel and we had an absolute blast building this and we learned a lot of new stuff while we were doing this. And um, I just think it looks great. You know, the plexiglass is a little <laughs> extra, if you will, but um, it's good to be able to show at shows when we go to them. Uh, the last thing here in the garage area is we do have windows back here, but there's really no reason for us to be looking out these windows most of the time with our headboard right up here. So we've got these covered up with Van Essentials windows, cover, win, windows covering, window coverings. And then also right up here is our bug wall uh, bug net. So it's a bug net right up here. And then these drop down for uh, keeping everything dry. And then these parts right here, drop that down. These come down and zip up for um, a little bit of, you know, when it's cold out and you may need to open this, but you don't want to fully open it. You got some flexibility on how these work. So that's pretty much all there is to see. Did I miss anything, Steph? So let's talk about the top. Let's come over here for the top. So up top is 580 watts of rich solar panels. And although I'd love to fly the drone right now and show that to you, um, I, I crashed the drone last week, unfortunately, and kind of broke it a lot. And I haven't repaired it yet. Uh, so we'll do a little flashback right now of some pictures and videos that we took um, earlier this year that'll show you kind of how that looks. But there's 580 watts of solar panels up top that is recharging our battery bank inside, as well as a nomadic air conditioner. Uh, it's the nomadic 3000 DC air conditioner up there, as well as a single max air uh, roof fan. The other thing that's up there is our WeBoost antenna. And currently we've got it angled back because it gives us an extra four miles a gallon, which we love. We know that people love getting better fuel mileage. And so we, we estimate that's about four miles a gallon, as well as probably eight seconds off our quarter mile time. So it's just much better when it's angled back like that and it fits in our garage better. Um, over, oh, this way, right here, this box and this plate. So this is a flat line uh, cargo plate. Uh, all it is is a plate that mounts to the hinges of the, Steph, are you trying to trip Grace? Oh my gosh. So this just mounts to the hinges of the back door and opens with the door like so. And we've got our knockoff Max Tracks right up here, as well as our Demo shovel that, uh, this is actually one of the things that we took on our Sprinter. It's really beat up at this point. Probably needs to be sharpened. And then this box here is a Backwoods Adventure, bo Adventure Mods box. And it just holds basically all of our dirty stuff. So like recovery gear, this is the, um, the little shower attachment slinky thing for the shower that's inside the van, uh, water, shore power cord, jacks, um, basically anything that I don't really want inside because it like has a tendency to get dirty, uh, lives in here. So that is that. Okay, did I miss anything on the outside, Steph? Or can we turn it over to you? You missed two things. So you missed the water port and the uh, solar port. Oh, water port, solar port, other side. Oh, no, water port's right there. <laughs> water port. Uh, water port's just right here. Uh, goes right into the plumbing enclosure, which as you'll remember is right there. And then the electrical ports on the outside. So electrical was right there. And then over here is our shore power inlet, as well as our exterior uh, solar port. Now we can actually put up to 1700 watts of solar on this, which is excessive, but something's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Uh, so that's what we did. And we actually powered a bike race with it one time. That was, that was kind of fun. We got a video on that too, but uh, anyway, lots of charging here. So that's where this is. I think that's all right. I think that's all. Okay, I'm gonna turn you guys over to Steph and she's gonna show you the inside of the van. So the inside of the van, we'll start with uh, my step stool because this van is way too tall now with the, uh, the lift and the bigger tires and wheels. Um, 
so it's difficult to get into. Okay, so inside we've got our swivel seats. So these seats turn around um, to just kind of give us a nice little living space. We've also each got a 120 volt outlet on either side of here so we can plug in our laptop, sit here and work what we need to do. This cabinet is a fantastic storage area. So we've got all of these Peak Design packing cubes, all of our camera storage gear, our first aid kit, super important. And yeah, just a ton of charging stuff for all of our camera gear for when we're going out and shooting videos. On this side of the van, we've got our kitchen module. And so in this cabinet, we've got our 12 volt refrigerator. We've got just a drawer that keeps our pots and pans, plates, bowls, that kind of thing. We've got a drawer down there for our trash can. We've got another drawer for utensils. And then the top one actually just flips out. It was supposed to be to keep a sponge in here, but we never installed that. So it just flips out for Oops. no reason. <laughs> Then we've also got an induction cooktop. So this was something that we changed from the Sprinter van to the Transit van. Um, Cause in the, the Sprinter van, we had a, a two burner alcohol stove that we could just take out of the drawer, set it on the counter and cook with. Um, and we opted for the induction cooktop this time because we have so much power in this van that why not use a little bit of electricity to cook rather than uh, burning fuel. We've also got a pretty big sink over here. That's another thing that I changed from the Sprinter van. We had a tiny little just like vegetable prep sink and we thought that's all we needed. It was not, it was definitely not sufficient. So we got an actual normal size sink here with a little strainer so we can dry dishes here. So pretty nice, I like that. And back on the driver's side, we have another storage cabinet that stores our composting toilet in here. Uh, we went with a composting toilet yet again. We had a composting toilet in our motorhome when we originally set out on the road. And then we had a composting toilet in our last van in the Sprinter. And we've just, we've loved it. It's worked out perfectly. So why change it? So we put a composting toilet in here. And then these two drawers are just for toiletries. Up here, we've got our Arctic Turn uh, windows. And Nate showed you those on the outside, but on the inside, you can see that they're up right now for blinds and then if we snap these down that comes down and we can open it up Hi. and i can order coffee two please okay why Both do you need two me. or we can close this <laughs> down to <laughs> close the bugs out or close nate out speaking of coffee um <clears throat> got our coffee cup <laughs> coffee cup our coffee the heck is this thing called? Maker. Coffee maker. Thank you. <laughs> Coffee maker is up here. Uh, we originally actually just had a French press in this van, but we've been using this van to take to events and we've been taking our team with us to events and making coffee for four to six people out of a French press just doesn't work for us. So we upgraded to just a regular old coffee maker. Uh, put that here. The carafe for it is in one of these bins as well. So that's been working out pretty well. While we're up here, we'll talk about the upper cabinets. And we had some of these upper cabinets in our Sprinter van. We had a, a couple of them back over the bed and just these storage cubes, just like we have here. And we actually, we like that so much that we decided to do all of the uppers in this van with that. The reason that I love that so much is for one, it's way lighter weight way less difficult to build these and these storage bins are great for you know when we're at home we can just take these take these inside with us and refill stuff restock stuff put stuff away come back when we're ready to take off again in the in the van and have everything fully stocked so they're actually really fantastic i love them steph let's turn these lights on so it looks fancy there the underlighting what lights did you turn on the ones underneath oh these okay so these lights right here is what Nate just turned on. So these are our ambiance lighting. lighting. Yeah, indirect lighting. So we've got lighting, uh, just an LED strip light here. One is up here. And then I don't know if you can really tell, but there's also one down here under the cabinets. So these are fantastic for late at night when we're just kind of chilling in the van and we want some light on, but we don't want the big overhead lights on um, or first thing in the morning when we don't want to turn on the big lights. That being said, the um, overhead lights do dim. 
Bet you can't see that at all right now. <laughs> okay. Okay, what else? What have I missed? This is our bed. It's where we sleep. It's a bed. Um, I'm actually kind of bitter about this bed because although I like the bed, I wanted to have the option for a dinette that transforms into a bed. I'm sure you guys have all seen those. We were gonna do two different types and have it to where we could swap it out depending on the type of adventure we were going on. Um, but ultimately we ran out of time, we ran out of energy and we ran out of give a fuck and we did not do it. And unfortunately I couldn't talk Nate into doing it and I don't know how to use SketchUp so we ended up with a platform bed instead. And it's still a great option. It's a great option. I do like it, but I do have to use a step stool to get into bed. Let me take my shoes off. So when I forget to uh, bring the step stool in, this is how I have to get into bed. No. Not a huge deal. No, 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 no. So here's Scooter. So hand, hand, butt up. Yeah. <laughs> so you just gotta back it up. Okay. There you go. I'm not tall enough to do that. Also, I just got burrs all over the bed. So that's, that's, that's fantastic. Another thing that we changed from the Sprinter van to the Transit van is uh, the, the mattress. So we ordered this mattress from Tochta, who specializes in like custom, custom cut specialty mattresses for RVs, things like that. Um, so you can actually order a mattress from them that has notches cut out that are perfect for whatever your specific use case is. Ours happen to be just a, a typical full-size bed. But what I really like about it is the mattress is actually, for one, it's really comfortable. And for two, it's really flexible. So when I'm having to sit in bed and also try to put the sheet on, it's pretty easy to move around versus in our Sprinter, we had just a normal um, full-size mattress that I ordered off of Amazon. It was very stiff. It was also pretty comfortable, but it was very stiff to move around and maneuver. So making the bed was a pain in the butt. Our walls in this van, we decided to go with uh, birch plywood for the walls and we bordered everything with this black l track This looks super sleek. We've got these black uh, screws holding the walls to the furring strips. Behind the walls, we've got uh, Thinsulate insulation and a couple of layers of lizard skin insulation so this is working out really really well we haven't slept in it we haven't camped in it in the winter just yet so um, i guess be on the lookout for that because winter is coming up winter is coming so in our sprinter we just went with a typical click and lock plank flooring and it was a bamboo floor it was supposed to be super sturdy and everything it did not help hold up well to four years on the road with two dogs. So we did some testing with this flooring and um, we actually took some like screwdrivers to it to see if it would scratch really easily. We also poured hot sauce all over it to see if it would stain or clean up really easily. We were worried about this kind of woven uh, material just not cleaning well and it actually cleaned up really, really easily. And since we've been using it for events and stuff, We've had people in and out of here with muddy shoes on and stuff like that. So it's actually worked really, really well. I've also got the um, l track in the floor here so that we can mount. We've got all of our cabinets are mounted to the l track Our bikes are mounted to the l track Everything is secured with the l track that's bolted through the frame of the actual van. And the last thing that I wanted to show you is um, these things. These are w what we've just been calling the blobbies forever. Um, but they're just like a foam piece that comes in the transit. It covers the side airbags. Um, I don't know if they're truly necessary. There's a ton of debate online of if they're necessary or if they're not necessary. So we decided to keep them just in case they were necessary for the, pro for the airbags to properly work. Um, but we wanted to cover them because they were ugly. And so we just covered these in uh, fabric and the initial plan was to cover these in fabric. We put a grommet in here so that we could get to the, um, the little plastic piece that holds these in, uh, but that did not work at all. And so these are kind of actually just like held in place by everything else that's around it. We made the wood fit really, really tight to these 
So they're in there. They're not going anywhere, but they're definitely not held in with the plastic clip anymore. They're probably more secure than they were with the plastic clip. If the airbag went off, they would for sure come out though. And I we, think that's the point. And we have to say that for legal reasons. I think that's the point. Yeah, exactly. Cool, okay, we agree. All right, that's the van. The only thing that we hired out in this entire build was actually our window tinting and the alignment after we did the lift kit. So I would love for you guys to guess in the comments um, how much this van cost for this entire build. Remember, this is a no expense spared kind of build. This was not a budget build. Um, but next week, I'm going to be putting out a full video cost breakdown on everything that went into this uh, into this build at retail cost, um, not including any of our labor because I think that would uh, end up making it cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> so it took us so long. If I paid but... myself minimum wage, I think it'd be a $1.5 million <laughs> build. So leave your uh, guesses in the comments below and uh, yeah, I'll let you know next week. Does that figure include or exclude the cost of the van? It includes the cost of the van. Okay, and including or excluding um, the alignment and the window tinting? Including. Including, okay. PFM window tinting and one-off performance for the alignment. What else? Is that it? That's it. That's everything that went into this van, I think. It's, that's the whole van. It's, it's, it was super awesome to like have everybody along for this whole process. I think it's, de I, I know for a fact it's the most, um, in-depth video or like series that we've ever done. And I'm really proud of how the van turned out and how the series like turned out. So thank all y'all for like watching and everything like that. Um, also thanks to all of the sponsors that made this uh, free for all of you. Uh, you know, Battleborn Batteries is our main channel sponsor and without their help and without uh, the help of a lot of the other sponsors who sponsored the individual projects, uh, we, couldn't have, we couldn't have done this. And we couldn't have done it for free for all of y'all. So, so special thanks to all of them. That was great. And for all of you watching every single week. So that's why we do this. We wouldn't do this if nobody was watching. So I think that's all. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for the tour. Thanks for videoing, Grace. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. can't reach. It's easier to do this from inside. There's a burr on the seat. Burrs everywhere. Why did I choose to do that from the outside? Wait, does this is work? Oh, there it was. Dun, 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 dun. Good job.